file one of farthest north volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sharon riskadal farthest north by fritoff nansen volume two contents of volume two chapter one we prepare for the sledge expedition chapter two the new year eighteen ninety five chapter three we make a start chapter four we say good-bye to the fram chapter five a hard struggle chapter six by sledge and kayak chapter seven land at last chapter eight the new year eighteen ninety six chapter nine the journey southward appendix report of captain otto sverdrup on the drifting of the fram from march fourteenth eighteen ninety five one march fifteen to june twenty two eighteen ninety five two june twenty two to august fifteen eighteen ninety five three august fifteen to january one eighteen ninety six four january one to may seventeen eighteen ninety six five the third summer conclusion end of file one file two of farthest north volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sharon riskadal farthest north by fritoff nansen volume two Chapter One: We Prepare for the Sledge Expedition. Who are to be the two members of the expedition? Sverdrup and I have tested each other before at this sort of work, and we could manage very well. But we cannot both leave the Fram. That is perfectly clear without further argument. One of us must remain behind to take on himself the responsibility of bringing the others home in safety but it is equally clear that one of us two must conduct the sledge expedition as it is we who have the necessary experience sverdrup has a great desire to go but i cannot think otherwise than that there is more risk in leaving the fram than in remaining on board her consequently if i were to let him go i should be transferring to him the more dangerous task while keeping the easier one to myself if he perished should i ever be able to forgive myself for letting him go even if it was at his own desire he is nine years older than i am i should certainly feel it to be a very uncomfortable responsibility and as regards our comrades which of us would it be most to their interest to keep on board i think they have confidence in both of us and i think either of us would be able to take them home in safety whether with or without the fram but the ship is his especial charge while on me rests the conduct of the whole and especially of the scientific investigations so that i ought to undertake the task in which important discoveries are to be made those who remain with the ship will be able as aforesaid to carry on the observations which are to be made on board it is my duty therefore to go and his to remain behind he too thinks this is reasonable i have chosen johansen to be my companion and he is in all respects well qualified for that work he is an accomplished snowshoer and few can equal his powers of endurance a fine fellow physically and mentally i have not yet asked him but think of doing so soon in order that he may be prepared betimes blessing and hansen also would certainly be all eagerness to accompany me but hansen must remain behind to take charge of the observations and blessing cannot desert his post as doctor several of the others too would do quite well and would i doubt not be willing enough this expedition to the north then is provisionally decided on i shall see what the winter will bring us light permitting i should prefer to start in february sunday november eighteenth it seems as if i could not properly realize the idea that i am really to set out and that in three months time sometimes i delude myself with charming dreams of my return home after toil and victory and then all is clear and bright 
then these are succeeded by thoughts of the uncertainty and deceptiveness of the future and what may be lurking in it and my dreams fade away like the northern lights pale and colorless ye not euch wieder schwankende gestalten ugh these everlasting cold fits of doubt before every decisive resolution the dice of death must be thrown is there too much to venture and too little to gain there is more to be gained at all events than there is here then is it not my duty besides there is only one to whom i am responsible and she i shall come back i know it i have strength enough for the task be thou faithful unto death and thou shalt inherit the crown of life we are oddly constructed machines at one moment all resolution at the next all doubt to-day our intellect our science all our leben und treben seem but a pitiful philistinism not worth a pipe of tobacco to-morrow we throw ourselves heart and soul into these very researches consumed with a burning thirst to absorb everything into ourselves longing to spy out fresh paths and fretting impatiently at our inability to solve the problem fully and completely then down we sink again in disgust at the worthlessness of it all as a grain of dust in the balance is the whole world as a drop of morning dew that falls on the ground if man has two souls which then is the right one it is nothing new to suffer from the fact that our knowledge can be but fragmentary that we can never fathom what lies behind but suppose now that we could reckon it out that the inmost secret of it all lay as clear and plain to us as a rule of three sum should we be any the happier possibly just the reverse is it not in the struggle to attain knowledge that happiness consists i am very ignorant consequently the conditions of happiness are mine let me fill a soothing pipe and be happy no the pipe is not a success twist tobacco is not delicate enough for airy dreams let me get a cigar oh if one had a real havana hm as if dissatisfaction longing suffering were not the very basis of life without privation there would be no struggle and without struggle no life that is as certain as that two and two make four and now the struggle is to begin it is looming yonder in the north oh to drink delight of battle in long deep draughts battle means life and behind it victory beckons us on i close my eyes i hear a voice singing to me in amongst the fragrant birch in amongst the flowers perfume deep into the pine woods church monday november nineteenth confounded affectation all this weltschmerz you have no right to be anything but a happy man and if you feel out of spirits it ought to cheer you up simply to go on deck and look at these seven puppies that come frisking and springing about you and are ready to tear you to pieces in sheer enjoyment of life life is sunshine to them though the sun has long since gone and they live on deck beneath a tent so that they cannot even see the stars there is kvik the mother of the family among them looking so plump and contented as she wags her tail have you not as much reason to be happy as they yet they too have their misfortunes the afternoon of the day before yesterday as i was sitting at work i heard the mill going round and round and peter taking food to the puppies which as usual had a bit of a fight over the meat pan and it struck me that the axle of the mill whirling unguarded on the deck was an extremely dangerous affair for them ten minutes later i heard a dog howling a more long-drawn uncomfortable kind of howl than was usual when they were fighting and at the same moment the mill slowed down i rushed out there i saw a puppy right in the axle whirling round with it and howling piteously so that it cut one to the soul benson was hanging on to the brake rope hauling at it with all his might and main but still the mill went round my first idea was to seize an axe that was lying there to put the dog out of its misery its cries were so heart-rending but on second thoughts i hurried on to help benson and we got the mill stopped 
at the same moment mogstad also came up and while we held the mill he managed to set the puppy free apparently there was still some life in it and he set to work to rub it gently and coax it the hair of its coat had somehow or other got frozen on to the smooth steel axle and the poor beast had been swung round and bumped on the deck at every revolution of the wheel at last it actually raised its head and looked round in a dazed way it had made a good many revolutions so that it is no wonder if it found some difficulty in getting its bearings at first then it raised itself on its forepaws and i took it aft to the half-deck and stroked and patted it soon it got on all four legs again and began shambling about without knowing where it was going it is a good thing it was caught by the hair said benson i thought it was hanging fast by its tongue as the other one did only think of being fixed by the tongue to a revolving axle the mere notion makes one shudder i took the poor thing down into the saloon and did all i could for it it soon got all right again and began playing with its companions as before a strange life to rummage about on deck in the dark and cold but whenever one goes up with a lantern they come tearing round stare at the light and begin bounding and dancing and gambling with each other round it like children round a christmas tree this goes on day after day and they have never seen anything else but this deck with a tarpaulin over it not even the clear blue sky and we men have never seen anything other than this earth the last step over the bridge of resolution has now been taken in the forenoon i explained the whole matter to johansen in pretty much the same terms as i have used above and then i expatiated on the difficulties that might occur and laid strong emphasis on the dangers one must be prepared to encounter it was a serious matter a matter of life or death this one must not conceal from oneself he must think the thing well over before determining whether he would accompany me or not if he was willing to come i should be glad to have him with me but i would rather i said he should take a day or two to think it well over before he gave me his answer he did not need any time for reflection he said he was quite willing to go sverdrup had long ago mentioned the possibility of such an expedition and he had thought it well over and made up his mind that if my choice should fall on him he would take it as a great favor to be permitted to accompany me i don't know whether you'll be satisfied with this answer or whether you would like me still to think it over but i should certainly never change my mind no if you have already thought seriously about it thought what risks you expose yourself to the chance for instance that neither of us may ever see the face of man again and if you have reflected that even if we get through safe and sound we must necessarily face a great deal of hardship on an expedition like this if you have made up your mind to all this i don't insist on your reflecting any longer about it yes that i have well then that is settled to-morrow we shall begin our preparations for the trip hansen must see about appointing another meteorological assistant tuesday november twentieth this evening i delivered an address to the whole ship's company in which i announced the determination that had been arrived at and explained to them the projected expedition first of all i briefly went through the whole theory of our undertaking and its history from the beginning laying stress on the idea on which my plans had been built up namely that a vessel which got frozen in north of siberia must drift across the polar sea and out into the atlantic and must pass somewhere or other north of franz joseph land and between it and the pole the object of the expedition was to accomplish this drift across the unknown sea and to pursue investigations there i pointed out to them that these investigations would be of equal importance whether the expedition actually passed across the pole itself or at some distance from it judging from our experiences hitherto we could not entertain any doubt that the expedition would solve the problem it had set before it everything had up to the present gone according to our anticipations and it was to be hoped and expected that this would continue to be the case for the remainder of the voyage we had therefore every prospect of accomplishing the principal part of our task but then the question arose whether more could not be accomplished 
and thereupon i proceeded to explain in much the same terms as i have used above how this might be effected by an expedition northwards i had the impression that every one was deeply interested in the projected expedition and that they all thought it most desirable that it should be attempted the greatest objection i think they would have urged against it had they been asked would have been that they themselves could not take part in it i impressed on them however that while it was unquestionably a fine thing to push on as far as possible towards the north it was no whit less honorable an undertaking to bring the fram safe and sound right through the polar sea and out on the other side or if not the fram at all events themselves without any loss of life this done we might say without fear of contradiction that it was well done I think they all saw the force of this and were satisfied. So now the die is cast, and I must believe that this expedition will really take place. So we set about our preparations for it in downright earnest. I have already mentioned that at the end of the summer I had begun to make a kayak for a single man, the frame of which was of bamboo carefully lashed together. It was rather slow work and took several weeks, but it turned out both light and strong. When completed, the framework weighed sixteen pounds. It was afterwards covered with sailcloth by Sverdrup and Blessing, when the whole boat weighed thirty pounds. After finishing this, I had entrusted Mogstad with the task of building a similar one. Johansen and I now set to work to make a cover for it. These kayaks were 3.70 meters, 12 feet long, about zero point seven meter twenty eight inches wide in the middle and one was thirty centimeters twelve inches and the other thirty eight centimeters fifteen inches deep this is considerably shorter and wider than an ordinary eskimo kayak and consequently these boats were not so light to propel through the water but as they were chiefly intended for crossing over channels and open spaces in the ice and coasting along possible land speed was not of much importance the great thing was that the boat should be strong and light and should be able to carry in addition to ourselves provisions and equipments for a considerable time if we had made them longer and narrower besides being heavier they would have been more exposed to injury in the course of transport over the uneven ice as they were built, they proved admirably adapted for our purpose. When we loaded them with care, we could stow away in them provisions and equipment for three months, at least for ourselves, besides a good deal of food for the dogs, and we could, moreover, carry a dog or two on the deck. In other respects, they were essentially like the Eskimo kayaks, full decked, save for an aperture in the middle for a man to sit in. This aperture was encircled by a wooden ring after the Eskimo fashion, over which we could slip the lower part of our sealskin jackets, specially adjusted for this purpose, so that the junction between boat and cape was watertight. When these jackets were drawn tight round the wrists and face, the sea might sweep right over us without a drop of water coming into the kayak. We had to provide ourselves with such boats in case of having to cross open stretches of sea on our way to Spitsbergen, or, if we chose the other route, between Franz Josef Land and Novaya Zemlya. Besides this aperture in the middle, there were small trapdoors fore and aft in the deck to enable us to put our hands in and stow the provisions and also get things out more readily without having to take out all the freight through the middle aperture in case what we wanted lay at either extremity. These trapdoors, however, could be closed so as to be quite watertight. To make the canvas quite impervious to water, the best plan would have been to have sized it and then painted it externally with ordinary oil paint. But on the one hand it was very difficult to do this work in the extreme cold. In the hold the temperature was minus 20 degrees centigrade, minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit. And on the other hand I was afraid the paint might render the canvas too hard and brittle and apt to have holes knocked in it during transport over the ice. Therefore, I preferred to steep it in a mixture of paraffin and tallow, which added somewhat to the weight of the kayaks, so that altogether they came to weigh about 36 pounds apiece. I had, moreover, some hand sledges made especially for this expedition. 
they were supple and strong designed to withstand the severe tests to which an expedition with dogs and heavy freights over the uneven drift ice would necessarily expose them two of these sledges were about the same length as the kayaks that is twelve feet I also made several experiments with respect to the clothes we should wear, and was especially anxious to ascertain whether it would do to go in our thick wolfskin garments, but always came to the conclusion that they were too warm. Thus, on November 29th, I write, took another walk northwards in my wolfskin dress, but it is still too mild, minus 35.2 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 37.6 degrees centigrade. I sweated like a horse, though I went fasting and quite gently. It is rather heavy going now in the dark when one cannot use snowshoes. I wonder when it will be cold enough to use this dress. On December ninth again we went out on snowshoes. It was minus 41 degrees centigrade, minus 41.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Went in wolf skin dress, but the perspiration poured down our backs, enough to turn a mill. Too warm yet goodness knows if it will ever be cold enough. Of course we made some experiments with a tent and with a cooking apparatus. On December 7th I write, I pitched the silk tent we are going to take and used our cooking apparatus in it. From repeated trials it appeared that from ice of minus 35 degrees centigrade, minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit, we boiled three liters of water, five and one-fourth pints, and at the same time melted five liters, eight and three-quarter pints in an hour and a half with a consumption of about 120 grams of snowflake petroleum. Next day we boiled two and a half liters of water over four pints and melted two and a half liters in one hour with 100 grams of snowflake petroleum. Yesterday we made about two liters of excellent oatmeal porridge and at the same time got some half-melted ice and a little water in little over half an hour with 50 grams of snowflake petroleum. Thus there will be no very great consumption of fuel in the day. Then I made all kinds of calculations and computations in order to find out what would be the most advantageous kind of provisions for our expedition, it being of the greatest moment that the food, both for dogs and men, should be nutritious and yet should not weigh more than was absolutely necessary. Later on in the list of our equipments I shall give the final result of my deliberations on this matter. Besides all this, we had, of course, to consider and test the instruments to be taken with us, and to go into many other matters, which, though perhaps trifles in themselves, were yet absolutely necessary. It is on the felicitous combination of all these trifles that ultimate success depends. We too passed the greater portion of our time in these preparations, which also kept many of the others pretty busy during the winter. Mogstead, for instance, found steady employment in making sledges and fitting them with runners, etc. Sverdra busied himself in making sleeping bags and many other things. Ewell was appointed dog-tailor, and when he was not busy in the galley, his time was devoted to taking the measurements of the dogs, making harness for them, and testing it. Blessing, too, fitted up for us a small light medicine chest containing selected drugs, bandages, and such other things as might be of use. One man was constantly employed in copying out all our journals and scientific observations, etc., etc., on thin paper in a contracted form, as I wanted, by way of making doubly sure of their preservation, to take a copy of them along with me. Hansen was occupied in preparing tabular forms necessary for our observations, curves of the movement of our chronometers, and other such things. Besides this, he was to make a complete chart of our voyage and drifting up to the present time. I could not, however, make too great a claim on his valuable time, as it was necessary that he should continue his scientific observations without interruption. During this autumn he had greatly increased the comfort of his work by building, along with Johansen, an observation hut of snow, not unlike an Eskimo cabin. He found himself very much at his ease in it, with a petroleum lamp hanging from the roof, the light of which, being reflected by the white snow walls, made quite a brilliant show. Here he could manipulate his instruments quietly and comfortably, undisturbed by the biting wind outside. 
he thought it quite warm there too when he could get the temperature up to something like twenty degrees below freezing point so that he was able without much inconvenience to adjust his instruments with bare hands here he worked away indefatigably at his observations day after day watching the often mysterious movements of the magnetic needle which would sometimes give him no end of trouble one day it was november twenty fourth he came in to supper a little after six o'clock quite alarmed and said there has just been a singular inclination of the needle to twenty four degrees and remarkably enough its northern extremity pointed to the east i cannot remember having heard of such an inclination he also had several others of about fifteen degrees at the same time through the opening into his observatory he noticed that it was unusually light out of doors and that not only the ship but the ice in the distance was as plainly visible as if it had been full moonlight no aurora however could be discerned through the thick clouds that covered the sky it would appear then that this unusual inclination was in some way connected with the northern lights though it was to the east and not to the west as usual there could be no question of any movement of the flow on which we were lying for everything had been perfectly still and quiet and it is inconceivable that a disturbance which could cause such a remarkable oscillation of two points and back again in so short a space of time should not have been noticed and heard on board this theory therefore is entirely excluded and the whole matter seems to me for the present to be incomprehensible blessing and i at once went on deck to look at the sky certainly it was so light that we could see the lanes in the ice astern quite plainly but there was nothing remarkable in that it happened often enough friday november thirtieth i found a bear's track on the ice in front of our bow the bear had come from the east trotting very gently along the lane on the newly frozen ice but he must have been scared by something or other ahead of the vessel as he had gone off again with long strides in the direction from which he had come strange that living creatures should be roaming about in this desert what can they have to do here if only one had such a stomach one could at least stand a journey to the pole and back without a meal we shall probably have him back again soon that is if i understand his nature aright and then perhaps he will come a little closer so that we may have a good look at him i paced the lane in front of the port bow it was three hundred forty eight paces across and maintained the same width for a considerable distance eastward nor can it be much narrower for a great distance to the west now when one bears in mind that the lane behind us is also of considerable width it is rather consoling after all to think that the ice does permit of such large openings there must be room enough to drift if we only get wind wind which will never come on the whole november has been an uncommonly wretched month driven back instead of forward and yet this month was so good last year but one can never rely on the seasons in this dreadful sea taking all in all perhaps the winter will not be a bit better than the summer yet it surely must improve i cannot believe otherwise the skies are clouded with a thick veil through which the stars barely glisten it is darker than usual and in this eternal night we drift about lonely and forsaken for the whole world was filled with a shining light and undisturbed activity above those men alone brooded naught but depressing night an image of that gloom which was soon to swallow them up this dark deep silent void is like the mysterious unfathomable well into which you look for that something which you think must be there only to meet the reflection of your own eyes ugh the worn-out thoughts you can never get rid of become in the end very wearisome company is there no means of fleeing from oneself to grasp one single thought only a single one which lies outside oneself is there no way except death but death is certain one day it will come silent and majestic it will open nirvana's mighty portal and we shall be swept away into the sea of eternity sunday december second sverdrup has now been ill for some days during the last day or two he has been laid up in his berth and is still there i trust it is nothing serious 
he himself thinks nothing of it nevertheless it is very disquieting poor fellow he lives entirely on oatmeal gruel it is an intestinal catarrh which he probably contracted through catching cold on the ice i'm afraid he has been rather careless in this respect however he is now improving so that probably it will soon pass off but it is a warning not to be overconfident i went for a long walk this morning along the lane it is quite a large one extending a good way to the east and being of considerable breadth at some points it is only after walking for a while on the newly frozen ice where walking is as easy and comfortable as on a well-trodden path and then coming up to the snow-covered surface of the old ice again that one thoroughly appreciates for the first time what it means to go without snowshoes the difference is something marvelous even if i have not felt warm before i break out into a perspiration after going a short distance over the rough ice but what can one do one cannot use snowshoes it is so dark that it is difficult enough to grope one's way about with ordinary boots and even then one stumbles about or slips down between great blocks of ice i am now reading the various english stories of the polar expeditions during the franklin period and the search for him and i must admit i am filled with admiration for these men and the amount of labor they expended the english nation truly has cause to be proud of them i remember reading these stories as a lad and all my boyish fancies were strangely thrilled with longing for the scenery and the scenes which were displayed before me i am reading them now as a man after having had a little experience myself and now when my mind is uninfluenced by romance i bow in admiration there was grit in men like perry franklin james ross richardson and last but not least in mcclintock and indeed in all the rest how well was their equipment thought out and arranged with the means they had at their disposal truly there is nothing new under the sun most of what i prided myself upon and what i thought to be new i find they had anticipated mcclintock used the same thing forty years ago it was not their fault that they were born in a country where the use of snowshoes is unknown and where snow is scarcely to be found throughout the whole winter nevertheless despite the fact that they had to gain their experience of snow and snow travel during their sojourn up here despite the fact that they were without snowshoes and had to toil on as best they could with sledges with narrow runners over uneven snow-covered drift ice what distances did they not cover what fatigues and trials did they not endure no one has surpassed and scarcely any one approached them unless perhaps the russians on the siberian coast but then they have the great advantage of being natives of a country where snow is not uncommon friday december fourteenth yesterday we held a great festivity in honor of the fram as being the vessel which has attained the highest latitude the day before yesterday we reached eighty two degrees thirty minutes north latitude the bill of fare at dinner was boiled mackerel with parsley butter sauce pork cutlets and french peas norwegian wild strawberries with rice and milk crown malt extract afterwards coffee for supper new bread and currant cake etc etc later in the evening a grand concert sweets and preserved pears were handed round the culminating point of the entertainment was reached when a steaming hot and fragrant bowl of cherry punch was carried in and served round among general hilarity our spirits were already very high but this gave color to the whole proceedings the greatest puzzle to most of them was where the ingredients for the punch and more particularly the alcohol had come from then followed the toasts first a long and festive one to the fram which had now shown what she was capable of it ran somewhat to this effect there were many wise men who shook their heads when we started and sent us ominous farewell greetings but their head shakings would have been less vigorous and their evil forebodings milder if they could have seen us at this moment drifting quietly and at our ease across the most northerly latitudes ever attained by any vessel and still further northward 
and the fram is now not only the most northerly vessel on the globe but has already passed over a large expanse of hitherto unknown regions many degrees farther north than have ever been reached in this ocean on this side of the pole but we hope she will not stop here concealed behind the mist of the future there are many triumphs in store for us triumphs which will dawn upon us one by one when their time has come but we will not speak of this now we will be content with what has actually been achieved and i believe that the promise implied in bjornson's greeting to us and to the fram when she was launched has already been fulfilled and with him we can exclaim hurrah for the ship and her voyage dread where never before a keel has sped where never before a name was spoken by norway's name is the silence broken we could not help a peculiar feeling almost akin to shame when comparing the toil and privation and frequently incredible sufferings undergone by our predecessors in earlier expeditions with the easy manner in which we are drifting across unknown expanses of our globe larger than it has been the lot of most if not all of the former polar explorers to travel over at a stretch yes truly i think we have every reason to be satisfied with our voyage so far and with the fram and i trust we shall be able to bring something back to norway in return for the trust the sympathy and the money which she has expended on us but let us not on this account forget our predecessors let us admire them for the way in which they struggled and endured let us remember that it is only through their labors and achievements that the way has been prepared for the present voyage it is thanks to their collective experience that mankind has now got so far as to be able to cope to some extent with what has hitherto been his most dangerous and obstinate enemy in the arctic regions that is the drift ice and to do so by the very simple expedient of going with it and not against it and allowing oneself to be hemmed in by it not involuntarily but intentionally and preparing for it beforehand on board this vessel we try to cull the fruits of all our predecessors experiences it has taken years to collect them but i felt that with these i should be enabled to face any vicissitude of fate in unknown waters i think we have been fortunate i think we are all of the opinion that there is no imaginable difficulty or obstacle before us that we ought not to be able to overcome with the means and resources we possess on board and be thus enabled to return at last to norway safe and sound with a rich harvest therefore let us drink a bumper to the fram next there followed some musical items and a performance by lars the smith who danced a pasul to the great amusement of the company lars assured us that if he ever reached home again and were present at a gathering similar to those held at christiania and bergen on our departure his legs should be taxed to their uttermost this was followed by a toast to those at home who were waiting for us year after year not knowing where to picture us in thought who were vainly yearning for tidings of us but whose faith in us and our voyage was still firm to those who consented to our departure and who may well be said to have made the greatest sacrifice the festivity continued with music and merriment throughout the evening and our good humor was certainly not spoilt when our excellent doctor came forward with cigars a commodity which is getting highly valued up here as unfortunately it is becoming very scarce the only cloud in our existence is that sverdrup has not yet quite recovered from his catarrh he must keep strict diet and this does not at all suit him poor fellow he is only allowed wheaten bread milk raw bear's flesh and oatmeal porridge whereas if he had his own way he would eat everything including cake preserves and fruit but he has returned to duty now and has already been out for a turn on the ice it was late at night when i retired to my cabin but i was not yet in a fit mood to go to sleep i felt i must go out and saunter in the wonderful moonlight around the moon there was as usual a large ring and above it there was an arc which just touched it at the upper edge but the two ends of which curved downwards instead of upwards it looked as if it were part of a circle whose centre was situated far below the moon 
at the lower edge of the ring there was a large mock moon or rather a large luminous patch which was most pronounced at the upper part where it touched the ring and had a yellow upper edge from which it spread downwards in the form of a triangle it looked as if it might be an arc of a circle on the lower side of and in contact with the ring right across the moon there were drifting several luminous cirrus streaks the whole produced a fantastic effect saturday december twenty second the same southeasterly wind has turned into a regular storm howling and rattling cheerily through the rigging and we are doubtless drifting northwards at a good rate if i go outside the tent on deck the wind whistles round my ears and the snow beats into my face and i am soon covered with it from the snow hut observatory or even at a lesser distance the fram is invisible and it is almost impossible to keep one's eyes open owing to the blinding snow i wonder whether we have not passed eighty three degrees but i am afraid this joy will not be a lasting one the barometer has fallen alarmingly and the wind has generally been up to thirteen or fourteen meters forty four or fifty feet per second about half past twelve last night the vessel suddenly received a strong pressure rattling everything on board i could feel the vibration under me for a long time afterwards while lying in my berth finally i could hear the roaring and grating caused by the ice pressure I told the watch to listen carefully and ascertain where the pressure was and to notice whether the floe on which we were lying was likely to crack and whether any part of our equipment was in danger. He thought he could hear the noise of ice pressure both forward and aft, but it was not easy to distinguish it from the roar of the tempest in the rigging. Today, about 12.30 at noon, the Fram received another violent shock, even stronger than that we had experienced during the night there was another shake a little later i suppose there has been a pressure aft but could hear nothing for the storm it is odd about this pressure one would think that the wind was the primary cause but it recurs pretty regularly notwithstanding the fact that the spring tide has not yet set in indeed when it commenced a few days ago it was almost a neap tide in addition to the pressure of yesterday and last night we had pressure on thursday morning at half past nine and again at half past eleven it was so strong that peter who was at the sounding hole jumped up repeatedly thinking that the ice would burst underneath him it is very singular we have been quiet for so long now that we feel almost nervous when the fram receives these shocks everything seems to tremble as if in a violent earthquake sunday december twenty third wind still unchanged and blowing equally fresh up to thirteen or fourteen meters forty four or forty seven feet the snow is drifting and sweeping so that nothing can be distinguished the darkness is intense abaft on the deck there are deep mounds of snow lying round the wheel and the rails so that when we go up on deck we get a genuine sample of an arctic winter the outlook is enough to make you shudder and feel grateful that instead of having to turn out in such weather you may dive back again into the tent and down the companionway into your warm bunk but soon no doubt johansen and i will have to face it out day and night even in such weather as this whether we like it or not this morning pettersen who has had charge of the dogs this week came down to the saloon and asked whether someone would come out with him on the ice with a rifle as he was sure there was a bear peter and i went but we could not find anything the dogs left off barking when we arrived on the scene and commenced to play with each other but pettersen was right in saying that it was horrid weather it was almost enough to take away one's breath to face the wind and the drifting snow forced its way into the mouth and nostrils the vessel could not be distinguished beyond a few paces so that it was not advisable to go any distance away from her and it was very difficult to walk for what with snowdrifts and ice mounds at one moment you stumbled against the frozen edge of a snowdrift at another you tumbled into a hole it was pitch dark all round the barometer had been falling steadily and rapidly but at last it has commenced to rise slightly it now registers about seven hundred twenty six millimeters twenty eight point six inches the thermometer as usual is describing the inverse curve 
in the afternoon it rose steadily until it registered minus twenty one point three degrees centigrade minus six degrees fahrenheit now it appears to be falling again a little but the wind still keeps exactly in the same quarter it has surely shifted us by now a good way to the north well beyond the eighty-third degree it is quite pleasant to hear the wind whistling and rattling in the rigging overhead alas we know that all terrestrial bliss is short-lived about midnight the mate who has the watch comes down and reports that the ice has cracked just beyond the thermometer house between it and the sounding hole this is the same crack that we had in the summer and it has now burst open again and probably the whole floe in which we are lying is split from the lane ahead to the lane astern of us the thermograph and other instruments are being brought on board so that we may run no risk of losing them in the event of pressure of ice but otherwise there is scarcely anything that could be endangered the sounding apparatus is at some distance from the open channel on the other side the only thing left there is the shears with the iron block standing over the hole thursday december twenty seventh christmas has come round again and we are still so far from home how dismal it all is nevertheless i am not melancholy i might rather say i am glad i feel as if awaiting something great which lies hidden in the future after long hours of uncertainty i can now discern the end of this dark night i have no doubt all will turn out successfully that the voyage is not in vain and the time not wasted and that our hopes will be realized an explorer's lot is perhaps hard and his life full of disappointments as they all say but it is also full of beautiful moments moments when he beholds the triumphs of human faith and human will when he catches sight of the haven of success and peace i am in a singular frame of mind just now in a state of sheer unrest i have not felt inclined for writing during the last few days thoughts come and go and carry me irresistibly ahead i can scarcely make myself out but who can fathom the depths of the human mind the brain is a puzzling piece of mechanism we are such stuff as dreams are made of is it so i almost believe it a microcosm of eternity's infinite stuff that dreams are made of this is the second christmas spent far away in the solitude of night in the realm of death farther north and deeper into the midst of it than any one has been before there is something strange in the feeling and then this too is our last christmas on board the fram it makes one almost sad to think of it the vessel is like a second home and has become dear to us perhaps our comrades may spend another christmas here possibly several without us who will go forth from them in the midst of the solitude this christmas passed off quietly and pleasantly and every one seems to be well content by no means the least circumstance that added to our enjoyment was that the wind brought us the eighty-third degree as a christmas box our luck was this time more lasting than i had anticipated the wind continued fresh on monday and tuesday but little by little it lulled down and veered round to the north and northeast yesterday and today it has been in the northwest well we must put up with it one cannot help having a little contrary wind at times and probably it will not last long christmas eve was of course celebrated with great feasting the table presented a truly imposing array of christmas confectionery poor man's pastry staghorn pastry honey cakes macaroons sister cake and what not besides sweets and the like many may have fared worse moreover blessing and i had worked during the day in the sweat of our brow and produced a polar champagne eighty-third degree which made a sensation and which we too at least believed we had every reason to be proud of being a product derived from the noble grape of the polar regions that is the cloudberry molter the others seemed to enjoy it too and of course many toasts were drunk in this noble beverage quantities of illustrated books were then brought forth there was music and stories and songs and general merriment on christmas day of course we had a special dinner after dinner coffee and curacao made here on board and nordahl then came forward with russian cigarettes 
at night a bowl of cloudberry punch was served out which did not seem by any means unwelcome mogstad played the violin and pettersen was electrified thereby to such a degree that he sang and danced to us he really exhibits considerable talent as a comedian and has a decided bent towards the ballet it is astonishing what versatility he displays engineer blacksmith tinsmith cook master of ceremonies comedian dancer and last of all he has come out in the capacity of a first-class barber and hairdresser there was a grand ball at night mogstad had to play till the perspiration poured from him hansen and i had to figure as ladies pettersen was indefatigable he faithfully and solemnly vowed that if he has a pair of boots to his feet when he gets home he will dance as long as the soles hold together day after day as we progressed with a rattling wind first from southeast and later on east southeast and east we felt more anxious to know how far we had got but there had always been a snowstorm or a cloudy sky so that we could not make any observations we were all confident that we must have got a long way up north but how far beyond the eighty-third degree no one could tell suddenly hansen was called on deck this afternoon by the news that the stars were visible overhead all were on the tiptoe of expectation but when he came down he had only observed one star which however was so near the meridian that he could calculate that at any rate we were north of eighty three degrees twenty minutes north latitude and this communication was received with shouts of joy if we were not yet in the most northerly latitude ever reached by man we were at all events not far from it this was more than we had expected and we were in high spirits yesterday being the second christmas day of course both on this account and because it was Ewell's birthday, we had a special dinner, with oxtail soup, pork cutlets, red whortleberry preserve, cauliflowers, fricando, potatoes, preserved currants, also pastry, and a wonderful iced almond cake with the words Gladly Ewell, a Merry Christmas on it, from Hansen, Baker, Christiania, and then malt extract. We cannot complain that we are faring badly here about four o'clock this morning the vessel received a violent shock which made everything tremble but no noise of ice packing was to be heard at about half past five i heard at intervals the crackling and crunching of the pack ice which was surging in the land ahead at night similar noises were also heard otherwise the ice was quiet and the crack on the port side has closed up tight again friday december twenty eighth i went out in the morning to have a look at the crack on the port side which is now widened out so as to form an open lane of course all the dogs followed me and i had not got far when i saw a dark form disappear this was pan who rolled down the high steep edge of the ice and fell into the water in vain he struggled to get out again all round him there was nothing but snow slush which afforded no foothold i could scarcely hear a sound of him only just a faint whining now and then i leaned down over the edge in order to get near him but it was too high and i very nearly went after him head first all that i could get hold of was loose fragments of ice and lumps of snow i called for a seal hook but before it was brought to me pan had scrambled out himself and was leaping to and fro on the floe with all his might to keep himself warm followed by the other dogs who loudly barked and gambled about with him as though they wished to demonstrate their joy at his rescue when he fell in they all rushed forward looking at me and whining they evidently felt sorry for him and wished me to help him they said nothing but just ran up and down along the edge until he got out at another moment perhaps they may all unite in tearing him to pieces such is canine and human nature pen was allowed to dry himself in the saloon all the afternoon a little before half past nine tonight the vessel received a tremendous shock i went out but no noise of ice packing could be heard however the wind howled so in the rigging that it was not easy to distinguish any other sound 
at half past ten another shock followed later on from time to time vibrations were felt in the vessel and towards half past eleven the shocks became stronger it was clear that the ice was packing at some place or other about us and i was just on the point of going out when mogstead came to announce that there was a very ugly pressure ridge ahead we went out with lanterns fifty-six paces from the bow there extended a perpendicular ridge stretching along the course of the lane and there was a terrible pressure going on at that moment it roared and crunched and crackled all along then it abated a little and recurred at intervals as though in a regular rhythm finally it passed over into a continuous roar it seemed to be mostly newly frozen ice from the channels which had formed this ridge but there were also some ponderous blocks of ice to be seen among it it pressed slowly but surely forward towards the vessel the ice had given way before it to a considerable distance and was still being borne down little by little the flow around us has cracked so that the block of ice in which the vessel is embedded is smaller than it was i should not like to have that pressure ridge come in right under the nose of the fram as it might soon do some damage although there is hardly any prospect of its getting so far nevertheless i have given orders to the watch to keep a sharp lookout and if it comes very near or if the ice should crack under us he is to call me probably the pressure will soon abate as it has now kept up for several hours at this moment twelve forty five a m there have just been some violent shocks and above the howling of the wind in the rigging i can hear the roar of the ice pressure as i lie in my berth End of file two. file three of farthest north volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Fridtjof Nansen, Volume 2, Chapter 2. The New Year, 1895. Wednesday, January 2nd, 1895. Never before have I had such strange feelings at the commencement of the new year. It cannot fail to bring some momentous events, and will possibly become one of the most remarkable years in my life whether it leads me to success or to destruction years come and go unnoticed in this world of ice and we have no more knowledge here of what these years have brought to humanity than we know of what the future ones have in store in this silent nature no events ever happen all is shrouded in darkness there is nothing in view save the twinkling stars immeasurably far away in the freezing night and the flickering sheen of the aurora borealis i can just discern close by the vague outline of the fram dimly standing out in the desolate gloom with her rigging showing dark against the host of stars like an infinitesimal speck the vessel seems lost amidst the boundless expanse of this realm of death nevertheless under her deck there is a snug and cherished home for thirteen men undaunted by the majesty of this realm in there life is freely pulsating while far away outside in the night there is nothing save death and silence only broken now and then at long intervals by the violent pressure of the ice as it surges along in gigantic masses it sounds most ominous in the great stillness and one cannot help an uncanny feeling as if supernatural powers were at hand the jotuns and rimterser frost giants of the arctic regions with whom we may have to engage in deadly combat at any moment but we are not afraid of them i often think of shakespeare's viola who sat like patience on a monument could we not pass as representatives of this marble patience imprisoned here on the ice while the years roll by awaiting our time i should like to design such a monument it should be a lonely man in shaggy wolfskin clothing all covered with hoarfrost sitting on a mound of ice and gazing out into the darkness across these boundless ponderous masses of ice awaiting the return of daylight and spring 
the ice pressure was not noticeable after one o'clock on friday night until it suddenly recommenced last night first i heard a rumbling outside and some snow fell down from the rigging upon the tent roof as i sat reading i thought it sounded like packing in the ice and just then the fram received a violent shock such as she had not received since last winter i was rocked backward and forward on the chest on which i was sitting finding that the trembling and rumbling continued i went out there was a loud roar of ice packing to the west and northwest which continued uniformly for a couple of hours or so is this the new year's greeting from the ice we spent new year's eve cosily with a cloudberry punch bowl pipes and cigarettes needless to say there was an abundance of cakes and the like and we spoke of the old and the new year and days to come some selections were played on the organ and violin thus midnight arrived blessing produced from his apparently inexhaustible store a bottle of genuine linea akavit lean eau de vie and in this norwegian liquor we drank the old year out and the new year in of course there was many a thought that would obtrude itself at the change of the year being the second which we had seen on board the fram and also in all probability the last that we should all spend together naturally enough one thanked one's comrades individually and collectively for all kindness and good fellowship hardly one of us had thought perhaps that the time would pass so well up here sverdrup expressed the wish that the journey which johansen and i were about to make in the coming year might be fortunate and bring success in all respects and then we drank to the health and well-being in the coming year of those who were to remain behind on board the fram it so happened that just now at the turn of the year we stood on the verge of an entirely new world the wind which whistled up in the rigging overhead was not only wafting us on to unknown regions but also up into higher latitudes than any human foot had ever trod we felt that this year which was just commencing would bring the culminating point of the expedition when it would bear its richest fruits would that this year might prove a good year for those on board the fram that the fram might go ahead fulfilling her task as she has hitherto done and in that case none of us could doubt that those on board would also prove equal to the task entrusted to them new year's day was ushered in with the same wind the same stars and the same darkness as before even at noon one cannot see the slightest glimmer of twilight in the south yesterday i thought i could trace something of the kind it extended like a faint gleam of light over the sky but it was yellowish white and stretched too high up hence i am rather inclined to think that it was an aurora borealis again to-day the sky looks lighter near the edge but this can scarcely be anything except the gleam of the aurora borealis which extends all round the sky a little above the fog banks on the horizon and which is strongest at the edge exactly similar lights may be observed at other times in other parts of the horizon the air was particularly clear yesterday but the horizon is always somewhat foggy or hazy during the night we had an uncommonly strong aurora borealis wavy streamers were darting in rapid twists over the southern sky their rays reaching to the zenith and beyond it there was to be seen for a time a band in the form of a gorgeous corona casting a reflection like moonshine across the ice the sky had lit up its torch in honor of the new year a fairy dance of darting streamers in the depth of night i cannot help often thinking that this contrast might be taken as typical of the northmen's character and destiny in the midst of this gloomy silent nature with all its numbing cold we have all these shooting glittering quivering rays of light do they not typify our impetuous spring dances our wild mountain melodies the auroral gleams in our souls the rushing surging spiritual forces behind the mantle of ice there is a dawning life in the slumbering night if it could only reach beyond the icy desert out over the world thus eighteen ninety five comes in turn fortune turn thy wheel and lower the proud turn thy wild wheel through sunshine storm and cloud thy wheel and thee 
we neither love nor hate smile and we smile the lords of many lands frown and we frown the lords of our own hands for man is man and master of his fate thursday january third a day of unrest a changeful life notwithstanding all its monotony but yesterday we were full of plans for the future and to-day how easily might we have been left on the ice without a roof over our heads at half past four in the morning a fresh rush of ice set in in the lane aft and at five it commenced in the lane on our port side about eight o'clock i awoke and heard the crunching and crackling of the ice as if ice pressure were setting in a slight trembling was felt throughout the fram and i heard the roar outside when i came out i was not a little surprised to find a large pressure ridge all along the channel on the port side scarcely thirty paces from the fram the cracks on this side extended to quite eighteen paces from us all loose articles that were lying on the ice on this side were stowed away on board the boards and planks which during the summer had supported the meteorological hut and the screen for the same were chopped up as we could not afford to lose any materials but the line which had been left out in the sounding hole with the bag net attached to it was caught in the pressure just after i had come on board again shortly before noon the ice suddenly began to press on again i went out to have a look it was again in the lane on the port side there was a strong pressure and the ridge was gradually approaching a little later on sverdrup went up on deck but soon after came below and told us that the ridge was quickly bearing down on us and a few hands were required to come up and help to load the sledge with the sounding apparatus and bring it round to the starboard side of the fram as the ice had cracked close by it the ridge began to come alarmingly near, and should it be upon us before the fram had broken loose from the ice, matters might become very unpleasant. The vessel had now a greater list to the port side than ever. During the afternoon various preparations were made to leave the ship if the worst should happen. All the sledges were placed ready on deck, and the kayaks were also made clear twenty-five cases of dog biscuits were deposited on the ice on the starboard side and nineteen cases of bread were brought up and placed forward also four drums holding altogether twenty-two gallons of petroleum were put on deck ten smaller sized tins had previously been filled with one hundred liters of snowflake oil and various vessels containing gasoline were also standing on deck as we were sitting at supper we again heard the same crunching and crackling noise in the ice as usual coming nearer and nearer and finally we heard a crash proceeding from right underneath where we sat i rushed up there was a pressure of ice in the lane a little way off almost on our starboard beam i went down again and continued my meal peter who had gone out on the ice soon after came down and said laughing as usual that it was no wonder we heard some crackling for the ice had cracked not a sledge length away from the dog biscuit cases and the crack was extending abaft of the fram i went out and found the crack was a very considerable one the dog biscuit cases were now shifted a little more forward for greater safety we also found several minor cracks in the ice around the vessel i then went down and had a pipe and a pleasant chat with sverdrup in his cabin after we had been sitting a good while the ice again began to crack and jam i did not think that the noise was greater than usual nevertheless i asked those in the saloon who sat playing halma whether there was any one on deck if not would one of them be kind enough to go and see where the ice was packing i heard hurried steps above nordahl came down and reported that it was on the port side and that it would be best for us to be on deck peter and i jumped up and several followed as i went down the ladder peter called out to me from above we must get the dogs out see there is water on the ice it was high time that we came the water was rushing in and already stood high in the kennel peter waded into the water up to his knees and pushed the door open most of the dogs rushed out and jumped about splashing in the water but some being frightened had crept back into the innermost corner and had to be dragged out although they stood in water reaching high up their legs 
poor brutes it must have been miserable enough in all conscience to be shut up in such a place while the water was steadily rising about them yet they are not more noisy than usual the dogs having been put in safety i walked round the fram to see what else had happened the ice had cracked along her to the fore near the starboard bow from this crack the water had poured aft along the port side which was weighed down by the weight of the ridge steadily pressing on towards us the crack has just passed under the middle of the portable forge which was thus endangered and it was therefore put on a sledge and removed to the great hummock on the starboard quarter the pemmican altogether eleven cases the cases of dog biscuits and nineteen cases of bread were conveyed to the same place thus we have now a complete depot lying over there and i trust in entire safety the ice being so thick that it is not likely to give way this has brought life into the lads they have all turned out we took out four more tin cans of petroleum to the hummock then proceeded to bring up from the hold and place on deck ready for removal twenty-one cases of bread and a supply of pemmican chocolate butter real food soup etc calculated to last us two hundred days also tents cooking apparatus and the like were got ready so that now all is clear up there and we may sleep securely but it was past midnight before we had done i still trust that it is all a false alarm and that we shall have no occasion for these supplies now at any rate nevertheless it is our duty to keep everything ready in case the unthinkable should happen moreover the watch has been enjoined to mind the dogs on the ice and to keep a sharp lookout in case the ice should crack underneath our cases or the ice pressure should recommence if anything should happen we are to be called out at once too early rather than too late while i sit here and write i hear the crunching and crackling beginning again outside so that there must still be a steady pressure on the ice all are in the best spirit it almost appears as if they looked upon this as a pleasant break in the monotony of our existence well it is half past one i had better turn into my bunk i am tired and goodness knows how soon i may be called up friday january fourth the ice kept quiet during the night but all day with some intervals it has been crackling and settling and this evening there have been several fits of pressure from nine o'clock onward for a time it came on sometimes rather lightly at regular intervals sometimes with a rush and a regular roar then it subsided somewhat and then it roared anew meanwhile the pressure ridge towers higher and higher and bears right down upon us slowly while the pressure comes on at intervals only and more quickly when the onset continues for a time one can actually see it creeping nearer and nearer and now at one o'clock at night it is not many feet scarcely five away from the edge of the snowdrift on the port side near the gangway and thence to the vessel is scarcely more than ten feet so that it will not be long now before it is upon us meanwhile the ice continues to split and the solid mass in which we are embedded grows less and less both to port and starboard several fissures extend right up to the fram as the ice sinks down under the weight of the ridge on the port side and the fram lists more that way more water rushes up over the new ice which has frozen on the water that rose yesterday this is like dying by inches slowly but surely the baleful ridge advances and it looks as if it meant going right over the rail but if the fram will only oblige by getting free of the ice she will i feel confident extricate herself yet even though matters look rather awkward at present we shall probably have a hard time of it however before she can break loose if she does not do so at once i have been out and had a look at the ridge and seen how surely it is advancing i have looked at the fissures in the ice and noted how they are forming and expanding round the vessel i have listened to the ice crackling and crunching underfoot and i do not much feel disposed to turn into my berth before i see the fram quite released as i sit here now i hear the ice making a fresh assault and roaring and packing outside and i can tell that the ridge is coming nearer this is an ice pressure with a vengeance and it seems as if it would never cease 
i do not think there is anything more we can do now all is in readiness for leaving the vessel if need be Today the clothing etc was taken out and placed ready for removal in separate bags for each man it is very strange there is certainly a possibility that all our plans may be crossed by unforeseen events although it is not very probable that this will happen as yet i feel no anxiety in that direction only i should like to know whether we are really to take everything on to the ice or not however it is past one o'clock and i think the most sensible thing to do would be to turn in and sleep the watch has orders to call me when the hummock reaches the fram it is lucky it is moonlight now so that we are able to see something of all this abomination the day before yesterday we saw the moon for the first time just above the horizon yesterday it was shining a little and now we have it both day and night a most favorable state of things but it is nearly two o'clock and i must go to sleep now the pressure of the ice i can hear is stronger again saturday january fifth to-night everybody sleeps fully dressed and with the most indispensable necessaries either by his side or secured to his body ready to jump on the ice at the first warning all other requisites such as provisions clothing sleeping bags etc etc have been brought out on the ice we have been at work at this all day and have got everything into perfect order and are now quite ready to leave if necessary which however i do not believe will be the case though the ice pressure has been as bad as it could be i slept soundly woke up only once and listened to the crunching and jamming and grinding till i fell asleep again i was called at five thirty in the morning by sverdrup who told me that the hummock had now reached the fram and was bearing down on us violently reaching as high as the rail i was not left in doubt very long as hardly had i opened my eyes when i heard a thundering and crashing outside in the ice as if doomsday had come i jumped up there was nothing left for it but to call all hands to put all the remaining provisions on the ice and then put all our furs and other equipment on deck so that they could be thrown overboard at a moment's notice if necessary thus the day passed but the ice kept quiet last of all the petroleum launch which was hanging in the davits on the port side was lowered and was dragged towards the great hummock at about eight o'clock in the evening when we thought the ice pressure had subsided it started thundering and crashing again worse than ever i hurried up masses of snow and ice rushed on us high above the rail amidships and over the tent peter who also came up seized a spade and rushed forward outside the awning as far as the forepart of the half-deck and stood in the midst of the ice digging away and i followed to see how matters stood i saw more than i cared to see it was hopeless to fight that enemy with a spade i called out to peter to come back and said we had better see to getting everything out on the ice hardly had i spoken when it pressed on again with renewed strength and thundered and crashed and as peter said and laughed till he shook again nearly sent both me and the spade to the deuce i rushed back to the main deck on the way i met mogstead who hurried up spade in hand and sent him back running forward under the tent towards the ladder i saw that the tent roof was bent down under the weight of the masses of ice which were rushing over it and crashing in over the rail and bulwarks to such an extent that i expected every moment to see the ice force its way through and block up the passage when i got below i called all hands on deck but told them when going up not to go out through the door on the port side but through the chart room and out on the starboard side in the first place all the bags were to be brought up from the saloon and then we were to take those lying on deck i was afraid that if the door on the port side was not kept closed the ice might if it suddenly burst through the bulwarks and tent rush over the deck and in through the door fill the passage and rush down the ladder and thus imprison us like mice in a trap true the passage up from the engine room had been cleared for this emergency but this was a very narrow hole to get through with heavy bags and no one could tell how long this hole would keep open when the ice once attacked us in earnest i ran up again to set free the dogs which were shut up in castle garden an enclosure on the deck along the port bulwark 
they whined and howled most dolefully under the tent as the snow masses threatened at any moment to crush it and bury them alive i cut away the fastening with a knife pulled the door open and out rushed most of them by the starboard gangway at full speed meantime the hands started bringing up the bags it was quite unnecessary to ask them to hurry up the ice did that thundering against the ship's sides in a way that seemed irresistible it was a fearful hurly-burly in the darkness for to cap all the mate had in the hurry let the lanterns go out i had to go down again to get something on my feet my finland shoes were hanging up to dry in the galley when i got there the ice was at its worst and the half-deck beams were creaking overhead so that i really thought they were all coming down the saloon and the berths were soon cleared of bags and the deck as well and we started taking them along the ice the ice roared and crashed against the ship's side so that we could hardly hear ourselves speak but all went quickly and well and before long everything was in safety while we were dragging the bags along the pressure and jamming of the ice had at last stopped and all was quiet again as before but what a sight the fram's port side was quite buried under the snow all that could be seen was the top of the tent projecting had the petroleum launch been hanging in the davits as it was a few hours previously it would hardly have escaped destruction the davits were quite buried in ice and snow it is curious that both fire and water have been powerless against that boat and it has now come out unscathed from the ice and lies there bottom upward on the floe she has had a stormy existence and continual mishaps i wonder what is next in store for her it was i must admit a most exciting scene when it was at its worst and we thought it was imperative to get the bags up from the saloon with all possible speed sverdrup now tells me that he was just about to have a bath and was as naked as when he was born when he heard me call all hands on deck as this had not happened before he understood there was something serious the matter and he jumped into his clothes anyhow amundsen apparently also realized that something was amiss he says he was the first who came up with his bag he had not understood or had forgotten in the confusion the order about going out through the starboard door he groped his way out on the port side and fell in the dark over the edge of the half-deck well that did not matter he said he was quite used to that kind of thing but having pulled himself together after the fall and as he was lying there on his back he dared not move for it seemed to him as if tent and all were coming down on him and it thundered and crashed against the gunwale and the hull as if the last hour had come it finally dawned on him why he ought to have gone out on the starboard and not on the port side all that could possibly be thought of to be of any use was taken out the mate was seen dragging along a big bag of clothes with a heavy bundle of cups fastened outside it later he was stalking about with all sorts of things such as mittens knives cups etc fastened to his clothes and dangling about him so that the rattling noise could be heard afar off he is himself to the last in the evening the men all started eating their stock of cakes sweetmeats and such like smoked tobacco and enjoyed themselves in the most animated fashion they evidently thought it was uncertain when they should next have such a time on board the fram and therefore they thought it was best to avail themselves of the opportunity we are now living in marching order on an empty ship by way of precaution we have now burst open again the passage on the starboard side which was used as a library and had therefore been closed and all doors are now kept always open so that we can be sure of getting out even if anything should give way we do not want the ice pressure to close the doors against us by jamming the doorposts together but she certainly is a strong ship it is a mighty ridge that we have in our port side and the masses of ice are tremendous the ship is listing more than ever nearly seven degrees but since the last pressure she has righted herself a little again so that she must surely have broken away from the ice and begun to rise and all danger is doubtless over so after all it has been a case of much ado about nothing sunday january sixth a quiet day no jamming since last night 
most of the fellows slept well on into the morning this afternoon all have been very busy digging the fram out of the ice again and we have now got the rail clear right aft to the half-deck but a tremendous mass had fallen over the tent it was above the second rat line in the fore shrouds and fully six feet over the rail it is a marvel that the tent stood it but it was a very good thing that it did so for otherwise it is hard to say what might have become of many of the dogs this afternoon hansen took a meridian observation which gave eighty three degrees thirty four minutes north latitude hurrah we are getting on well northward thirteen minutes since monday and the most northern latitude is now reached it goes without saying that the occasion was duly celebrated with a bowl of punch, preserved fruits, cakes, and the doctor's cigars. Last night we were running with the bags for our lives. Tonight we are drinking punch and feasting. Such are, indeed, the vicissitudes of fate. All this roaring and crashing for the last few days has been, perhaps, a cannonade to celebrate our reaching such a high latitude. If that be so, it must be admitted that the ice has done full honor to the occasion. Well, never mind, let it crash on so long as we only get northward. The Fram will no doubt stand it now. She has lifted fully one foot forward and fully six inches aft, and she has slipped a little astern. Moreover, we cannot find so much as a single stanchion in the bulwarks that has started, yet to-night every man will sleep fully prepared to make for the ice. Monday, January 7th. There was a little jamming of the ice occasionally during the day, but only of slight duration, then all was quiet again. Evidently the ice has not yet settled, and we have perhaps more to expect from our friend to port, whom I would willingly exchange for a better neighbor. It seems, however, as if the ice pressure had altered its direction since the wind has changed to southeast. It is now confined to the ridges fore and aft athwart the wind, while our friend to port, lying almost in the line of the wind, has kept somewhat quieter everything has an end as the boy said when he was in for a birching perhaps the growth of this ridge has come to an end now perhaps not the one thing is just as likely as the other to-day the work of extricating the fram is proceeding we will at all events get the rails clear of the ice it presents a most imposing sight by the light of the moon, and however conscious of one's own strength, one cannot help respecting an antagonist who commands such powers, and who in a few moments is capable of putting mighty machinery into action. It is rather an awkward battering ram to face. The Fram is equal to it, but no other ship could have resisted such an onslaught in less than an hour this ice will build up a wall alongside us and over us which it might take us a month to get out of and possibly longer than that there is something gigantic about it it is like a struggle between dwarfs and an ogre in which the pygmies have to resort to cunning and trickery to get out of the clutches of one who seldom relaxes his grip the Fram is the ship which the pygmies have built with all their cunning in order to fight the ogre, and on board this ship they work as busily as ants, while the ogre only thinks it worth while to roll over and twist his body about now and then. But every time he turns over it seems as though the nutshell would be smashed and buried and would disappear. But the pygmies have built their nutshell so cleverly that it always keeps afloat and wriggles itself free from the deadly embrace. The old traditions and legends about giants, about Thor's battles in the Jotunheim, when rocks were split and crags were hurled about and the valleys were filled with falling boulders, all come back to me when I look at these mighty ridges of ice winding their way far off in the moonlight and when I see the men standing on the ice heap cutting and digging to remove a fraction of it, then they seem to me smaller than pygmies, smaller than ants. But although each ant carries only a single fir needle, yet in course of time they build an ant hill where they can live comfortably sheltered from storm and winter. Had this attack on the Fram been planned by the aid of all the wickedness in the world, it could not have been a worse one. 
the floe seven feet thick has borne down on us on the port side forcing itself up on the ice in which we are lying and crushing it down thus the fram was forced down with the ice while the other floe packed up on the ice beneath bore down on her and took her amidships while she was still frozen fast as far as i can judge she could hardly have had a tighter squeeze it was no wonder that she groaned under it but she withstood it broke loose and eased who shall say after this that a vessel's shape is of little consequence had the fram not been designed as she was we should not have been sitting here now not a drop of water is to be found in her anywhere strangely enough the ice has not given us another such squeeze since then perhaps it was its expiring grip we felt on saturday it is hard to tell but it was terrific enough this morning sverdrup and i went for a walk on the ice but when we got a little way from the ship we found no sign of any new packing the ice was smooth and unbroken as before the packing has been limited to a certain stretch from east to west and the fram has been lying at the very worst point of it this afternoon hansen has worked out yesterday's observations the result being eighty three degrees thirty four point two minutes north latitude and one hundred two degrees fifty one minutes east longitude we have therefore drifted north and westward fifteen miles west indeed and only thirteen point five north since new year's eve while the wind has been mostly from the southwest it seems as if the ice has taken a more decided course towards the northwest than ever and therefore it is not to be wondered at that there is some pressure when the wind blows athwart the course of the ice however i hardly think we need any particular explanation of the pressure as we have evidently again got into a packing center with cracks lanes and ridges where the pressure is maintained for some time such as we were in during the first winter we have constantly met with several similar stretches on the surrounding ice even when it has been most quiet this evening there was a most remarkable brightness right under the moon it was like an immense luminous haycock which rose from the horizon and touched the great ring round the moon at the upper side of this ring there was a segment of the usual inverted arc of light the next day january eighth the ice began grinding occasionally and while mogstad and i stood in the hold working on hand sledges we heard creakings in the ship both above and below us this was repeated several times but in the intervals it was quiet i was often on the ice listening to the grinding and watching how it went on but it did not go beyond crackling and creaking beneath our feet and in the ridge at our side perhaps it is to warn us not to be too confident i am not so sure that it is not necessary it is in reality like living on a smoking volcano the eruption that will seal our fate may occur at any moment it will either force the ship up or swallow her down and what are the stakes either the fram will get home and the expedition be fully successful or we shall lose her and have to be content with what we have done and possibly on our way home we may explore parts of franz joseph land that is all but most of us feel that it would be hard to lose the ship and it would be a very sad sight to see her disappear some of the hands under sverdrup are working trying to cut away the hummock ice on the port side and they have already made good headway mogstad and i are busy getting the sledges in order and preparing them for use as i want them whether we go north or south leave is two years old to-day she is a big girl now i wonder if i should be able to recognize her i suppose i should hardly find a single familiar feature they are sure to celebrate the day and she will get all kinds of presents many a thought will be sent northward but they know not where to look for us are not aware that we are drifting here embedded in the ice in the highest northern latitudes ever reached in the deepest polar night ever penetrated during the following days the ice became steadily quieter in the course of the night of the ninth of january the ice was still slightly cracking and grinding then it quite subsided and on the tenth of january the report is 
ice perfectly quiet and if it were not for the ridge on the port side one would never have thought there had ever been any breach in the eternal stillness so calm and peaceful is it some men went on cutting away the ice and little by little we could see it was getting less mogstad and i were busily engaged in the hold with the new sledges and during this time i also made an attempt to photograph the fram by moonlight from different points the results surpassed my expectations but as the top of the pressure ridge had now been cut away these photos do not give an exact impression of the pack ice and of how it came hurtling down upon the fram we then put in order our depot on the great hummock on the starboard quarter and all sleeping bags lapland boots fin shoes wolfskin clothing etc were wrapped in the foresail and placed to the extreme west the provisions were collected into six different heaps and the rifles and guns were distributed among three of the heaps and wrapped up in boat sails next hansen's instrument case and my own together with a bucket full of rifle cartridges were placed under a boat sail then the forge and the smith's tools were arranged separately and up on the top of the great hummock we laid a heap of sledges and snowshoes all the kayaks were laid side by side bottom upward the cooking apparatus and lamps etc being placed under them they were spread out in this way so that in the improbable event of the thick floe splitting suddenly our loss would not be so great we knew where to find everything and it might blow and drift to its heart's content without our losing anything on the evening of january fourteenth i wrote in my diary two sharp reports were heard in the ship like shots from a cannon and then followed a noise as of something splitting presumably this must be the cracking of the ice on account of the frost it appeared to me that the list on the ship increased at that moment but perhaps it was only imagination as time passed on we all gradually got busy again preparing for the sledge expedition on tuesday january fifteenth i say this evening the doctor gave a lesson to johansen and myself in bandaging and repairing broken limbs i lay on the table and had a plaster of paris bandage put round the calf of my leg while all the crew were looking on the very sight of this operation cannot fail to suggest unpleasant thoughts an accident of this nature out in the polar night with forty degrees to fifty degrees of cold would be anything but pleasant to say nothing of how easily it might mean death to both of us but who knows we might manage somehow however such things must not be allowed to happen and what is more they shall not as january went on we could by noon just see the faint dawn of day that day at whose sunrise we were to start on january eighteenth i say by nine o'clock in the morning i could already distinguish the first indications of dawn and by noon it seemed to be getting bright but it seems hardly credible that in a month's time there will be light enough to travel by yet it must be so true february is a month which all experienced people consider far too early and much too cold for travelling hardly any one would do so in the month of march but it cannot be helped we have no time to waste in waiting for additional comfort if we are to make any progress before the summer when travelling will be impossible i am not afraid of the cold we can always protect ourselves against that meantime all preparations are proceeding and i am now getting everything in order connected with copying of diaries observation books photographs etc that we are to take with us mogstad is working in the hold making maple guard runners to put under the sledges jakobsen has commenced to put a new sledge together pedersen is in the engine room making nails for the sledge fittings which mogstad is to put on in the meantime some of the others have built a large forge out on the ice with blocks of ice and snow and to-morrow sverdrup and i will heat and bend the runners in tar and steering at such a heat as we can produce in the forge we trust we shall be able to get a sufficient temperature to do this important work thoroughly in spite of the forty degrees of frost amundsen is now repairing the mill as there is something wrong with it again the cog-wheels being worn he thinks he will be able to get it all right again 
rather chilly work to be lying up there in the wind on the top of the mill boring in the hard steel and cast iron by lantern light and at such a temperature as we are having now i stood and watched the lantern light up there to-day and i soon heard the drill working one could tell the steel was hard then i could hear clapping of hands ah thought i you may well clap your hands together it is not a particularly warm job to be lying up there in the wind the worst of it is one cannot wear mittens for such work, but has to use the bare hands if one is to make any progress, and it would not take long to freeze them off, but it has to be done, he says, and he will not give in. He is a splendid fellow in all he undertakes, and I console him by saying that there are not many before him who have worked on the top of a mill in such frost north of 83 degrees on many expeditions they have avoided out-of-door work when the temperature got so low indeed he says i thought that other expeditions were in advance of us in that respect i imagined we had kept indoors too much i had no hesitation in enlightening him on this point i know he will do his best in any case this is indeed a strange time for me i feel as if i were preparing for a summer trip and the spring were already here yet it is still midwinter and the conditions of the summer trip may be somewhat ambiguous the ice keeps quiet the cracking in it and in the fram is due only to the cold i have during the last few days again read payer's account of his sledge expedition northward through austria sound it is not very encouraging the very land he describes as the realm of death where he thinks he and his companions would inevitably have perished had they not recovered the vessel is the place to which we look for salvation that is the region we hope to reach when our provisions have come to an end it may seem reckless but nevertheless i cannot imagine that it is so i cannot help believing that a land which even in april teems with bears ox and black guillemots and where seals are basking on the ice must be a canaan flowing with milk and honey for two men who have good rifles and good eyes it must surely yield food enough not only for the needs of the moment but also provisions for the journey onward to spitzbergen sometimes however the thought will prevent itself that it may be very difficult to get the food when it is most sorely needed but these are only passing moments we must remember carlyle's words a man shall and must be valiant he must march forward and quit himself like a man trusting imperturbably in the appointment and choice of the upper powers i have not it is true any upper powers it would probably be well to have them in such a case but we nevertheless are starting and the time approaches rapidly four weeks or little more soon pass by and then farewell to this snug nest which has been our home for eighteen months and we go out into the darkness and cold out into the still more unknown out yonder tis dark but onward we must over the dewy wet mountains ride through the land of the ice troll we shall both be saved or the ice troll's hand shall clutch us both on january twenty third i write the dawn has grown so much that there was a visible light from it on the ice and for the first time this year i saw the crimson glow of the sun low down in the dawn we now took soundings with the lead before i was to leave the vessel we found one thousand eight hundred seventy six fathoms three thousand four hundred fifty meters i then made some snowshoes down in the hold it was important to have them smooth tough and light on which one could make good headway they shall be well rubbed with tar stearine and tallow and there shall be speed in them then it is only a question of using one's legs and i have no doubt that can be managed tuesday january twenty ninth latitude yesterday eighty three degrees thirty minutes some days ago we had been so far north as eighty three degrees forty minutes but had again drifted southward the light keeps on steadily increasing and by noon it almost seems to be broad daylight i believe i could read the title of a book out in the open if the print were large and clear i take a stroll every morning greeting the dawning day before i go down into the hold to my work at the snowshoes and equipment 
my mind is filled with a peculiar sensation which i cannot clearly define there is certainly an exulting feeling of triumph deep in the soul a feeling that all one's dreams are about to be realized with the rising sun which steers northward across the ice-bound waters but while i am busy in these familiar surroundings a wave of sadness sometimes comes over me it is like bidding farewell to a dear friend and to a home which has long afforded me a sheltering roof at one blow all this and my dear comrades are to be left behind for ever never again shall i tread this snow-clad deck never again creep under this tent never hear the laughter ring in this familiar saloon never again sit in this friendly circle and then i remember that when the fram at last bursts from her bonds of ice and turns her prow towards norway i shall not be with her a farewell imparts to everything in life its own tinge of sadness like the crimson rays of the sun when the day good or bad sinks in tears below the horizon hundreds of times my eye wanders to the map hanging there on the wall and each time a chill creeps over me the distance before us seems so long and the obstacles in our path may be many but then again the feeling comes that we are bound to pull through it cannot be otherwise everything is too carefully prepared to fail now and meanwhile the southeast wind is whistling above us and we are continually drifting northward nearer our goal when i go up on deck and step out into the night with its glittering starry vault and the flaring aurora borealis then all these thoughts recede and i must as ever pause on the threshold of this sanctuary this dark deep silent space this infinite temple of nature in which the soul seeks to find its origin toiling aunt what matters it whether you reach your goal with your fur needle or not everything disappears none the less in the ocean of eternity in the great nirvana and as time rolls on our names are forgotten our deeds pass into oblivion and our lives flit by like the traces of a cloud and vanish like the mist dispelled by the warm rays of the sun our time is but a fleeting shadow hurrying us on to the end so it is ordained and having reached that end none ever retraces his steps two of us will soon be journeying farther through this immense waste into greater solitudes and deeper stillness wednesday january thirtieth today the great event has happened that the windmill is again at work for the first time after its long rest in spite of the cold and the darkness amundsen had got the cog-wheels into order and now it is running as smoothly and steadily as gutta percha we have now constant northeast winds and we again bore northward on sunday february third we were at eighty three degrees forty three minutes the time for our departure approached and the preparations were carried on with great activity the sledges were completed and i tried them under various conditions i have alluded to the fact that we made maple guards to put under the fixed nickel-plated runners the idea of this was to strengthen both the sledges and the runners so that they would at the beginning of the journey when the loads were heavy be less liable to breakage from the jolting to which they would probably be exposed later on when the load got lighter we might if we thought fit easily remove them these guards were also to serve another purpose i had an idea that in view of the low temperature we had during the winter and on the dry drift snow which then covered the ice floes metal would glide less easily than smooth wood especially if the latter were well rubbed with rich tar and stearine by february eighth one of the sledges with wooden guard runners was finished so that we could make experiments in this direction and we then found that it was considerably easier to haul than a similar sledge running on the nickel plate though the load of each was exactly the same the difference was so great that we found that it was at least half as hard again to draw a sledge on the nickel runners as on the tarred maple runners our new ash sledges were now nearly finished and weighed thirty pounds without the guard runners everybody is hard at work sverdrup is sewing bags or bolsters to put on the sledges as beds for the kayaks to rest on 
to this end the bags are to be made up to fit the bottoms of the boats johansen with one or two other men are stuffing the bags with pemmican which has to be warmed beaten and kneaded in order to give it the right form for making a good bed for our precious boats when these square flat bags are carried out into the cold they freeze as hard as stone and keep their form well blessing is sitting up in the workroom copying the photographs of which i have no prints hansen is working out a map of our route so far and copying out his observations for us etc etc in short there is hardly a man on board who does not feel that the moment for departure approaches perhaps the galley is the only place where everything goes on in the usual way under the management of lars our position yesterday was eighty three degrees thirty two point one minutes north latitude and one hundred two degrees twenty eight minutes east longitude so we are southward again but never mind what do a couple of miles more or less matter to us sunday february tenth Today there was so much daylight that at one o'clock I could fairly well read the Verdensgang when I held the paper up towards the light, but when I held it towards the moon, which was low in the north, it was no go. Before dinner I went for a short drive with Gulen and Susina, two of the young dogs, and Caiaphas. Gulen had never been in harness before, but yet she went quite well. She was certainly a little awkward at first, but that soon disappeared, and I think she will make a good dog when she is well trained. Susina, who was driven a little last autumn, conducted herself quite like an old sledge dog. The surface is hard and easy for the dogs to haul on. They get a good foothold, and the snow is not particularly sharp for their feet. However, it is not over smooth. This drift snow makes heavy going. The ice is smooth and easy to run on, and I trust we shall be able to make good day journeys. After all, we shall reach our destination sooner than we had expected. I cannot deny that it is a long journey, and scarcely anyone has ever more effectually burned his boats behind him. If we wish to turn back, we have absolutely nothing to return to not even a bare coast. It will be impossible to find the ship, and before us lies the great unknown. But there is only one road, and that lies straight ahead, right through, be it land or sea, be it smooth or rough, be it mere ice or ice and water. And I cannot but believe that we must get through, even if we should meet with the worst, that is, land and pack ice. Wednesday, February 13th. The pemmican bolsters and dried liver pie are now ready. The kayaks will get an excellent bedding, and I venture to say that such meat bolsters are an absolute novelty. Under each kayak there are three of them. They are made to fit the sledge and, as already stated, are molded to the shape of the kayak. They weigh 100 to 120 pounds each. The empty sacks weigh 2 or 3 pounds each, so that altogether the meat pemmican and liver pie in these three bags will weigh about 320 pounds. We each had our light sleeping bags of reindeer skin, and we tried to sleep out in them last night, but both Johansen and I found it rather cold, although it was only 37 degrees Fahrenheit of frost. We were perhaps too lightly clad under the wolfskin clothing. We are making another experiment with a little moron tonight. Saturday, February 16th. The outfitting is still progressing, but there are various small things yet to do which take time, and I do not know whether we shall be ready to start on Wednesday, February 20th, as I originally intended. The day is now so light that, so far as that is concerned, we might quite well start then, but perhaps we had better wait a day or two longer. Three sledge sails for single sledges are now finished. They are made of very light calico and are about 7 feet 2 inches broad by 4 feet 4 inches long. They are made so the two of them may be laced together and used as one sail for a double sledge, and I believe they will act well. They weigh a little over 1 pound each. Moreover, we have now most of the provisions ready stowed away in bags. End of file 3
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Fritjof Nansen, Volume 2. Chapter 3 We Make a Start, Part 1. Tuesday, February 26th. At last the day has arrived, that great day when the journey is to commence. The week has passed in untiring work to get everything ready. We should have started on the 20th, but it has been postponed from day to day. There was always something still to do. My head has been full night and day with all that was to be done and that must not be forgotten. Oh, this unceasing mental strain, which does not allow a minute's respite in which to throw off the responsibility, to give loose rein to the thoughts and let the dreams have full sway. The nerves are in a state of tension from the moment of awakening in the morning till the eyes close late at night. Ah, how well I know this state, which I have experienced each time I have been about to set out and retreat was to be cut off, never, I believe, more effectually than now. The last few nights I did not get to bed before half-past three or half-past four o'clock in the morning. It is not only what we ought to take with us that has to be taken care of, but we have to leave the vessel. Its command and responsibility have to be placed in other hands, and care must be taken that nothing is forgotten in the way of instructions to the men who remain, as the scientific observations will have to be continued on the same lines as they have been carried on hitherto, and other observations of all kinds will have to be made, etc., etc., the last night we were to spend on board the Fram eventually arrived, and we had a farewell party. In a strange, sad way, reminiscences were revived of all that had befallen us here on board, mingled with hope and trust in what the future would bring. I remained up till far into the night. Letters and remembrances had to be sent to those at home in case the unforeseen should happen. Among the last things I wrote were the following instructions to Sverdrup, in which I handed over to him the command of the expedition. Captain Otto Sverdrup, commander of the Fram. As I am now leaving the Fram, accompanied by Johansen, to undertake a journey northward, if possible, to the Pole, and from there to Spitsbergen, most likely via Franz Josef Land, I make over to you the command of the remaining part of the expedition. From the day I leave the Fram, all the authority which hitherto was vested in me shall devolve upon you to an equal extent, and the others will have to render absolute obedience to you or to whomsoever you may depute as their leader. I consider it superfluous to give any orders about what is to be done under various contingencies, even if it were possible to give any. I am certain you will know best yourself what ought to be done in any emergency, and I therefore consider that I may with confidence leave the Fram. The chief aim of the expedition is to push through the unknown polar sea, from the region around the New Siberian Islands, north of Franz Josef Land, and onward to the Atlantic Ocean, near Spitsbergen or Greenland. The most essential part of this task, I consider, we have already accomplished. The remainder will be achieved as the expedition gets farther west. In order to make the expedition still more fruitful of results, I am making an attempt to push farther up north with the dogs. Your task will then be to convey home, in the safest manner possible, the human lives now confided to your care, and not to expose them to any unnecessary danger, either out of regard for the ship or cargo, or for the scientific outcome of the expedition. No one can tell how long it may take before the Fram drifts out into open water. You have provisions for several years to come. If for any unknown reason it should take too long, or if the crew should begin to suffer in health, or if, from other reasons, you should think it best to abandon the vessel, it should unquestionably be done. As to the time of the year when this should be done, and the route to be chosen, you yourself will be best able to judge. If it should be necessary, I consider Franz Josef Land and Spitsbergen favorable lands to make for. If search is made for the expedition after the arrival home of Johansen and myself, it will be made there first. 
wherever you come to land you should as often as you can erect conspicuous beacons on promontories and projecting headlands and place within the beacons a short report of what has occurred and whither you are going in order to distinguish these beacons from others a small beacon should be erected four meters from the larger one in the direction of the magnetic north pole the question as to what outfit would be most advantageous in case the fram should have to be abandoned is one which we have so frequently discussed that i consider it superfluous to dwell on it here i know that you will take care that the requisite number of kayaks for all the men sledges snowshoes trugger and other articles of outfit are put in complete order as soon as possible and kept in readiness so that such a journey home over the ice could be undertaken with the greatest possible ease elsewhere i give you directions as to the provisions which i consider most suitable for such a journey and the quantity necessary for each man i also know that you will hold everything in readiness to abandon the fram in the shortest possible time in the event of her suffering sudden damage whether through fire or ice pressure if the ice permits it i consider it advisable that a depot with sufficient provisions etc should be established at a safe place on the ice such as we have lately had all necessaries which cannot be kept on the ice ought to be so placed on board that they are easy to get at under any circumstances as you are aware all the provisions now in the depot are concentrated foods for sledging journeys only but as it may happen that you will have to remain inactive for a time before going farther it would be highly desirable to save as much tinned meat fish and vegetables as possible should troublous times come then i should consider it advisable to have a supply of these articles ready on the ice should the fram while drifting be carried far to the north of spitzbergen and get over into the current under the east coast of greenland many possibilities may be imagined which it is not easy to form an opinion on now but should you be obliged to abandon the fram and make for the land it would be best for you to erect beacons there as stated above with particulars as to whither you are going etc as search might possibly be made there for the expedition whether in that case you ought to make for iceland which is the nearest land and where you should be able to get in the early part of summer if following the edge of the ice or for the danish colonies west of cape farewell you will be best able to judge on considering all the circumstances as regards what you ought to take with you in the event of abandoning the fram besides the necessary provisions i may mention weapons ammunition and equipment all scientific and other journals and observations all scientific collections that are not too heavy or if too heavy small samples thereof photographs preferably the original plates or films or should these prove too heavy then prints taken from them also the ottoman aerometer with which most of the observations on the specific gravity of sea-water are taken as well as of course all journals and memoranda which are of any interest i leave behind some diaries and letters which i would request you to take special care of and deliver to eva if i should not return home or if contrary to all expectation you should return home before us hansen and blessing will as you know attend to the various scientific expeditions and to the collecting of specimens you yourself will attend to the soundings and see that they are taken as frequently as possible and as the condition of the line permits i should consider at least once in every sixty miles covered to be extremely desirable if it can be done oftener so much the better should the depth become less than now and more variable it goes without saying that soundings should be taken more frequently as the crew was small before and will now be still further reduced by two men more work will probably fall to each man's lot but i know that whenever you can you will spare men to assist in the scientific observations and make them as complete as possible please also see that every tenth day the first tenth and twentieth of every month the ice is bored through and the thickness measured in the same way as has been done hitherto henriksen has for the most part made these borings and is a trustworthy man for this work 
in conclusion i wish all possible success to you and to those for whom you are now responsible and may we meet again in norway whether it be on board of this vessel or without her yours affectionately fritjof nansen on board the fram february twenty fifth eighteen ninety five now at last the brain was to get some rest and the work for the legs and arms to commence everything was got ready for the start this morning five of our comrades sverdrup hansen blessing henriksen and mogstad were to see us off on our way bringing a sledge and a tent with them the four sledges were got ready the dogs harnessed to them lunch with a bottle of malt extract per man was taken just before starting and then we bade the last hearty farewell to those left behind we were off into the drifting snow i myself took the lead with kvik as leading dog in the first sledge and then sledge after sledge followed amid cheers accompanied by the cracking of whips and the barking of dogs at the same time a salute was fired from the quarter-deck shot after shot into the whirling drift the sledges moved heavily forward it was slow travelling uphill and they came to a dead stop where the ascent was too steep and we all had to help them along one man alone could not do it but over level ground we flew along like a whirlwind and those on snowshoes found it difficult enough to keep pace with the sledges i had to strike out as best i could when they came up to me to avoid getting my legs entangled in the line a man is beckoning with his staff far in the rear it is mogstad who comes tearing along and shouting that three fluid stalker crossbars had been torn off a sledge in driving the sledge with its heavy load had lurched forward over an upright piece of ice which struck the crossbars breaking all three of them one after the other one or two of the perpendicular supports of the runners were also smashed there was nothing for it but to return to the ship to get it repaired and have the sledges made stronger such a thing ought not to happen again during the return one of the sledges lurched up against another and a cane in the bow snapped the bows would therefore also have to be made stronger the sledges have again been unloaded and brought on board in order that this may be done and here we are again to-night i am glad however that this happened when it did it would have been worse to have had such an experience a few days later i will now take six sledges instead of four so that the load on each may be less and so that it will be easier to lift them over the irregularities of the ground i shall also have a broad board fitted lengthwise to the sledge underneath the crossbars so as to protect them against projecting pieces of ice as a great deal of time is saved in the end by doing such things thoroughly before starting we shall not be ready to start before the day after to-morrow it seemed strange to be on board again after having said good-bye as i thought forever to these surroundings when i came up on the after-deck i found the guns lying there in the snow one of them turned over on its back the other had recoiled a long way aft when saluting us from the mizzen-top the red and black flag was still waving i am in wonderfully high spirits and feel confident of success the sledges seemed to glide so easily although carrying two hundred pounds more than was originally intended about twenty two hundred pounds altogether and everything looks very promising we shall have to wait a couple of days but as we are having a southeasterly wind all day long we are no doubt getting on towards the north all the same yesterday we were eighty three degrees forty seven minutes to-day i suppose we are at least eighty three degrees fifty minutes at last on thursday february twenty eighth we started again with our six sledges sverdrup hansen blessing henriksen and mogstad saw us off when we started most of the others also accompanied us some distance we soon found that the dogs did not draw as well as i had expected and i came to the conclusion that with this load we should get on too slowly we had not proceeded far from the ship before i decided to leave behind some of the sacks with provisions for the dogs and these were later on taken back on board by the others at four o'clock in the afternoon when we stopped our odometer showed that we had gone about four miles from the fram we had a pleasant evening in the tent together with our friends who were going back the next day to my surprise a punch bowl was prepared and toasts were proposed for those who were starting and those who remained behind 
it was not until eleven o'clock that we crept into our sleeping bags there were illuminations in our honor that night on board the fram the electric arc lamp was hoisted on the main top and the electric light for the first time shone forth over the ice masses of the polar sea torches had also been lit and bonfires of oakum ends and other combustibles were burning on several floes around the fram and making a brilliant show sverdrup had by the way given orders that the electric light or a lantern should be hoisted on the main top every night until he and the others had returned for fear they might lose their way if the tracks should be obliterated by bad weather it would then be very difficult to find the ship but such a light can be seen a long distance over these plains where by merely standing on a hummock one can easily get a view for many miles round i was afraid that the dogs if they got loose would go back to the fram and i therefore got two steel lines made to which short leashes were fastened a little distance apart so that the dogs could be secured to these lines between two sticks or sledges in spite of this several of the dogs got loose but strange to say they did not leave us but remained with their comrades and us there was of course a doleful howling round the tents the first night and they disturbed our sleep to some extent the next morning friday march first it took one of our comrades three hours to make the coffee being unaccustomed to the apparatus we then had a very nice breakfast together not before eleven thirty a m did we get under way our five comrades accompanied us for an hour or two and then turned to get back to the fram the same evening it was certainly a most cheerful good-bye says the diary but it is always hard to part even at eighty-four degrees and maybe there was a tearful eye or two the last thing sverdrup asked me when sitting on his sledge just as we were about to part was if i thought i should go to the south pole when i got home for if so he hoped i would wait till he arrived and then he asked me to give his love to his wife and child and so we proceeded johansen and i but it was slow work for us alone with six sledges which were impeded on their way by all sorts of obstacles and inequalities besides this the ice became rougher so that it was difficult to get on during the afternoon on account of the darkness the days being still very short and the sun was not yet above the horizon we therefore camped rather early wednesday march sixth we are again on board the fram to make a fresh start for the third time and then i suppose it will be in earnest on saturday march second we proceeded with the six sledges after i had been a trip to the northward and found it passable progress was slow and we had to do nearly six turns each as the sledges stopped everywhere and had to be helped along i saw now too clearly that we should never get on in this manner a change would have to be made and i decided to camp in order to have a look at the ice northward and consider the matter having tied up the dogs i set out while johansen was to feed the dogs and put up the tent they were fed once in every twenty-four hours at night when the day's march was done i had not gone far when i came upon excellent spacious plains good progress could be made and so far everything was all right but the load had to be diminished and the number of sledges reduced undoubtedly therefore it would be best to return to the fram to make the necessary alterations on board and get the sledges we were to take with us further strengthened so as to have perfect confidence in their durability we might of course have dragged along somehow towards the north for a while and the load would gradually have decreased but it would have been slow work and before the load would be sufficiently lightened the dogs would perhaps be worn out it was cold for them at night we heard many of them howling most of the night if however we diminished the load and consequently allowed a shorter time for the journey it would be preferable to wait and not start till a little later in the month when we could make more out of the time as the days would be lighter and not so cold and the snow surface better having spent another night in the tent into which it was a hard job to get dressed in a fur that was stiff with frost and then into a bag that was also hard frozen i decided next morning sunday march third to return to the fram i harnessed a double team of dogs to one of the sledges and off they went over pressure ridges and all other obstacles so rapidly that i could hardly keep up with them 
in a few hours i covered the same distance which had taken us three days when we started out the advantage of a lighter load was only too apparent as i approached the fram i saw to my surprise the upper edge of the sun above the ice in the south it was the first time this year but i had not expected it as yet it was the refraction caused by the low temperature which made it visible so soon the first news i heard from those who came to meet me was that hansen had the previous afternoon taken an observation which gave eighty four degrees four minutes north latitude it was undoubtedly very pleasant once more to stretch my limbs on the sofa in the fram saloon to quench my thirst in delicious lime juice with sugar and again to dine in a civilized manner in the afternoon hansen and nordahl went back to johansen with my team of dogs to keep him company overnight when i left him it was understood that he was to start on the return journey as best he could until i came with others to help him the dogs lost no time and the two men reached johansen's tent in an hour and twenty minutes at night both they and we had rejoicings in honor of the sun and the eighty-fourth degree the next morning three of us went off and fetched the sledges back now when we made for the ship the dogs dragged much better and in a short time we should have been on board had it not been for a long lane in the ice which we could see no end to and which stopped us finally we left the sledges and together with the dogs managed to cross over on some loose pieces of ice and got on board yesterday we twice tried to fetch the sledges but there had evidently been some movement in the lane and the new ice was still so thin that we dared not trust it we have however to-day got them on board and we will now for the last time it is to be hoped prepare ourselves for the journey i will now plan out the journey so as to take the shortest possible time using light sledges and tearing along as fast as legs and snowshoes will carry us we shall be none the worse for this delay provided we do not meet too much pack ice or too many openings in the ice i have weighed all the dogs and have come to the conclusion that we can feed them on each other and keep going for about fifty days having in addition to this dog provisions for about thirty days we ought to be able to travel with dogs for eighty days and in that time it seems to me we should have arrived somewhere and besides we have provisions for ourselves for one hundred days this will be about four hundred forty pounds on each sledge if we take three and with nine dogs per sledge we ought to manage it so here we were again busy with preparations and improvements in the meantime the ice moved a little broke up and lanes were formed in various directions on march eighth i say the crack in the large floe to starboard formed while we were away opened yesterday into a broad lane which we can see stretching with newly frozen ice towards the horizon both north and south it is odd how that petroleum launch is always in hot water wherever it is this crack formed underneath it so it was hanging with the stern over the water when they found it in the morning we have now decided to cut it up and use the elm boards for the sledge runners that will be the end of it wednesday march thirteenth eighty four degrees north latitude one hundred one degrees fifty five minutes east longitude the days have passed working again at the equipment everything is now in order three sledges are standing ready out on the ice properly strengthened in every way with iron fastenings between uprights and crossbars these last mentioned are securely strengthened with extra top pieces of ash and protected underneath by boards this afternoon we tried the dogs with sledges loaded and they went as easily as could be and to-morrow we start again for the last time full of courage and confidence and with the sun up in the assurance that we are going towards ever brighter days to-night there has been a great farewell feast with many hearty speeches and to-morrow we depart as early as possible provided our dissipation has not delayed us i have to-night added the following postscript to sverdrup's instructions p s in the foregoing instructions which i wrote rather hurriedly on the night of february twenty fifth i omitted to mention things that should have been alluded to 
i will restrict myself here to stating further that should you sight unknown land everything ought of course to be done in order to ascertain and examine it as far as circumstances will permit should the fram drift so near that you think it can be reached without great risk everything that can be done to explore the land would be of the greatest interest every stone every blade of grass lichen or moss every animal from the largest to the smallest would be of great importance photographs and an exact description should not be neglected at the same time it should be traversed to the greatest possible extent in order to ascertain its coastline size etc all such things should however only be done provided they can be accomplished without danger if the fram is adrift in the ice it is clear that only short excursions should be made from her as the members of such expeditions might encounter great difficulties in reaching the vessel again should the fram remain stationary for any time such expeditions should still be undertaken only with great discretion and not be extended over any great length of time as no one can foresee when she may commence to drift again and it would be very undesirable for all concerned if the crew of the fram were to be still further reduced we have so often spoken together about the scientific researches that i do not consider it necessary to give any further suggestions here i am certain that you will do everything in your power to make them as perfect as possible so that the expedition may return with as good results as the circumstances will permit and now once again my wishes for all possible success and may we meet again before long your affectionate fritjof nansen the from March 13, 1895. End of file four. File five of Farthest North, volume two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Fritjof Nansen, volume two. We make a start. Part two before leaving the fram for good i ought perhaps to give a short account of the equipment we finally decided on as the most likely to suit our purposes i have already mentioned the two kayaks that had been made during the course of the winter and that we required to have with us in order to cross possible channels and pools and also for use when we should come to open sea instead of these kayaks i had at first thought of taking ready-made canvas boat covers and of using the sledges as frames to stretch them over by this means a craft perfectly capable of carrying us over lanes and short bits of open sea could have been rigged up in a very short space of time i subsequently gave up this idea however and decided on the kayak a craft with which i was familiar and which i knew would render valuable assistance in several respects even if we had been able to contrive a cover for the sledges in such a manner that a boat could have been got ready in a short space of time it would not have been such quick work as simply launching a ready-made kayak added to this the craft would necessarily have been heavy to row and when it was a question of long distances in open water such as along the coasts of franz joseph land or across thence to spitzbergen much time would have been lost one consideration indeed and that of some moment was the saving in weight if the sledges were made use of but even this was not of so much importance as it seemed as the covers of both kinds of craft would have weighed about the same and what would have been saved in the weight of the frames was not much if one remembers that a whole kayak frame only weighs about sixteen pounds then too if kayaks were used some weight would be saved by being able to carry our provisions and other impedimenta in bags of thin material which could be stowed away in the kayaks and the latter lashed to the sledges our provisions would thus be protected against all risk of attack by dogs or of being cut by sharp pieces of ice the other alternative the canvas cover which would have required fitting on and folding up again after being in the water would necessarily in the low temperatures we had to expect have become spoiled and leaky last but not least the kayak with its tightly covered deck is a most efficient sea boat in which one can get along in any kind of weather and is also an admirable craft for shooting and fishing purposes 
the boat which one could have contrived by the other expedient could with difficulty have been made anyway satisfactory in this respect i have also mentioned the sledges which i had made for this expedition they were of the same pattern as those built for the greenland one somewhat resembling in shape the norwegian shishelka which is a low hand sledge on broad runners similar to our ordinary ski but instead of the broad flat runners we used in greenland i had the runners made in this case about the same in width three and one sixth inches but somewhat convex underneath like those to be found on the shishelka of osterdalen and elsewhere these convex runners proved to move very easily on the kind of country which we had to travel over and they enabled the long sledges to be turned with ease which was particularly convenient in the drift ice where the many irregularities often necessitated a very zigzag route the runners were covered with a thin plate of german silver which as it always keeps bright and smooth and does not rust answered its purpose well as i mentioned before there were thin loose well tarred guard runners of a kind of maple osser platinidus underneath the german silver ones the sledges were also prepared in various other ways which have been treated of before for the heavy loads they were to carry at the beginning the result of this was that they were somewhat heavier than i had intended at first but in return i had the satisfaction of their being fit for use during the whole journey and not once were we stopped or delayed by their breaking down this has hardly been the case with former sledge journeys i have referred several times to our clothes and our trial trips in them although we had come to the conclusion that our wolfskin garments were too warm for traveling in we took them with us all the same on our first trip and wore them too to a certain extent but we would soon discovered that they were always too warm and caused undue perspiration by absorbing all the moisture of the body they became so heavy that they made an appreciable difference in the weight of our loads and on our return from our three days absence from the vessel were so wet that they had to be hung for a long time over the saloon stove to dry to this was added the experience that when we took them off in the cold after having worn them for a time they froze so stiff that it was difficult to get them on again the result of all this was that i was not very favorably disposed towards them and eventually made up my mind to keep to my woolen clothes which i thought would give free outlet to the perspiration johansen followed my example our clothes then came to consist of about the following on the upper part of the body two woolen shirts jaegers outside these i had a camel's hair coat and last of all a thick rough jersey instead of the jersey johansen wore what is called on board ship an anorak of thick homespun provided with a hood which he could pull forward in front of his face and made after an eskimo pattern on our legs we had next to our skin woolen drawers and over these knickerbockers and loose gaiters of close norwegian homespun to protect us from wind and fine driven snow which being of the nature of dust forces itself into every pore of a woolen fabric we wore a suit which has been mentioned before made of a thin close kind of cotton canvas and consisting of an upper garment to pull over the head provided with a hood in eskimo fashion and a lower one in the shape of a pair of wide overalls an important item in any outfit is the footgear instead of wearing long stockings i preferred to use loose stocking legs and socks as these are easy to dry on one's chest when asleep at night on a journey of this kind where one is continually traveling over snow and in a low temperature whether it be on ski or not my experience is that fin shoes are without doubt the most satisfactory covering for the feet in every way but they must be made of the skin of the hind legs of the reindeer buck they are warm and strong they are always flexible and are easy to put on and take off they require careful management however if they are not to be spoiled at the outset and one must try as well as one can to dry them when asleep at night 
if it be sunny and good drying weather outside the best plan is to hang them on a couple of ski staffs or something of the kind in the wind outside the tent preferably turned inside out so that the skin itself can dry quickly if one does not take this precaution the hair will soon begin to fall out in severe cold such as we had on the first part of our journey it was impossible to dry them in this way and our only resource was then to dry them on the feet at night after having carefully brushed and scraped them free from snow and moisture then the next process is to turn them inside out fill them with senegrass or sedge if one have it thrust one's feet in and creep into the sleeping bag with them on for milder weather later on we had provided ourselves with leather boots of the komager type such as the laps use in summer in this case they were made of under tanned ox hide with soles of the skin of the blue seal foca barbara well rubbed in with a composition of tar and tallow they make a wonderfully strong and watertight boot especially for use in wet weather inside the fin shoe we used at the beginning of our journey this senegrass carex isicaria of which we had taken a supply this is most effective in keeping the feet dry and warm and if used lapwise that is with bare feet it draws all moisture to itself at night the wet senegrass must be removed from the boots well pulled out with the fingers so that it does not cling together and then dried during the night by being worn inside the coat or trousers leg in the morning it will be about dry and can be pressed into the boots again little by little however it becomes used up and if it is to last out a long journey a good supply must be taken we also had with us socks made of sheep's wool and human hair which were both warm and durable then too we took squares of vaudemel or norwegian homespun such as are used in our army which we wore inside our komager particularly myself on the latter part of the journey when the snow was wet they are comfortable to wear and easy to dry as one can spread them out under one's coat or trousers at night on our hands we wore large gloves of wolf skin in addition to ordinary woolen mittens underneath neither of them having separate divisions for the fingers exactly the same drying process had to be gone through with the gloves as with the footgear altogether the warmth of one's unfortunate body which is the only source of heat one has for this sort of work is chiefly expended in the effort to dry one's various garments and we spent our nights in wet compresses in order that the morrow might pass in a little more comfort on our heads we wore felt hats which shaded the eyes from the dazzling light and were less pervious to the wind than an ordinary woolen cap outside the hat we generally had one or two hoods of cloth by this means we could regulate the warmth of our heads to a certain extent and this is no unimportant thing it had been my original intention to use light one-man sleeping bags made of the skin of the reindeer calf as these however proved to be insufficiently warm i had to resort to the same principle we went on in greenland that is a double bag of adult reindeer skin a considerable increase of warmth is thus attained by the fact that the occupants warm each other furthermore a bag for two men is not a little lighter than two single bags an objection has been raised to joint bags on the score that one's night's rest is apt to be disturbed but this i have not found to be the case something which in my opinion ought not to be omitted from a sledge journey is a tent even if thin and frail it affords the members of an expedition so much protection and comfort that the inconsiderable increase in weight to the equipment is more than compensated for the tents that i had had made for the expedition were of strong undressed silk and very light they were square at the base and pointed at the top and were pitched by means only of a tent pole in the middle on the same principle as the four-man tents used in our army most of them had canvas floors attached on our first start we took with us a tent of this kind intended to hold four men and weighing a little over seven pounds the floor is a certain advantage as it makes the whole tent compact and is quick to put up besides being more impervious to wind 
the whole tent is sewed in one piece walls and floor together and the only opening a little split through which to crawl one drawback however to it is that it is almost impossible not to carry in with one a certain amount of snow on the feet this melts during the night from the heat of one's body lying on it and the floor absorbs the moisture thereby causing the tent to be always a good deal heavier than the figures given here i accordingly relinquished all idea of a tent of this kind and took with me one of about the same dimensions but without a floor and of the same silk material as the other it took a little longer to put up but the difference was not great the walls were kept down by pegs and when all was finished we would bank it carefully round with snow to exclude wind and draughts then came the actual pitching of the tent which was accomplished by crawling in through the entrance and poking it up with a ski staff which also served as a tent pole it weighed a fraction over three pounds including sixteen pegs lasted the whole journey through that is to say until the autumn and was always a cherished place of refuge the cooking apparatus we took with us had the advantage of utilizing to the utmost the fuel consumed with it we were able in a very short space of time to cook food and simultaneously melt an abundance of drinking water so that both in the morning and in the evening we were able to drink as much as we wished and even a surplus remained the apparatus consisted of two boilers and a vessel for melting snow or ice in and was constructed in the following manner inside a ring-shaped vessel was placed the boiler while underneath this again was the lamp the entire combustion output was thus forced to mount into the space between the boiler and the ring-shaped vessel over this was a tight-fitting lid with a hole in the middle through which the hot air was obliged to pass before it could penetrate farther and reach the bottom of a flat snow melter which was placed above it then after having delivered some part of its heat the air was forced down again on the outside of the ring-shaped vessel by the help of a mantle or cap which surrounded the hole here it parted with its last remaining warmth to the outer side of the ring vessel and finally escaped almost entirely cooled from the lower edge of the mantle for the heating was used a swedish gas petroleum lamp known as the primus in which the heat turns the petroleum into gas before it is consumed by this means it renders the combustion unusually complete numerous experiments made by professor torup at his laboratory proved that the cooker in ordinary circumstances yielded ninety to ninety three per cent of the heat which the petroleum consumed should by combustion theoretically evolve a more satisfactory result i think it would be difficult to obtain the vessels in this cooker were made of german silver while the lid outside cap etc were of aluminum together with two tin mugs two tin spoons and a tin ladle it weighed exactly eight pounds thirteen ounces while the lamp the primus weighed four and a half ounces as fuel my choice this time fell on petroleum snowflake alcohol which has generally been used before on arctic expeditions has several advantages and in particular is easy to burn one decided drawback to it however is the fact that it does not by any means generate so much heat in comparison with its weight as petroleum when the latter is entirely consumed as was the case with the lamp used by us as i was afraid that petroleum might freeze i had a notion of employing gas oil but gave up the idea as it escapes so easily that it is difficult to preserve and is moreover very explosive we had no difficulties with our snowflake petroleum on account of the cold we took with us rather more than four gallons and this quantity lasted us one hundred twenty days enabling us to cook two hot meals a day and melt an abundance of water of snowshoes we took several pairs as we had to be prepared for breakages in the uneven drift ice besides this they would probably get considerably worn in the summer time when the snow became wet and granular those we took with us were particularly tough and slid readily they were for the most part of the same kind of maple as the sledges and of birch and hickory they had all been well rubbed in with a concoction of tar stearine and tallow 
as we calculated to subsist in a measure on what we could shoot ourselves it was necessary for us to have firearms the most important gun for this kind of work is naturally the rifle but as in all likelihood we should have to go across large expanses of snow where probably there would be little big game and whereas on the other hand birds might very likely come flying over our heads i thought shotguns would be the most serviceable to us therefore we decided on the same equipment in this respect as we had in greenland we took with us two double-barreled guns buchs flints each of them having a shot barrel of twenty bore and a barrel for ball express of about point three six o caliber our supply of ammunition consisted of about one hundred eighty rifle cartridges and one hundred fifty shot cartridges our instruments for determining our position and for working sites were a small light theodolite specially constructed for the purpose which with its case this i had also had made to act as a stand only weighed a little over two pounds we had furthermore a pocket sextant and an artificial glass horizon a light azimuth compass of aluminum and a couple of other compasses for the meteorological observations we had a couple of aneroid barometers two minimum spirit thermometers and three quicksilver sling thermometers in addition to these we had a good aluminum telescope and also a photographic camera the most difficult but also perhaps the most important point in the equipment of a sledge expedition is thoroughly good and adequate victualling i have already mentioned in the introduction to this book that the first and foremost object is to protect oneself against scurvy and other maladies by the choice of foods which through careful preparation and sterilization are assured against decomposition on a sledge expedition of this kind where so much attention must be paid to the weight of the equipment it is hardly possible to take any kinds of provisions except those of which the weight has been reduced as much as possible by careful and complete drying as however meat and fish are not so easily digested when dried it is no unimportant thing to have them in a pulverized form the dried food is in this manner so finely distributed that it can with equal facility be digested and received into the organism this preparation of meat and fish was therefore the only kind we took with us the meat was muscular beef taken from the ox and freed from all fat gristle etc it was then dried as quickly as possible in a completely fresh condition and thereupon ground and mixed with the same proportion of beef suet as is used in the ordinary preparation of pemmican this form of food which has been used for a considerable time on sledge expeditions has gained for itself much esteem and rightly if well prepared as ours was it is undeniably a nourishing and easily digested food one ought not however to trust to its always being harmless as if carelessly prepared that is slowly or imperfectly dried it may also be very injurious to the health another item of our provisions by which we set great store was vaga's fish flour it is well prepared and has admirable keeping qualities if boiled in water and mixed with flour and butter or dried potatoes it furnishes a very appetizing dish another point which should be attended to is that the food be of such a kind that it can be eaten without cooking fuel is part of an equipment no doubt but if for some reason or other this be lost or used up one would be in a bad case indeed had one not provided against such a contingency by taking food which could be eaten in spite of that in order to save fuel too it is important that the food should not require cooking but merely warming the flour that we took with us had therefore been steamed and could if necessary have been eaten as it was without further preparation merely brought to a boil it made a good hot dish we also took dried boiled potatoes pea soup chocolate vril food etc our bread was partly carefully dried wheaten biscuits and partly aluronid bread which i had caused to be made of wheat flour mixed with about thirty per cent of aluronid flour vegetable albumen we also took with us a considerable quantity of butter eighty six pounds which had been well worked on board in order to get out all superfluous water 
by this means not only was considerable weight saved but the butter did not become so hard in the cold on the whole it must be said that our menus included considerable variety and we were never subjected to that sameness of food which former sledge expeditions have complained so much of finally we always had ravenous appetites and always thought our meals as delicious as they could be our medicine chest consisted on this occasion of a little bag containing naturally only the most absolutely necessary drugs etc some splints and some ligatures and plaster of paris bandages for possible broken legs and arms apparent pills and laudanum for derangements of the stomach which were never required chloroform in case of an amputation for example from frostbite a couple of small glasses of cocaine in solution for snow blindness also unused drops for toothache carbolic acid iodoform gauze a couple of curved needles and some silk for sewing up wounds a scalpel two artery tweezers also for amputations and a few other sundries happily our medicines were hardly ever required except that the ligatures and bandages came in very handily the following winter as wicks for our train oil lamps still better for this purpose however is nicolaisen's plaster of which we had taken a supply for possible broken collarbones the layer of wax we scraped carefully off and found it most satisfactory for caulking our leaky kayaks list of the equipment sledge number one with nonsense kayak kayak forty one pounds two ounces eighteen point seven kilos pump for pumping kayaks in case of leakage one pound two ounces point five kilos sail one pound nine ounces point seven kilos axe and geological hammer one pound five ounces point six kilos gun and case seven pounds four ounces three point three kilos two small wooden rods belonging to cooker zero pounds fourteen ounces point four kilos theolite and case four pounds thirteen ounces two point two kilos three reserve cross pieces for sledges two pounds zero ounces point nine kilos some pieces of wood zero pounds eleven ounces point three kilos harpoon line zero pounds eight point four ounces point two four kilos fur gaiters one pound three ounces point five five kilos five balls of cord two pounds nine ounces one point one seven kilos cooker with two mugs ladle and two spoons eight pounds thirteen ounces four kilos petroleum lamp primus zero pounds four and a half ounces point one kilos pocket flask zero pounds six ounces point one seven kilos bag with sundry articles of clothing eight pounds thirteen ounces four kilos blanket four pounds six ounces two kilos jersey two pounds eight ounces one point one five kilos fin shoes filled with grass three pounds one ounce one point four kilos cap for fitting over opening in kayak zero pounds seven ounces point two kilos one pair komager two pounds one ounce point nine five kilos two pair kayak gloves and one harpoon and line one pound five ounces point six kilos one waterproof seal skin kayak overcoat three pounds one ounce one point four kilos tool bag two pounds ten ounces one point two kilos bag of sewing materials including sail maker's palm sail needles and other sundries two pounds ten ounces one point two kilos three norwegian flags zero pounds four ounces point one kilos medicines etc four pounds fifteen ounces two point two five kilos photographic camera four pounds ten ounces two point one kilos one cassette and one tin box of films three pounds fourteen ounces one point seven five kilos one wooden cup zero pounds three ounces point zero eight kilos one rope for lashing kayak to sledge two pounds zero ounces point nine kilos pieces of reindeer skin to prevent kayaks from chafing three pounds fifteen ounces one point eight kilos wooden shovel 
two pounds three ounces one kilo ski staff with disc at bottom one pound nine ounces point seven kilos one bamboo staff one pound zero ounces point four five kilos two oak staves two pounds ten ounces one point two kilos seven reserve dog harnesses and two reserve hauling ropes two pounds ten ounces one point two kilos one coil of rope zero pounds six ounces point one eight kilos four bamboo poles for masts and for steering sledges eight pounds thirteen ounces four kilos one bag of bread five pounds fifteen ounces two point seven kilos one bag of whey powder three pounds five ounces one point five kilos one bag of sugar two pounds three ounces one kilo one bag of albuminous flour one pound twelve ounces point eight kilos one bag of lime juice tablets one pound ten ounces point seven three kilos one bag of frame food stamina tablets two pounds seven ounces one point one kilos as boats grips under the sledges were three sacks of pemmican together two hundred thirty eight pounds one ounce one hundred eight point two kilos one sack lever poste or pate made of calf's liver ninety three pounds fifteen ounces forty two point seven kilos sledge number two on this were carried in strong sacks albuminous flour fourteen pounds fifteen ounces six point eight kilos wheat flour fifteen pounds six ounces seven kilos whey powder sixteen pounds fifteen ounces seven point seven kilos corn flour eight pounds thirteen ounces four kilos sugar seven pounds one ounce three point two kilos real food thirty one pounds four ounces fourteen point two kilos australian pemmican thirteen pounds zero ounces five point nine kilos chocolate twelve pounds twelve ounces five point eight kilos oatmeal eleven pounds zero ounces five kilos dried red whortleberries zero pounds fourteen ounces point four kilos two sacks of white bread together sixty nine pounds five ounces thirty one point five kilos one sack of aluronate bread forty six pounds ten ounces twenty one point two kilos special food a mixture of pea flour meat powder fat etc sixty three pounds thirteen ounces twenty nine kilos butter eighty five pounds thirteen ounces thirty nine kilos fish flour vagas thirty four pounds two ounces fifteen point five kilos dried potatoes fifteen pounds three ounces six point nine kilos one reindeer skin sleeping bag nineteen pounds thirteen ounces nine kilos two steel wire ropes with couples for twenty-eight dogs eleven pounds zero ounces five kilos one pair hickory snowshoes eleven pounds zero ounces five kilos weight of sledge forty three pounds five ounces nineteen point seven kilos sledge number three with johansen's kayak kayak forty one pounds six ounces eighteen point eight kilos two pieces of reindeer skin to prevent chafing one pound twelve ounces point eight kilos a supply of dog shoes one pound three ounces point five five kilos one eskimo shooting sledge with sail intended for possible seal shooting on the ice one pound ten ounces point seven three kilos two sledge sails two pounds ten ounces one point two kilos pump zero pounds fourteen ounces point four kilos oar blades made of canvas stretched on frames and intended to be lashed to the ski staffs one pound two ounces point five kilos gun seven pounds two point seven ounces three point two six kilos flask zero pounds five point nine ounces point one seven kilos net for catching crustacea in the sea zero pounds five point two ounces point one five kilos one pair comager one pound fifteen point seven ounces point nine kilos waterproof kayak overcoat of seal skin two pounds three ounces one kilo fur gaiters zero pounds seven point three ounces point two one kilos 
two reserve pieces of wood zero pounds nine point eight ounces point two eight kilos two tins of petroleum about five gallons forty pounds point six ounces eighteen point two kilos several reserve snowshoe fastenings zero pounds fifteen point one ounce point four three kilos lantern for changing plates etc one pound one point two ounces point four nine kilos artificial glass horizon zero pounds ten point two ounces point two nine kilos bag with cords and nautical almanac zero pounds four point six ounces point one three kilos pocket sextant zero pounds thirteen point seven ounces point three nine kilos two packets of matches zero pounds thirteen point seven ounces point three nine kilos one reserve sheet of german silver for repaving plates under sled runners zero pounds seven point four ounces point two one kilos pitch zero pounds three point five ounces point one kilos two minimum thermometers in cases zero pounds seven point four ounces point two one kilos three quicksilver thermometers in cases zero pounds four point nine ounces point one four kilos one compass zero pounds eight point eight ounces point two five kilos one aluminum compass zero pounds eight point four ounces point two four kilos one aluminum telescope eleven pounds eight point six ounces point seven kilos senegrass or sedge for fin shoes zero pounds seven ounces point two kilos bag with cartridges twenty six pounds one ounce eleven point eight five kilos leather pouch with reserve shooting requisites parts for gun locks reserve cocks balls powder etc three pounds one ounce one point four kilos leather pouch with glass bottle one spoon and five pencils zero pounds ten point six ounces point three kilos bag with navigation tables nautical almanac cards etc two pounds seven ounces one point one kilos tin box with diaries letters photographs observation journals etc three pounds ten ounces one point six five kilos one cap for covering hole in deck of kayak zero pounds eight ounces point two three kilos one sack of meat chocolate seventeen pounds ten ounces eight kilos one bag of soups six pounds ten ounces three kilos one bag of cocoa seven pounds six ounces three point three five kilos one bag of fish flour three pounds twelve ounces one point seven kilos one bag of wheat flour two pounds zero ounces point nine kilos one bag of chocolate four pounds six ounces two kilos one bag of oatmeal four pounds six ounces two kilos one bag of real food four pounds six ounces two kilos as grips under the sledge were one sack of oatmeal twenty nine pounds one ounce thirteen point two kilos one sack of pemmican one hundred fifteen pounds one ounce fifty two point three kilos one sack of liver pate one hundred eleven pounds twelve ounces fifty point eight kilos a list of our dogs and their weights on starting may be of interest kvik seventy eight pounds thirty five point seven kilos freya fifty pounds twenty two point seven kilos barbara forty nine and a half pounds twenty two point five kilos suggen sixty one and a half pounds twenty eight kilos flint fifty nine and a half pounds twenty seven kilos barabbas sixty one and a half pounds twenty eight kilos Gulen sixty and a half pounds twenty seven point five kilos Haran sixty one and a half pounds twenty eight kilos Barnet thirty nine pounds seventeen point seven kilos Sultan sixty eight pounds thirty one kilos Clapperslangen fifty nine and a half pounds twenty seven kilos Block fifty nine pounds twenty six point eight kilos Bjelke, thirty eight pounds, seventeen point three kilos. Shuliga, forty pounds, eighteen kilos. Kata, forty five and a half pounds, twenty point seven ounces. Narifas, forty six pounds, twenty one kilos. Livyagarin, thirty eight and a half pounds, seventeen point five kilos. Potiphar, fifty seven pounds, twenty six kilos. 
Storaven, 70 pounds, 31.8 kilos. Ispian, 61.5 pounds, 28 kilos. Lilleraven, 59 pounds, 26.7 kilos. Quindfoka, 37 pounds, 26 kilos. Perpetuum, 63 pounds, 28.6 kilos. Barrow, 60.5 pounds, 27.5 kilos. Rusen, 58 pounds, 26.5 kilos. Kaifas, 69 pounds, 31.5 kilos. Ulenka, 57 pounds, 26 kilos. Pan, 65 pounds, 29.5 kilos. End of file 5. File 6 of Farthest North, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Friedrich Nansen, Volume 2, Chapter 4. We say goodbye to the Fram. At last, by midday on March 14th, we finally left the Fram to the noise of a thundering salute. For the third time, farewells and mutual good wishes were exchanged. Some of our comrades came a little way with us, but Sverdrup soon turned back in order to be on board for dinner at one o'clock. It was on the top of a hummock that we two said good-bye to each other. The Fram was lying behind us, and I can remember how I stood watching him as he strode easily homeward on his snowshoes. I half wished I could turn back with him and find myself again in the warm saloon. I knew only too well that a life of toil lay before us, and that it would be many a long day before we should again sleep and eat under a comfortable roof. But that that time was going to be so long as it really proved to be, none of us then had any idea. We all thought that either the expedition would succeed, and that we should return home that same year, or that it would not succeed. A little while after Sverdrup had left us, Mogstad also found it necessary to turn back. He had thought of going with us till the next day, but his heavy wool-skin trousers were, as he un-euphemistically expressed it, almost full of sweat, and he must go back to the fire on board to get dry. Hansen, Henriksen, and Pedersen were then the only ones left, and they labored along, each with his load on his back. It was difficult for them to keep up with us on the flat ice, so quickly did we go. But when we came to pressure ridges we were brought to a standstill, and the sledges had to be helped over. At one place the ridge was so bad that we had to carry the sledges a long way. When, after considerable trouble, we had managed to get over it, Peter shook his head reflectively and said to Johansen that we should meet plenty more of the same kind and have enough hard work before we had eaten sufficient of the loads to make the sledges run lightly. Just here we came upon a long stretch of bad ice, and Peter became more and more concerned for our future, but towards evening matters improved, and we advanced more rapidly. When we stopped at six o'clock, the odometer registered a good seven miles, which was not so bad for a first day's work. We had a cheerful evening in our tent, which was just about big enough to hold all five. Pedersen, who had exerted himself and become overheated on the way, shivered and groaned while the dogs were being tied up and fed and the tent pitched. He, however, found existence considerably brighter when he sat inside it in his warm wolf-skin clothes with a pot of smoking chocolate before him, a big lump of butter in one hand and a biscuit in the other, and exclaimed, Now I am living like a prince. He therefore discoursed at length on the exalting thought that he was sitting in a tent in the middle of the polar sea. Poor fellow, he had begged and prayed to be allowed to come with us on this expedition. He would cook for us and make himself generally useful, both as a tinsmith and blacksmith, and then, he said, three would be company. I regretted that I could not take more than one companion, and he had been in the depths of woe for several days, but now found comfort in the fact that he had, at any rate, come part of the way with us, and was out on this great desert sea, for, as he said, not many people have done that. The others had no sleeping bag with them, so they made themselves a cozy little hut of snow, into which they crawled in their wolf-skin garments, and had a tolerably good night. 
i was awake early the next morning but when i crept out of the tent i found that somebody else was on his legs before me and this was pettersen who awakened by the cold was now walking up and down to warm his stiffened limbs he had tried it now he said he never should have thought it possible to sleep in the snow but it had not been half bad he would not quite admit that he had been cold and that that was the reason why he had turned out so early then we had our last pleasant breakfast together got the sledges ready harnessed the dogs shook hands with our companions and without many words being uttered on either side started out into solitude peter shook his head sorrowfully as we went off i turned round when we had gone some little way and saw his figure on the top of the hummock he was still looking after us his thoughts were probably sad perhaps he believed that he had spoken to us for the last time we found large expanses of flat ice and covered the ground quickly farther and farther away from our comrades into the unknown where we two alone and the dogs were to wander for months the fram's rigging had disappeared long ago behind the margin of the ice we often came on piled up ridges and uneven ice where the sledges had to be helped and sometimes carried over it often happened too that they capsized altogether and it was only by dint of strenuous hauling that we righted them again somewhat exhausted by all this hard work we stopped finally at six o'clock in the evening and had then gone about nine miles during the day they were not quite the marches i had reckoned on but we hoped that by degrees the sledges would become lighter and the ice better to travel over the latter too seems to have been the case at first on sunday march seventeenth i say in my diary the ice appears to be more even the farther north we get came across a lane however yesterday which necessitated a long detour at half past six we had done about nine miles as we had just reached a good camping ground and the dogs were tired we stopped lowest temperature last night minus forty five degrees fahrenheit minus forty two point eight degrees centigrade the ice continued to become more even during the following days and our marches often amounted to fourteen miles or more in the day now and then a misfortune might happen which detained us as for instance one day a sharp spike of ice which was standing up cut a hole in a sack of fish flour and all the delicious food ran out it took us more than an hour to collect it all again and repair the damages then the odometer got broken through being jammed in some uneven ice and it took some hours to mend it by a process of lashing but on we went northward often over great wide ice plains which seemed as if they must stretch right to the pole sometimes it happened that we passed through places where the ice was unusually massive with high hummocks so that it looked like undulating country covered with snow this was undoubtedly very old ice which had drifted in the polar sea for a long time on its way from the siberian sea to the east coast of greenland and which had been subjected year after year to severe pressure high hummocks and mounds are thus formed which summer after summer are partially melted by the rays of the sun and again in the winters covered with great drifts of snow so that they assume forms which resemble ice hills rather than piles of sea ice resulting from upheaval wednesday march twentieth my diary says beautiful weather for traveling in with fine sunsets but somewhat cold particularly in the bag at nights it was minus forty one point eight degrees and minus forty three point six degrees fahrenheit or minus forty one degrees and minus forty two degrees centigrade the ice appears to be getting more even the farther we advance and in some places it is like traveling over inland ice if this goes on the whole thing will be done in no time that day we lost our odometer and as we did not find it out till some time afterwards and i did not know how far we might have to go back i thought it was not worth while to return and look for it was the cause however of our only being able subsequently to guess approximately at the distance we had gone during the day we had another mishap too that day this was that one of the dogs it was Liv Jagerin, had become so ill that he could not be driven any longer and we had to let him go loose it was late in the day before we discovered that he was not with us 
he had stopped behind at our camping ground when we broke up in the morning and i had to go back after him on snowshoes which caused a long delay thursday march twenty first nine in the morning minus forty three point six degrees fahrenheit or minus forty two degrees centigrade minimum in the night minus forty seven point two degrees fahrenheit or minus forty four degrees centigrade clear as it has been every day beautiful bright weather glorious for traveling in but somewhat cold at nights with the quicksilver continually frozen patching fin shoes in this temperature inside the tent with one's nose slowly freezing away is not all pure enjoyment friday march twenty second splendid ice for getting over things go better and better wide expanses with a few pressure ridges now and then but passable everywhere kept at it yesterday from about half past eleven in the morning to half past eight at night did a good twenty one miles i hope we should be in latitude eighty five degrees the only disagreeable thing about it now is the cold our clothes are transformed more and more into a cuirass of ice during the day and wet bandages at night the blankets likewise the sleeping bag gets heavier and heavier from the moisture which freezes on the hair inside the same clear settled weather every day we are both longing now for a change a few clouds and a little more mildness would be welcome the temperature in the night minus forty four point eight degrees fahrenheit minus forty two point seven degrees centigrade by an observation which i took later in the forenoon our latitude that day proved to be eighty five degrees nine minutes north saturday march twenty third on account of observation lashing the loads on the sledges patching bags and other occupations of a like kind which are no joke in this low temperature we did not manage to get off yesterday before three o'clock in the afternoon we stuck to it till nine in the evening when we stopped in some of the worst ice we have seen lately our day's march however had lain across several large tracts of level ice so i think that we made fourteen miles or so all the same we have the same brilliant sunshine but yesterday afternoon the wind from the northeast which we have had for the last few days increased and made it rather raw we passed over a large frozen pool yesterday evening it looked almost like a large lake it could not have been long since this was formed as the ice on it was still quite thin it is wonderful that these pools can form up there at that time of the year from this time forward there was an end of the flat ice which it had been simple enjoyment to travel over and now we had often great difficulties to cope with on sunday march twenty fourth i write ice not so good yesterday was a hard day but we made a few miles not more though than seven i am afraid this continual lifting of the heavily loaded sledges is calculated to break one's back but better times are coming perhaps the cold is also appreciable always the same but yesterday it was increased by the admixture of considerable wind from the northeast we halted about half past nine in the evening it is perceptible how the days lengthen and how much later the sun sets in a few days time we shall have the midnight sun we killed lee Yagarin yesterday evening and hard work it was skinning him this was the first dog which had to be killed but many came afterwards and it was some of the most disagreeable work we had on the journey particularly now at the beginning when it was so cold when this first dog was dismembered and given to the others many of them went supperless the whole night in preference to touching the meat but as the days went by and they became more worn out they learned to appreciate dog's flesh and later we were not even so considerate as to skin the butchered animal but served it hair and all the following day the ice was occasionally somewhat better but as a rule it was bad and we became more and more worn out with the never-ending work of helping the dogs riding the sledges every time they capsized and hauling them or carrying them bodily over hummocks and inequalities of the ground sometimes we were so sleepy in the evenings that our eyes shut and we fell asleep as we went along my head would drop and i would be awakened by suddenly falling forward on my snowshoes then we would stop after having found a camping ground behind a hummock or ridge of ice where there was some shelter from the wind 
while johansen looked after the dogs it generally fell to my lot to pitch the tent fill the cooker with ice light the burner and start the supper as quickly as possible this generally consisted of lobscouse one day made of pemmican and dried potatoes another day of a sort of fish rissole substance known as fiskegratten in norway and in this case composed of fish meal flour and butter a third day it would be pea bean or lentil soup with bread and pemmican johansen preferred the lobscouse while i had a weakness for the fiskegratten as time went by however he came over to my way of thinking and the fiskegratten took precedence of everything else as soon as johansen had finished with the dogs and the different receptacles containing the ingredients and eatables for breakfast and supper had been brought in as well as our bags with private necessities the sleeping bags were spread out the tent door carefully shut and we crept into the bag to thaw our clothes this was not very agreeable work during the course of the day the damp exhalations of the body had little by little become condensed in our outer garments which were now a mass of ice and transformed into complete suits of ice armor they were so hard and stiff that if we had only been able to get them off they could have stood by themselves and they crackled audibly every time we moved these clothes were so stiff that the arm of my coat actually rubbed deep sores in my wrists during our marches one of these sores the one on the right hand got frost-bitten the wound grew deeper and deeper and nearly reached the bone i tried to protect it with bandages but not until late in the summer did it heal and i shall probably have the scar for life when we got into our sleeping bags in the evening our clothes began to thaw slowly and on this process a considerable amount of physical heat was expended we packed ourselves tight into the bag and lay with our teeth chattering for an hour or an hour and a half before we became aware of a little of the warmth in our bodies which we so sorely needed at last our clothes became wet and pliant only to freeze again a few minutes after we had turned out of the bag in the morning there was no question of getting these clothes dried on the journey so long as the cold lasted as more and more moisture from the body collected in them how cold we were as we lay there shivering in the bag waiting for the supper to be ready i who was cook was obliged to keep myself more or less awake to see to the culinary operations and sometimes i succeeded at last the supper was ready was portioned out and as always tasted delicious these occasions were the supreme moments of our existence moments to which we looked forward the whole day long but sometimes we were so weary that our eyes closed and we fell asleep with the food on its way to our mouths our hands would fall back inanimate with the spoons in them and the food fly out on the bag after supper we generally permitted ourselves the luxury of a little extra drink consisting of water as hot as we could swallow it in which whey powder had been dissolved it tasted something like boiled milk and we thought it wonderfully comforting it seemed to warm us to the very ends of our toes then we would creep down into the bag again buckle the flap carefully over our heads lie close together and soon sleep the sleep of the just but even in our dreams we went on ceaselessly grinding at the sledges and driving the dogs always northward and i was often awakened by hearing johansen calling in his sleep to pan or barabbas or klapperslangen get on you devil you go on you brutes sauce sauce now the whole thing is going over and execrations less fit for reproduction until i went to sleep again in the morning i as cook was obliged to turn out to prepare the breakfast which took an hour's time as a rule it consisted one morning of chocolate bread butter and pemmican another of oatmeal porridge or a compound of flour water and butter in imitation of our butter porridge at home this was washed down with milk made of whey powder and water the breakfast ready johansen was roused we sat up in the sleeping bag one of the blankets was spread out as a tablecloth and we fell to work we had a comfortable breakfast wrote up our diaries and then had to think about starting but how tired we sometimes were and how often i would not have given anything to be able to creep to the bottom of the bag again and sleep the clock round it seemed to me as if this must be the greatest pleasure in life 
but our business was to fight our way northward, always northward. We performed our toilets, and then came the going out into the cold to get the sledges ready, disentangle the dog's traces, harness the animals, and get off as quickly as possible. I went first to find the way through the uneven ice, then came the sledge with my kayak. The dogs soon learned to follow, but at every unevenness of the ground they stopped and if one could not get them all to start again at the same time by a shout, and so pull the sledge over the difficulty, one had to go back to beat or help them according as circumstances necessitated. Then came Johansen with the two other sledges, always shouting to the dogs to pull harder, always beating them, and himself hauling to get the sledges over the terrible ridges of ice. It was undeniable cruelty to the poor animals from first to last, and one must often look back on it with horror. It makes me shudder even now when I think of how we beat them mercilessly, with thick ash sticks when, hardly able to move, they stopped from sheer exhaustion. It made one's heart bleed to see them, but we turned our eyes away and hardened ourselves. It was necessary. Forward we must go, and to this end everything else must give place. It is the sad part of expeditions of this kind that one systematically kills all better feelings until only hard-hearted egoism remains. When I think of all those splendid animals, toiling for us without a murmur, as long as they could strain a muscle, never getting any thanks or even so much as a kind word, daily writhing under the lash until the time came when they could do no more and death freed them from their pangs. When I think of how they were left behind, one by one, up there on those desolate ice fields, which had been witness to their faithfulness and devotion, I have moments of bitter self-reproach. It took us two alone such a long time to pitch the tent, feed the dogs, cook, etc., in the evening, and then break up again and get ready in the morning, that the days never seemed long enough if we were to do proper day's marches, and besides, get the sleep we required at night. But when the nights became so light, it was not so necessary to keep regular hours any longer, and we started when we pleased, whether it was night or day. We stopped, too, when it suited us, and took the sleep which might be necessary for ourselves and the dogs. I tried to make it a rule that our marches were to be of nine or ten hours' duration. In the middle of the day we generally had a rest and something to eat, as a rule, bread and butter, with a little pemmican or liver pâté. These dinners were a bitter trial. We used to try and find a good sheltered place, and sometimes even rolled ourselves up in our blankets, but all the same the wind cut right through us as we sat on the sledges eating our meal. Sometimes again we spread the sleeping bag out on the ice, took our food with us, and crept well in, but even then did not succeed in thawing either it or our clothes. When this was too much for us, we walked up and down to keep ourselves warm, and ate our food as we walked. Then came the no less bitter task of disentangling the dog's traces, and we were glad when we could get off again. In the afternoon, as a rule, we each had a piece of meat chocolate. Most Arctic travelers who have gone sledge journeys have complained of the so-called Arctic thirst, and it has been considered an almost unavoidable evil in connection with a long journey across wastes of snow. It is often increased, too, by the eating of snow. I had prepared myself for this thirst, from which we had also suffered severely when crossing Greenland, and had taken with me a couple of India rubber flasks, which we filled with water every morning from the cooker, and which by carrying in the breast could be protected from the cold. To my great astonishment, however, I soon discovered that the whole day would often pass by without my as much as tasting the water in my flask. As time went by, the less need did I feel to drink during the day, and at last I gave up taking water with me altogether. If a passing feeling of thirst made itself felt, a piece of fresh ice, of which as a rule there was always some to be found, was sufficient to dispel it. The reason why we were spared this suffering, which has been one of the greatest hardships of many sledge expeditions, must be attributed in a great measure to our admirable cooking apparatus. By the help of this we were able, with the consumption of a minimum of fuel, to melt and boil so much water every morning that we could drink all we wished. 
there was even some left over as a rule which had to be thrown away the same thing was generally the case in the evening friday march twenty ninth we are grinding on but very slowly the ice is only tolerable and not what i expected from the beginning there are often great ridges of piled up ice of dismal aspect which take up a great deal of time as one must go on ahead to find a way and as a rule make a greater or less detour to get over them in addition the dogs are growing rather slow and slack and it is almost impossible to get them on and then this endless disentangling of the hauling ropes with their infernal twists and knots which get worse and worse to undo the dogs jump over and in between one another incessantly and no sooner has one carefully cleared the hauling ropes than they are twisted into a veritable skein again then one of the sledges is stopped by a block of ice the dogs howl impatiently to follow their companions in front then one bites through a trace and starts off on his own account perhaps followed by one or two others and these must be caught and the traces knotted there is no time to splice them properly nor would it be a very congenial task in this cold so we go on when the ice is uneven and every hour and a half at least have to stop and disentangle the traces we started yesterday about half past eight in the morning and stopped about five in the afternoon after dinner the northeasterly wind which we have had the whole time suddenly became stronger and the sky overcast we welcomed it with joy for we saw in it the sign of a probable change of weather and an end to this perpetual cold and brightness i do not think we deceived ourselves either yesterday evening the temperature had risen to minus twenty nine point two degrees fahrenheit minus thirty four degrees centigrade and we had the best night in the bag we have had for a long time just now as i am getting the breakfast ready i see that it is clear again and the sun is shining through the tent wall the ice we are now traveling over seems on the whole to be old but sometimes we come across tracts of considerable width of uneven new ice which must have been pressed up a considerable time i cannot account for it in any other way than by supposing it to be ice from great open pools which must have formed here at one time we have traversed pools of this description with level ice on them several times that day i took a meridian observation which however did not make us farther north than eighty five degrees thirty minutes i could not understand this thought that we must be in latitude eighty six degrees and therefore supposed there must be something wrong with the observation saturday march thirtieth yesterday was tycho brahe's day at first we found much uneven ice and had to strike a devious route to get through it so that our day's march did not amount to much although we kept at it a long time at the end of it however and after considerable toil we found ourselves on splendid flat ice more level than it had been for a long time at last then we had come on some more of the good old kind and could not complain of some rubble and snow drifts here and there but then we were stopped by some ugly pressure ridges of the worst kind formed by the packing of enormous blocks the last ridge was the worst of all and before it yawned a crack in the thick ice about twelve feet deep when the first sledge was going over all the dogs fell in and had to be hauled up again one of them clappers logan slipped his harness and ran away as the next sledge was going over it fell in bodily but happily was not smashed to atoms as it might have been we had to unload it entirely in order to get it up again and then reload all of which took up a great deal of time then too the dogs had to be thrown down and dragged up on the other side with the third sledge we managed better and after we had gone a little way farther the runaway dog came back at last we reached a camping ground pitched our tent and found that the thermometer showed minus forty five point four degrees fahrenheit minus forty three degrees centigrade disentangling dog traces in this temperature with one's bare frost-bitten almost skinless hands is desperate work but finally we were in our dear bag with the primus singing cosily when to crown our misfortunes i discovered that it would not burn i examined it everywhere but could find nothing wrong 
johansen had to turn out and go and fetch the tools and a reserve burner while i studied the cooker at last i discovered that some ice had got in under the lid and this had caused a leakage finally we got it to light and at five o'clock in the morning the pea soup was ready and very good it was at three in the afternoon i was up again cooking thank heaven it is warm and comfortable in the bag or this sort of life would be intolerable sunday march thirty first yesterday at last came the long wished for change of weather with southerly wind and rising temperature early this morning the thermometer showed minus twenty two degrees fahrenheit minus thirty degrees centigrade regular summer weather in fact it was therefore with lightened hearts that we set off over good ice and with the wind at our backs on we went at a very fair pace and everything was going well when a lane suddenly opened just in front of the first sledge we managed to get this over by the skin of our teeth but just as we were going to cross the lane again after the other sledges a large piece of ice broke under johansen and he fell in wetting both legs a deplorable incident while the lane was gradually opening more and more i went up and down it to find a way over but without success here we were with one man and a sledge on one side two sledges and a wet man on the other with an ever widening lane between the kayaks could not be launched as through the frequent capsizing of the sledges they had got holes in them and for the time being were useless this was a cheerful prospect for the night i on one side with the tent johansen probably frozen stiff on the other at last after a long detour i found a way over and the sledges were conveyed across it was out of the question however to attempt to go on as johansen's nether extremities were a mass of ice and his overalls so torn that extensive repairs were necessary End of file six. file seven of farthest north volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sharon riskadal farthest north by fritjof nansen volume two chapter five a hard struggle part one tuesday april third there are many different kinds of difficulty to overcome on this journey but the worst of all perhaps is getting all the trifles done and starting off in spite of my being up by seven o'clock on monday evening to do the cooking it was nearly two this morning before we got clear of our camping ground the load on johansen's sledge had to be relashed as the contents of one grip had been eaten up and we had to put a sack of bread in its place another grip had to be sewed together as it was dripping pemmican then the sledge from which the bread sack had been taken had to be lashed secure again and while we had the ropes undone it was just as well to get out a supply of potatoes during this operation we discovered that there was a hole in the fish flour sack which we tied up but no sooner had we done so than we found another large one which required sewing when we came to pack the potato sack this too had a hole in it which we tied up and so on then the dog's traces had to be disentangled the whole thing was in an inextricable muddle and the knots and twists in the icy frozen rope got worse and worse to deal with johansen made haste and patched his trousers before breakfast the south wind had become what on board the fram we should have called a mill breeze that is nineteen to twenty-three feet in the second and with this at our back we started off in driving snow everything went splendidly at first but then came one pressure ridge after another and each one was worse than the last we had a long halt for dinner at eight or nine in the morning after having chosen ourselves a sheltered place in the lee of a ridge we spread out the sleeping bag crept down into it with our food and so tired was i that i went to sleep with it in my hand i dreamed i was in norway and on a visit to some people i had only seen once in my life before it was christmas day and i was shown into a great empty room where we were intended to dine it was very cold in it and i shivered but there were already some hot dishes steaming on the table and a beautiful fat goose how unspeakably did i look forward to that goose 
then some other visitors began to arrive i could see them through the window and was just going out to meet them when i stumbled into deep snow how it all happened in the middle of the dining-room floor i know not the host laughed in an amused way and i woke up and found myself shivering in a sleeping-bag on the drift ice in the far north oh how miserable i felt we got up packed our things silently together and started off not until four o'clock that afternoon did we stop but everything was dull and cheerless and it was long before i got over my disappointment what would i not have given for that dinner or for one hour in the room cold as it was the ridges and the lanes which had frozen together again with rubble on either side became worse and worse making one's way through these new ridges is desperate work one cannot use snowshoes as there is too little snow between the piled up blocks of ice and one must wade along without them it is also impossible to see anything in this thick weather everything is white irregularities and holes and the spaces between the blocks are covered with a thin deceptive layer of snow which lets one crashing through into cracks and pitfalls so that one is lucky to get off without a broken leg it is necessary to go long distances on ahead in order to find a way sometimes one must search in one direction sometimes in another and then back again to fetch the sledges with the result that the same ground is gone over many times yesterday when we stopped i really was done the worst of it all though was that when we finally came to a standstill we had been on the move so long that it was too late to wind up our watches johansen's had stopped altogether mine was ticking and happily still going when i wound it up so i hope that it is all right twelve midday minus twenty four point six degrees fahrenheit minus thirty one point five degrees centigrade clear weather southeasterly wind thirteen feet in the second the ice seems to be getting worse and worse and i am beginning to have doubts as to the wisdom of keeping northward too long wednesday april third got under way yesterday about three in the afternoon the snow was in first-rate condition after the southeast wind which continued blowing till late in the day the ice was tolerably passable and everything looked more promising the weather was fine and we made good progress but after several level tracks with old humpy ice came some very uneven ones intersected by lanes and pressure ridges as usual matters did not grow any better as time went on and at midnight or soon after we were stopped by some bad ice and a newly frozen lane which would not bear as we should have had to make a long detour we encamped and rusen was killed this was the second dog to go the meat was divided into twenty-six portions but eight dogs refused it and had to be given pemmican the ice ahead does not look inviting these ridges are enough to make one despair and there seems to be no prospect of things bettering i turned out at midday and took a meridian observation which makes us in eighty five degrees fifty nine minutes north it is astonishing that we have not got farther we seem to toil all we can but without much progress beginning to doubt seriously of the advisability of continuing northward much longer it is three times as far to franz joseph land as the distance we have now come how may the ice be in that direction we can hardly count on its being better than here or our progress quicker then too the shape and extent of franz joseph land are unknown and may cause us considerable delay and perhaps we shall not be able to find any game just at once i have long seen that it is impossible to reach the pole itself or its immediate vicinity over such ice as this and with these dogs if only we had more of them what would i not give now to have the olenek dogs we must turn sooner or later but as it is only a question of time could we not turn it to a better account in franz joseph land than by travelling over this drift ice which we have now had a good opportunity of learning to know in all probability it will be exactly the same right to the pole we cannot hope to reach any considerable distance higher before time compels us to turn we certainly ought not to wait much longer twelve midday minus twenty point eight degrees fahrenheit minus twenty nine point four degrees centigrade
clear weather, three feet wind from east, 12 midnight, minus 29.2 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 34 degrees centigrade, clear and still. It became more and more of a riddle to me that we did not make greater progress northward. I kept on calculating and adding up our marches as we went along, but always with the same result. That is to say, provided only the ice were still, we must be far above the 86th parallel. It was becoming only too clear to me, however, that the ice was moving southward, and that in its capricious drift, at the mercy of wind and current, we had our worst enemy to combat. Friday, April 5th began our march at three yesterday morning the ice however was bad with lanes and ridges so that our progress was but little these lanes with rubble thrown up on each side are our despair it is like driving over a tract of rocks and delays us terribly first i must go on ahead to find a way and then get my sledge through then perhaps by way of a change one falls into the water yesterday i fell through twice if I work hard in finding a way and guiding my sledge over rough places, Johansen is no better off with his two sledges to look after. It is a tough job to get even one of them over the rubble to say nothing of the ridges, but he is a plucky fellow and no mistake and never gives in. Yesterday he fell into the water again in crossing a lane and got wet up to his knees. I had gone over on my snowshoes shortly before and did not notice that the ice was weak. He came afterwards without snowshoes, walking beside one of the sledges, when suddenly the ice gave and he fell through. Happily he managed to catch hold of the sledge, and the dogs, which did not stop, pulled him up again. These baths are not an unmixed pleasure, now that there is no possibility of drying or changing one's clothes, and one must wear a chain mail of ice until they thaw and dry on the body, which takes some time in this temperature. I took an observation for longitude and a magnetic observation yesterday morning, and have spent the whole forenoon today in calculations, inside the bag, to find out our exact position. I find our latitude yesterday was 86 degrees, 2.8 minutes north. This is very little, but what can we do when the ice is what it is? And these dogs cannot work harder than they do, poor things. I sigh for the sledge dogs from the Olenek daily now. The longitude for yesterday was 98 degrees, 47.15 minutes. Variation, 44.4 degrees. I begin to think more and more that we ought to turn back before the time we originally fixed. It is probably 350 miles or so to Petermann's land. In point of fact, it was about 450 miles to Cape Fligley but it will probably take us all we know to get over them. The question resolves itself into this. Ought we not, at any rate, to reach 87 degrees north? But I doubt whether we can manage it if the ice does not improve. Saturday, April 6th, 2 a.m., minus 11.4 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 24.2 degrees centigrade. The ice grew worse and worse. Yesterday it brought me to the verge of despair, and when we stopped this morning I had almost decided to turn back. I will go on one day longer, however, to see if the ice is really as bad far northward as it appears to be from the ridge, thirty feet in height, where we are encamped. We hardly made four miles yesterday. Lanes, ridges, and endless rough ice, it looks like an endless moraine of ice blocks and this continual lifting of the sledges over every irregularity is enough to tire out giants. Curious, this rubble ice. For the most part, it is not so very massive, and seems as if it had been forced up somewhat recently, for it is incompletely covered with thin loose snow, through which one falls suddenly up to one's middle, and thus it extends mile after mile northward, while every now and then there are old flows with mounds that have been rounded off by the action of the sun in the summer, often very massive ice. I am rapidly coming to the conclusion that we are not doing any good here. We shall not be able to get much farther north, and it will be slow work indeed if there be much more of this sort of ice towards Franz Josef Land. 
on the other hand we should be able to make much better use of our time there if we should have any over eight thirty p m minus twenty nine point two degrees fahrenheit minus thirty four degrees centigrade monday april eighth no the ice grew worse and worse and we got no way ridge after ridge and nothing but rubble to travel over we made a start to two o'clock or so this morning and kept at it as long as we could lifting the sledges all the time but it grew too bad at last i went on a good way ahead on snowshoes but saw no reasonable prospect of advance and from the highest hummocks only the same kind of ice was to be seen it was a veritable chaos of ice blocks stretching as far as the horizon there is not much sense in keeping on longer we are sacrificing valuable time and doing little if there be much more such ice between here and franz joseph land we shall indeed want all the time we have i therefore determined to stop and shape our course for cape fligley on this northernmost camping ground we indulged in a banquet consisting of lobscow bread and butter dry chocolate stewed tittlebar or red whortleberries and our hot whey drink and then with a delightful and unfamiliar feeling of repletion crept into the dear bag our best friend i took a meridian observation yesterday by which i see that we should be in latitude eighty six degrees ten minutes north or thereabouts this morning i took an observation for longitude at eight thirty a m minus twenty five point six degrees fahrenheit minus thirty two degrees centigrade tuesday april ninth yesterday's was our first march homeward we expected the same impracticable ice but to our amazement had not gone far before we came on tolerably good ground which improved steadily and with only a few stoppages we kept at it till this morning we came upon ridges to be sure but they always allowed themselves to be negotiated pretty easily and we did well started yesterday about two in the afternoon and kept going until one this morning thursday april eleventh better and better found nothing but beautiful level tracts of ice yesterday with a few ridges which were easy to get over and some lanes with young ice on which gave us rather more trouble they ran however about in our direction our course is now the magnetic south twenty two degrees west or about the true west-southwest, and we could go alongside them. At last, however, we had to make a crossing, and accomplished it successfully, although the ice bent under us and our sledges more than was desirable. Late in the afternoon we came across a channel, which we proposed to cross in the same way. We reached the other side with the first sledge safely enough, but not so with the other hardly had the leaders of the team got out to the dangerous place where the ice was thinnest and where some water had come up on to it when they stopped and warily dipped their paws in the water then through went one of them splashing and struggling to get out the ice began to sink under the weight of the other dogs and the sledge and the water came flowing up i dragged dogs and sledge back as quickly as possible and succeeded in driving them all on to the firm ice again in safety we tried once again at another place i running over first on snowshoes and calling to the dogs and johansen pushing behind but the result was no better than the first time as suggen fell in and we had to go back only after a long detour and very much fagged did we finally succeed in getting the last two sledges over we were lucky in finding a good camping place and had the warmest night and the most comfortable i might almost say cosy morning spent be it said in repairs that we have had on the trip i think we did the longest day's march yesterday that we have yet achieved about fifteen miles two in the afternoon minus seventeen point six degrees fahrenheit minus twenty seven point six degrees centigrade saturday april thirteenth we have traversed nothing but good ice for three days if this goes on the return journey will be quicker than i thought i do not understand this sudden change in the nature of the ice can it be that we are travelling in the same direction with the trend of the ridges and irregularities so that now we go along between them instead of having to make our way over them the lanes we have come across seem all to point to this 
they follow our course pretty closely we had the misfortune yesterday to let our watches run down the time between our getting into the bag on the previous night and encamping yesterday was too long of course we wound them up again but the only thing i can now do to find greenwich mean time is take a time observation and an observation for latitude and then estimate the approximate distance from our turning point on april eighth when i took the last observation for longitude by this means the error will hardly be great i conclude that we have not gone less than fourteen miles a day on an average the last three days and have consequently advanced forty or more miles in a direction south twenty two degrees west magnetic when we stopped here yesterday barbara was killed these slaughterings are not very pleasant episodes clear weather at six thirty this morning minus twenty two degrees fahrenheit minus thirty degrees centigrade wind south six to nine feet april fourteenth easter day we were unfortunate with lanes yesterday and they forced us considerably out of our course we were stopped at last by a particularly awkward one and after i had gone alongside it to find a crossing for some distance without success i thought we had better in the circumstances pitch our tent and have a festive easter eve in addition i wished to reckon out our latitude longitude our observation for time and our variation it was a question of getting the right time again as quickly as possible the tent up and johansen attending to the dogs i crept into the bag but lying thawing in this frozen receptacle with frozen clothes and shoes and simultaneously working out an observation and looking up logarithms with tender frost-bitten fingers is not pleasurable even if the temperature be only minus twenty two degrees fahrenheit it is slow work and easter day has had to be devoted to the rest of the calculation so that we shall not get off before this evening meanwhile we had a festive easter eve and regaled ourselves with the following delicacies hot whey and water fish au gratin stewed red whortleberries and lime juice grog that is lime juice tablets and a little sugar dissolved in hot water simply a splendid dinner and having feasted our fill we at last at two o'clock crept in under the cover i have calculated our previous latitudes and longitudes over again to see if i can discover any mistake in them i find that we should yesterday have come farther south than eighty six degrees five point three minutes north but according to our reckoning assuming that we covered fifty miles during the three days we should have come down to eighty five degrees and fifty odd minutes i cannot explain it in any other manner than by the surmise that we have been drifting rapidly northward which is very good for the fram but less so for us the wind has been southerly the last few days i assume that we are now in longitude eighty six degrees east and have reckoned the present reading of our watches accordingly the variation here i find to be forty two point five degrees yesterday we steered south ten degrees west magnetic to-day i will keep south five degrees west and to-morrow due south by way of a change to-day the sky has been overcast but this evening when we partook of our second breakfast the sun was shining cheerily in through the tent wall johansen has patched clothes to-day while i have made calculations and pricked out the courses so mild and balmy it has not been before 10 p.m. minus 14 degrees Fahrenheit minus 25.6 degrees centigrade. Tuesday, April 16th. As we were about to start off at one o'clock yesterday morning, Barrow sneaked away before we could harness him. He had seen a couple of the other dogs being put to and knew what was coming. As I did not wish to lose the dog, he was the best I had in my team, this caused some delay. I called and called and went peering round the hummocks in search of him, but saw nothing, only the ice pack, ridge upon ridge, disappearing towards the horizon, and farthest north the midnight sun shining over all. The world of ice was dreaming in the bright, cool morning light. We had to leave without the dog, but to my great delight I soon caught sight of him far behind us in our wake. I thought I had seen his good face for the last time. He was evidently ashamed of himself, and came and stood quite still, looking up at me imploringly when I took him and harnessed him. 
I had meant to whip the dog, but his eyes disarmed me. We found good passable ice, if not always quite flat, and made satisfactory progress. Some ridges, however, forced us west of our course. Later on in the morning I discovered that I had left my compass behind at some place or other, where I had had it out to take our bearings. It could not be dispensed with, so I had to return and look for it. I found it, too, but it was a hard pull-back, and on the way I was inconvenienced for the first time by the heat. The sun scorched quite unpleasantly. When I at last got back to the sledges I felt rather slack. Johansen was sitting on the kayak fast asleep, basking in the sun. Then on again, but the light and warmth made us drowsy and slack, and try as we would, we seemed to lag. So at ten in the forenoon we decided to camp, and I was not a little surprised, when I took the meteorological observation, to find that the swing thermometer showed minus 15.2 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 26.2 degrees centigrade. The tent was accordingly pitched in the broiling sun, and nice and warm it soon was inside. We had a comfortable Easter dinner, which did service for both Easter Day and Easter Monday. I reckon the distances we covered on Easter Eve and yesterday at about 15 miles, and we should thus be altogether 60 miles on our way home. Wednesday, April 17th, minus 18.4 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 28 degrees centigrade. Yesterday, without doubt, we did our longest day's march. We began at half-past seven in the morning and ended at about nine at night, with a couple of hours' rest in the bag at dinner-time. The ice was what I should previously have called anything but good. It was throughout extremely uneven with pressed-up, rather new ice, and older, rounded-off ridges. There were ridges here and there, but progress was possible everywhere, and by lanes, happily, we were not hindered. The snow was rather loose between all the irregularities of the ice, but the dogs hauled alone everywhere, and there is no cause to complain of them. The ice we are now stopping in seems to me to be something like that we had around the Fram. We have about got down to the region where she is drifting. I am certain we did twenty miles yesterday, and the distance homeward should now be altogether three hundred sixty-eight miles. The weather is glorious nowadays, not so cold as to inconvenience one, and continual clear sunshine without any wind to signify. There is remarkable equableness and stagnancy in the atmosphere up here, I think. We have traveled over this ice for upward of a month now, and not once have we been stopped on account of bad weather the same bright sunshine the whole time, with the exception of a couple of days, and even then the sun came out. Existence becomes more and more enjoyable. The cold is gone, and we are pressing forward towards land and summer. It is no trial now to turn out in the mornings with a good day's march before one, and cook and lie snug and warm in the bag, and dream of the happy future when we get home. Home? have been engaged on an extensive sartorial undertaking today. My trousers were getting the worse for wear. It seems quite mild now to sit and sew in minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit in comparison with minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Then certainly it was not enjoyable to ply one's needle. Friday, April 19th. We now have provender for the dogs for two or three days more, but I think of saving it a little longer and having the worst dogs eaten first. Yesterday, Perpetuum was killed. This killing of the animals, especially the actual slaughtering, is a horrible affair. We have hitherto stuck them with a knife, but it was not very satisfactory. Yesterday, however, we determined to try a new method, strangulation. According to our usual custom, we led the dog away behind a hummock so that the others should not know what was going on. Then we put a rope round the animal's neck, and each pulled with all his might, but without effect, and at last we could do no more. Our hands were losing all sense of feeling in the cold, and there was nothing for it but to use the knife. Oh, it was horrible! Naturally, to shoot them would be the most convenient and merciful way, but we are loath to expend our precious ammunition on them. The time may come when we shall need it sorely." The observations yesterday show that we have got down to 85 degrees, 37.8 minutes north, 
and the longitude should be seventy nine degrees twenty six minutes east this tallies well with our reckoning we have gone fifty miles or so since the last observation april thirteenth just what i had assumed beforehand still the same brilliant sunshine day and night yesterday the wind from the north freshened and is still blowing to-day but does not trouble us much as it is behind us the temperature which now keeps from about four degrees to twenty two degrees below zero fahrenheit can only be described as agreeable this is undoubtedly fortunate for us if it were warmer the lanes would keep open a longer time my greatest desire now is to get under land before the lanes become too bad what we shall do then must be decided by circumstances sunday april twenty first at four o'clock yesterday we got under way during the night we stopped to have something to eat these halts for dinner when we take our food and crawl well down to the bottom of the bag where it is warm and comfortable are unusually cozy after a good nap we set off again but were soon stopped by the ugliest lane we have yet come across i set off along it to find a passage but only found myself going through bad rubble the lane was everywhere equally broad and uncompromising equally full of aggregated blocks and brash testifying clearly to the manner in which during a long period the ice here has been in motion and been crushed and disintegrated by continual pressure this was apparent too in numerous new ridges of rubble and hummocky ice and the cracks running in all directions i finally found a crossing but when after a long circuit i had conveyed the caravan there it had changed in the interval and i did not think it advisable to make the attempt but though i went farther than far as we say i only found the same abominable lane full of lumps of ice grinning at one and high pressure ridges on each side things were becoming worse and worse in several cases these lumps of ice were i noticed intermixed with earthy matter in one place the whole flow from which blocks had been pressed up into a ridge was entirely dark brown in color but whether this was from mud or from organic matter i did not get near enough to determine the ridges were fairly high in some places and reached a height of twenty-five feet or so i had a good opportunity here of observing how they assume forms like ice mountains with high straight sides caused by the splitting of old ridges transversely in several directions i have often on this journey seen massive high hummocks with similar square sides and of great circumference sometimes quite resembling snow-covered islands they are of paleocrystic ice as good as any one can wish i was constrained at last to return with my mission unaccomplished nearly the most annoying thing about it was that on the other side of the lane i could see fine flat ice stretching southward and now to be obliged to camp here and wait i had however already possessed my soul in patience when on coming back to our original stopping place i found a tolerably good crossing close by it we eventually got to the other side with the ice grinding under our feet the while and by that time it was six o'clock in the morning we kept at it a little while longer over beautiful flat ice but the dogs were tired and it was nearly forty-eight hours since they had been fed as we were hastening along we suddenly came across an immense piece of timber sticking up obliquely from the surface of the ice it was siberian larch as far as i could make out and probably raised in this manner through pressure long ago many a good meal could we have cooked with it had we been able to drag it with us but it was too heavy we marked it f n h j eighty five degrees thirty minutes north and went on our way plains of ice still before us i am looking forward to getting under way gliding over this flat surface on one's snowshoes almost reaches the ideal land and home are nigher and as one goes along one's thoughts fly southward to everything that is beautiful six in the morning minus twenty two degrees fahrenheit minus thirty degrees centigrade monday april twenty second if we have made good progress the previous days yesterday simply outdid itself I think I may reckon our day's march at twenty-five miles, 
but for the sake of certainty lump the last two days together and put them down at forty miles the dogs though are beginning to get tired it is approaching the time for us to camp they are impatient for food and grown more and more greedy for fresh dog's flesh throw themselves on it like wolves as soon as a smoking piece with hair and all on is thrown to them kvik and barnett only still keep back as long as the flesh is warm but let it become frozen and they eat it voraciously twelve midnight minus twenty seven point eight degrees fahrenheit minus thirty three point three degrees centigrade friday april twenty sixth minus twenty four point seven degrees fahrenheit minus thirty one point five degrees centigrade minimum temperature minus thirty two degrees fahrenheit minus thirty five point seven degrees centigrade i was not a little surprised yesterday morning when i suddenly saw the track of an animal in the snow it was that of a fox came about west-southwest true and went in an easterly direction the trail was quite fresh what in the world was that fox doing up here there were also unequivocal signs that it had not been entirely without food were we in the vicinity of land involuntarily i looked round for it but the weather was thick all day yesterday and we might have been near it without seeing it it is just as probable however that this fox was following up some bear in any case a warm-blooded mammal in the eighty-fifth parallel we had not gone far when we came across another fox track it went in about the same direction as the other and followed the trend of the land which had stopped us and by which we had been obliged to camp it is incomprehensible what these animals live on up here but presumably they are able to snap up some crustacean in the open waterways but why do they leave the coasts that is what puzzles me most can they have gone astray there seems little probability of that i am eager to see if we may not come across the trail of a bear to-day it would be quite a pleasure and it would seem as if we were getting nearer inhabited regions again i have just pricked out our course on the chart according to our bearings calculating that we have gone sixty-nine miles in the four days since our last observation and i do not think this can be excessive according to this it should not be much more than one hundred thirty-eight miles to petterman's land provided it lie about where payer determined it i should have taken an observation yesterday but it was misty at the end of our day yesterday we went across many lanes and piled up ridges in one of the latter which appeared to be quite new immense pieces of fresh-water ice had been pressed up they were closely intermixed with clay and gravel the result of infiltration so that at a distance the blocks looked dark brown and might easily be taken for stone in fact i really thought they were stone i can only imagine that this ice is river ice probably from siberia i often saw huge pieces of fresh water ice of this kind farther north and even in latitude eighty six degrees there was clay on the ice sunday april twenty eighth we made good way yesterday presumably twenty miles we began our march about half past three in the afternoon the day before yesterday and kept at it till yesterday morning land is drawing nigh and the exciting time beginning when we may expect to see something on the horizon oh how i am longing for land for something under one's feet that is not ice and snow not to speak of something to rest one's eyes on another fox track yesterday it went in about the same direction as the previous ones later in the day gulen gave in it seemed to be a case of complete exhaustion he could hardly stand on his legs reeled over and when we placed him on one of the loads he lay quite still without moving we had already decided to kill him that day poor beast faithfully he worked for us good-tempered and willing to the end and then for thanks when he could do no more to be killed for provender he was born on the fram on december thirteenth eighteen ninety three and true child of the polar night never saw aught but ice and snow monday april twenty ninth minus four degrees fahrenheit minus twenty degrees centigrade we had not gone far yesterday when we were stopped by open water a broad pool or lane which lay almost straight across our course 
we worked westward alongside it for some distance until it suddenly began to close violently together at a place where it was comparatively narrow in a few minutes the ice was towering above us and we got over by means of the noisy pressure ridge which was thundering and crashing under our feet it was a case of bestirring ourselves and driving dogs and sledges quickly over if we did not wish to get jammed between the rolling blocks of ice this ridge nearly swallowed up johansen's snowshoes which had been left behind for a minute while we got the last sledge over when at last we got to the other side of the lane the day was far spent and such work naturally deserved reward in the shape of an extra ration of meat chocolate annoying as it is to be stopped in the midst of beautiful flat ice by a lane when one is longing to get on still undeniably it is a wonderful feeling to see open water spread out in front of one and the sun playing on the light ripples caused by the wind fancy open water again and glittering waves after such a long time one's thoughts fly back to home and summer i scanned in vain to see if a seal's head were not visible above the surface or a bear along the side the dogs are beginning now to be very much reduced in strength and are difficult to urge on barnett was quite done he was killed this evening and several of the others are very jaded even barrow my best dog is beginning to cool in his zeal to say nothing of kvik perhaps i ought to cater a little more generously for them the wind which was about southeast in the morning subsequently went over to an easterly direction and i expect to use pettersen's customary expression on board for a good southeaster which drove us northward to some purpose a regular devil of a hiding i am only surprised the temperature still seems low i had noticed a thick bank of clouds for a long time along the horizon in the south and southwest and thought that this must mean land it now began to grow higher and came nearer us in a suspicious manner when after having had dinner we crept out of the bag we saw that the sky was entirely clouded over and that the devil of a hiding had come we felt when we went on i saw another fox track yesterday it was almost effaced by the snow but went in about the same direction as the others this is the fourth we have come across and seeing so many of them make me begin to believe seriously in the proximity of land yes i expect to see it every minute perhaps though it will be some days yet tuesday april thirtieth minus six point seven degrees fahrenheit minus twenty one point four degrees centigrade yesterday in spite of everything was a bad day it began well with brilliant sunshine was warm four degrees below zero fahrenheit and there bathed in the slumbering sunlight and alluring us on were stretches of beautiful flat ice everything tended to predict a good day's work but alas who could see the ugly dark cracks which ran right across our course and which were destined to make life a burden to us the wind had packed the snow well together and made the surface firm and good so that we made rapid progress but we had not gone far before we were stopped by a lane of entirely open water which stretched right across our course after following it some little distance we eventually found a way across not long afterwards we came across another lane running in about the same direction after a fairly long detour we got safely over this too with the minor misfortune that three dogs fell into the water a third lane we also got over but the fourth was too much for us altogether it was broad and we followed it a long way in a westerly direction but without finding a suitable crossing then i continued some three or four miles alone to scan the country but as i could see no chance of getting over i returned to johansen and the sledges it is a fruitless task this following a lane running at right angles to one's course better to camp and make oneself some good pemmican soup a la julienne it was highly delectable and then give oneself up to sleep in the hope of better things in the future either the lanes will close together again or they will freeze now that it is tolerably cold the weather is quiet so it is to be hoped new ones will not form if it keep like this during the days we require to reach land it will be a good thing when once we are on land as many lanes may form as they like 
should matters become too bad before that time there is nothing for us to do but to mend and patch our kayaks as they are now they will not float the continual capsizing of the sledges has cut holes in many places and they would fill the instant they were put on the water i ought perhaps to explain here that i had deferred mending the kayaks as long as possible this was partly because the work would take a long time and the days were precious now that it was a question of gaining land before the ice became impracticable partly too because in the temperature we now had it would have been difficult to do the work properly and also because the chances were that they would soon get holes in them again from being upset in addition to this i was undesirous of crossing lanes at present they were still covered with young ice which it would have been difficult to break through even had it been possible to protect the bows of the kayaks from being cut by means of a plate of german silver and some extra canvas as i have mentioned before not the least drawback was the fact that any water entering the kayaks would immediately have frozen and have been impossible to remove thus increasing the weight of our loads at each crossing it was undoubtedly a better plan to go round even if the way was long than to incur the hindrances and casualties that the other alternative would most probably have occasioned to continue quoting from my diary for the same day i write the dogs were at one of our precious pemmican grips last night they have torn off a corner of the bag and eaten some of its contents but happily not much we have been fortunate inasmuch as they have let the provisions alone hitherto but now hunger is becoming too much for them and nature is stronger than discipline monday may first minus twelve point six degrees fahrenheit minus twenty four point eight degrees centigrade I have sold my fin shoes today with sailcloth, so I hope they will last a while. I feel as if I could hold my own again now. I have two pairs of fin shoes, so that for once one pair can be dried in the sun. They have been wet the whole way, and it has made them the worse for wear. The ice was now growing very bad again, and our marches shorter. On Friday, May 3rd, I write in my diary. We did not do so good a day's work yesterday as we expected, although we made some progress. The ice was flat and the going good at one time, and we kept steadily at it for four hours or so. But then came several reaches with lanes and rubble ice, which, however, we managed to pull through, though the ice was often packing under our feet. By degrees the wind from the southeast increased, and while we were having dinner it veered round to an easterly direction and became rather strong the ice too grew worse with channels and rubble and when the wind reached a velocity of twenty nine to thirty three feet in the second and a driving snowstorm set in completely obliterating everything around us stumbling along through it all became anything but attractive after being delayed several times by newly formed rubble i saw that the only sensible thing to be done was to camp if we could find a sheltered spot this was easier said than done as the weather was so thick we could hardly see anything but at last we found a suitable place and well content to be under shelter ate our fiskegratin and crept into the bag while the wind rattled the tent walls and made drifts round us outside we had been constrained to pitch our tent close beside a new ridge which was hardly desirable as packing might take place but we had no choice it was the only lee to be found before i went to sleep the ice under us began to creak and soon the pressure ridge behind us was packing with the well-known jerks i lay listening and wondering whether it would be better for us to turn out before the ice blocks came tumbling on to us but as i lay listening went fast asleep and dreamed about an earthquake when i woke up again some hours afterwards everything was quiet except the wind which howled and rattled at the tent walls lashing the snow up against them yesterday evening potiphar was killed we have now sixteen dogs left the numbers are diminishing horribly and it is still so far to land if only we were there saturday may fourth did fourteen miles yesterday but the lanes became worse and worse when we got under way in the afternoon after having reloaded my sledge and kayak and readjusted the dunnage under johansen's kayak 
the wind had fallen and it was snowing quietly and silently with big flakes just as it does on a winter day at home it was bad in one way however as in such light it is difficult to see if the lay of the ground is against or with us but the going was fairly good and we made progress it was heavenly to work in this mild weather plus eleven point eight degrees fahrenheit minus eleven point three degrees centigrade and be able to use one's frost-bitten hands bare without suffering torture untold every time they came in contact with anything our life however was soon embittered by open waterways by means of a circuitous route and the expenditure of much valuable time we at last succeeded in getting over them then came long stretches of good ice and we went cheerfully on our way by and by too the sun peeped out it is wonderful what such encouragement does for one a little while ago when i was ploughing alongside a horrible lane through rubble and over ridges without a sign of any means of getting on i was ready to sink from exhaustion at every step no pleasure then could compare with that of being able to crawl into the bag and now when luck again sheds her smiles on one and progress is before one all weariness is suddenly dissipated during the night the ice began to be bad in earnest lane after lane the one worse than the other and they were only overcome by deviations and intricate byways it was terrible work and when the wind increased to a good mill breeze matters became desperate this is indeed toil without ceasing what would i not give to have land to have a certain way before me to be able to reckon on a certain day's march and be free from this never-ending anxiety and uncertainty about the lanes nobody can tell how much trouble they may yet cause us and what adversities we may have to go through before we reach land and meanwhile the dogs are diminishing steadily they haul all they can poor things but what good does it do i am so tired that i stagger on my snowshoes and when i fall down only wish to lie there to save myself the trouble of getting up again but everything changes and we shall get to land in time at five this morning we came to a broad lane and as it was almost impossible to get the dogs on any farther we camped once well down in the bag with a pot of savory smelling lobscow in front of one a feeling of well-being is the result which neither lanes nor anything else can disturb the ice we have gone through has on the whole been flat with the exception of the newly formed lanes and rubble these appear however for the most part in limited stretches with extensive flat ice between as yesterday all the channels seem in the main to go in the same direction about straight across our course with a little deflection towards the southwest they run about northeast to west southwest by compass this morning the temperature had again sunk to plus zero point one degree fahrenheit minus seventeen point eight degrees centigrade after having been up at plus twelve point two degrees fahrenheit minus eleven degrees centigrade and therefore i am still in hopes that the water may freeze within a reasonable time perhaps it is wrong of us to curse this wind for on board the fram they are rejoicing that a southeaster has at last sprung up however in spite of our maledictions i am really glad for their sake although i could wish it deferred till we reached land wednesday may eighth the lanes still appear regularly in certain places as a rule where the ice is very uneven and where there are old and new ridges alternately between these places there are long flat stretches of ice without lanes these are often perfectly even almost like inland ice the direction of the lanes is as before very often athwart our course or a little more southwesterly others again seem to go in about the same direction as we do this ice is extraordinary it seems to become more and more even as we approach land instead of the contrary as we expected if it would only keep so it is considerably flatter than it was about the fram it seems to me there are no really impracticable places and the irregularities there are seen to be of small dimensions rubble ice and so forth no huge mounds and ridges as we had farther north some of the lanes here are narrow and so far new that the water was only covered with brash 
this can be deceptive enough it appears to be even ice but thrust one staff in and it goes right through and into the water this morning i made out our latitude and longitude the former was sunday may fifth eighty four degrees thirty one minutes north and the latter sixty six degrees fifteen minutes east we are not so far south as i expected but considerably farther west it is the drift which has put us back and westward i shall therefore for the future steer a more southerly course than before about due south true as we are still drifting westward and above everything i am afraid of getting too far in that direction it is to be hoped that we shall soon have land in sight and we shall then know where to steer we undoubtedly ought to be there now no dog was killed yesterday as there were two-thirds left of yulenka from the previous day which provided an abundant repast i now only intend to slaughter one every other day and perhaps we shall soon come across a bear end of file seven file eight of farthest north volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sharon riskadal farthest north by fritjof nansen volume two chapter five a hard struggle part two thursday may ninth plus nine degrees fahrenheit minus thirteen point three degrees centigrade yesterday was a fairly good day the ice was certainly not first-rate rather rubbly and the going heavy but all the same we are making steady way forward there were long flat stretches every now and then the weather had become quite fine when we got under way about three o'clock this morning the sun was shining through light cumulus clouds it was hard work however making head against the ice and soon the fog came down with the wind which still blew from the same direction north northeast the work of hauling becomes heavier and heavier for the dogs in proportion as their numbers diminished the wooden runners too the under runners do not seem to ride well i have long thought of taking them off and to-day really decided to try the sledges without them in spite of everything the dogs keep a very even pace with only a halt now and then yesterday there were only four dogs for my sledge one of them flint slipped his harness and ran away and we did not get hold of him again before the evening when he was killed by way of punishment the ice was all along more uneven than it has been the last few days in the afternoon the weather thickened and the wind increased till at about three o'clock a regular snowstorm was raging no way was to be seen only whiteness everywhere except in places where the pointed blue ice from the ridges stuck up through the snowdrifts after a while the ice grew worse and i went headlong on to ridges and irregularities without even seeing them i hoped this was only rough ice which we should pass through but matters did not improve and we thought there was no sense in going on luckily we had just then dropped on a good sheltered camping ground otherwise it would have been difficult enough to find one in such weather where nothing could be discerned meanwhile we are getting southward and are more and more surprised at not seeing signs of land we reckon now to have left the eighty-fourth parallel behind us friday may tenth plus sixteen point two degrees fahrenheit minus eight point eight degrees centigrade our life has many difficulties to combat yesterday promised to be a good day but thick weather hindered our advance when we crept out of the tent yesterday forenoon it was fine the sun was shining the going was unusually good and the ice appeared to be unusually even we had managed in the snowstorm of the previous evening to get into a belt of foul ice which was merely local before we started we thought of taking the removable wooden runners off the sledges but on trying mine beforehand found that it ran well as it was i decided therefore to wait a little longer as i was afraid that removing the wooden runners might weaken the sledge johansen meanwhile had taken them off the middle sledge but as we then discovered that one of the birch runners had split right across under one of the uprights there was nothing for it but to put it on again 
it was a pity though as the sledge would have run much better on the newly tarred runners than on the scratched under runners we made fairly good progress in spite of there being only thirteen dogs left four to my sledge four to the birch sledge and five to johansen's but later in the afternoon the weather thickened rapidly and snow began to fall which prevented our seeing anything before us the ice however was fairly even and we kept going we came across a lane but this we crossed by means of a detour not long afterwards again we got among a number of abominable pressure ridges and ran right into high mounds and over steep brinks without seeing them wherever one turned there were sudden drops and pitfalls although everything looked so fair and even under its covering of still falling snow as there seemed to be little good in continuing we decided to camp have our dinner of savory hot lobscow make out our longitude and then pass the time until it should clear again and if this did not take place soon then have a good sleep and be ready to get under way as soon as the weather should permit after having slept for a couple of hours it was one o'clock in the morning i turned out of the tent and was confronted with the same thick overcast weather with only a strip of clear blue sky down by the horizon in the southwest so i let johansen sleep on and reckoned out our longitude which proved to be sixty four degrees twenty minutes east we have drifted considerably westward since i last made it out if my calculations be right while i was thus occupied i heard a suspicious gnawing noise outside in the direction of the kayaks i listened and quite right it was the dogs up in johansen's kayak i ran out caught haran who was just lying gnawing at the portions of fresh dog's flesh destined for tomorrow's consumption and gave him a good thrashing for his pains the casing over the opening in the kayak was then properly secured and snowshoes and sticks piled on the weather is still the same overcast and thick but the wind has veered round to a more southerly direction and the clear strip of blue sky in the southwest has risen a little higher from the ice margin can there be a west wind in prospect welcome indeed would it be and longing were the glances i directed towards that blue strip there lay sunshine and progress perhaps even land was beneath it i could see the cumulus clouds sailing through the blue atmosphere and thought if only we were there only had land under us then all our troubles would sink into oblivion but material needs must not be forgotten and perhaps it would be better to get into the bag and have a good sleep while waiting many times in the morning did i peep out of the tent but always saw the same cloudy sky and the same white prospect wherever the eye turned down in the west and southwest was always the same strip of clear blue sky only that now it was lower again when we at last turned out in the forenoon the weather was just the same and the azure strip on the horizon in the southwest was still there i think it must have something to do with land and it gives me hope that this may not be so far off it is a tougher job than we thought this gaining land but we have had many enemies to make headway against not only foul ice and bad going but also wind water and thick weather all of them equally obdurate adversaries to overcome sunday may twelfth plus zero point six degrees fahrenheit minus seventeen point five degrees centigrade yesterday we had a better time than we expected overcast and thick it was the whole time and we felt our way rather than saw it the ice was not particularly good either but we pressed onward and had the satisfaction now and then of traveling over several long stretches of flat ice a couple of channels which had partly opened hindered us somewhat curiously enough the strip of clear sky was still there in the south southwest true and as we went along rose higher in the heavens we kept expecting it to spread and that the weather would clear we needed it sorely to find our way but the strip never rose any higher and yet remained there equally clear then it sank again and only a small rim was left visible on the margin of the sky then this also disappeared i cannot help thinking that this strip must have had something to do with land 
at seven o'clock this morning we came to a belt of ice as bad almost as i have ever seen it and as i thought it unadvisable to make an onslaught in such thick weather we encamped i hope we did our fourteen miles and can reckon on only ninety more to land if it lie in eighty three degrees latitude the ice is undoubtedly of a different character from what it was previously it is less even and old lanes and new ones with ridges and rubble are more frequent all seeming to point to the vicinity of land meanwhile time is going and the number of dogs diminishing we have now twelve left yesterday kata was killed and our provisions are also gradually on the decrease though thank heaven we have a good deal remaining the first tin of petroleum two and a half gallons came to an end three days ago and we shall soon have finished our second sack of bread we do nothing but scan the horizon longingly for land but see nothing even when i climb up on to the highest hummocks with a telescope monday may thirteenth plus eight point six degrees fahrenheit minus thirteen degrees centigrade minimum plus six point six degrees fahrenheit minus fourteen point two degrees centigrade this is indeed a toilsome existence the number of the dogs and likewise their hauling powers diminish by degrees and they are inert and difficult to urge on the ice grows worse and worse as we approach land and is besides covered with much deeper and looser snow than before it is particularly difficult to get on in the broken-up ice where the snow although it covers up many irregularities at the same time lets one sink through almost up to one's thighs between the pieces of ice as soon as one takes one's snowshoes off to help the sledge it is extremely tiring and shaky on this sort of surface to use one's snowshoes not firmly secured to the feet but one cannot have them properly fastened on when one has to help the dogs at any moment or pull and tug at these eternal sledges i think in snow such as this indian snowshoes would be preferable and i only wish i had some meanwhile however we covered some ground yesterday and if i reckon twenty miles for yesterday and to-day together i do not think i shall be very far out we should thus have only about fifty miles to the eighty-third parallel and the land which payer determined we are keeping a somewhat southerly course about due south true as this continual east wind is certainly driving us westward and i do not like the idea of drifting west past land it is beginning to be tolerably warm inside the bag at night now and last night i could hardly sleep for heat tuesday may fourteenth plus six point eight degrees fahrenheit minus fourteen degrees centigrade yesterday was a cozy day of rest just as we were about to get under way after breakfast it clouded over and a dense snowstorm set in so that to start out in such weather in the uneven ice we have now before us would not have been worth while i therefore made up my mind to halt for the time being and get some trifles done and in particular the shifting of the load from the birch sled on to the two others and so at last get rid of this third sledge for which we can no longer spare any dogs this took some time and as it was absolutely necessary to do it we lost nothing by stopping for a day we had now so much wood from the sledge together with broken snowshoe staves and the results of other casualties that i thought we should be able to use it as fuel for some time to come and so save the petroleum we accordingly made a fire of it to cook the supper with contrived a cooking pot out of the empty petroleum tin and hung it over in the approved fashion at the first start-off we lighted the fire just outside the tent door but soon gave that up as for the first thing we nearly burned up the tent and secondly the smoke came in till we could hardly see out of our eyes but it warmed well and looked wonderfully cheerful then we moved it farther off where it could neither burn up the tent nor smoke us out but therewith all the joy of it was departed when we had about burned up the whole sledge and succeeded in getting a pot of boiling water with the further result of having nearly melted the flow through on which we were living i gave up the idea of cooking with sledges and went back to our trusty friend the primus and a sociable and entertaining friend too which one can have by one's side as one lies in the bag 
we have as much petroleum i should imagine as we shall require for the journey before us and why bother about anything else if the petroleum should come to an end too soon why then we can get as much train oil from bear and seal and walrus as we shall require i am very anxious to see the result of our reloading our two kayak sledges have undoubtedly become somewhat heavier but then we shall have six dogs to each as long as they last our patience has been rewarded at last with the most brilliant sunshine and sparkling sky it is so warm in the tent that i am lying basking in the heat one might almost think oneself under an awning on a summer's day at home last night it was almost too warm to sleep the ice kept practicable to a certain extent during these days though the lanes provided us with many an obstacle to overcome then in addition to this the dog's strength was failing they were ready to stop at the slightest unevenness and we did not make much way on thursday may sixteenth i write in my diary several of the dogs seemed to be much exhausted varro the leader of my team gave in yesterday he could hardly move at last and was slaughtered for supper poor animal he hauled faithfully to the end it was johansen's birthday yesterday he completed his twenty-eighth year and of course a feast was held in honor of the occasion it consisted of lobscow his favorite dish followed by some good hot lime juice grog the midday sun made it warm and comfortable in the tent six a m plus three point six degrees fahrenheit minus fifteen point eight degrees centigrade have to-day calculated our latitude and longitude for yesterday and find it was eighty three degrees thirty six minutes north and fifty nine degrees fifty five minutes east our latitude agrees exactly with what i supposed according to the dead reckoning but our longitude is almost alarmingly westerly in spite of the fact that our course has been the whole time somewhat southerly there appears to be a strong drift in the ice here and it will be better for us to keep east of the south in order not to drift past land to be quite certain i have again reckoned out our observations of april seventh and eighth but find no error and cannot think otherwise than that we are about right still it seems remarkable that we have not yet seen any signs of land ten p m plus one point four degrees fahrenheit minus seventeen degrees centigrade friday may seventeenth plus twelve point four degrees fahrenheit minus ten point nine degrees centigrade minimum minus nineteen degrees centigrade today is the seventeenth of may constitution day i felt quite certain that by today at any rate we should have been on land somewhere or other but fate wills otherwise we have not even seen a sign of it yet alas here i lie in the bag dreaming daydreams and thinking of all the rejoicings at home of the children's processions and the undulating mass of people at this moment in the streets how welcome a sight to see the flags with their red bunting waving in the blue spring atmosphere and the sun shining through the delicate young green of the leaves and here we are in drifting ice not knowing exactly where we are uncertain as to our distance from an unknown land where we hope to find means of sustaining life and thence carve our way on towards home with two teams of dogs whose numbers and strength diminish day by day with ice and water between us and our goal which may cause us untold trouble with sledges which now at any rate are too heavy for our own powers we press laboriously onward mile by mile and meanwhile perhaps the drift of the ice is carrying us westward out to sea beyond the land we are striving for a toilsome life undeniably but there will be an end to it some time some time we shall reach it and meanwhile our flag for the seventeenth of may shall wave above the eighty-third parallel and if fate send us the first sight of land to-day our joy will be twofold yesterday was a hard day the weather was fine even brilliant the going splendid and the ice good so that one had a right to expect progress were it not for the dogs they pull up at everything and for the man ahead it is a continual going over the same ground three times first to find a way and make a track and then back again to drive on the dogs it is slow work indeed 
across quite flat ice the dogs keep up to the mark pretty well but at the first difficulty they stop i tried harnessing myself in front of them yesterday and it answered pretty well but when it came to finding the way in foul ice it had to be abandoned in spite of everything we are pushing forward and eventually shall have our reward but for the time being this would be ample could we only reach land and land ice without these execrable lanes yesterday we had four of them the first that stopped us did not cause immoderate trouble then we went over a short bit of middling ice though with lane after lane and ridges then came another bad lane necessitating a circuit after this we traversed some fairly good ice this time considerably more of it than previously but soon came to a lane or rather a pool of greater size than we had ever seen before exactly what the russians would call a polonia it was covered with young ice too weak to bear we started confidently alongside it in a southwesterly direction true in the belief that we should soon find a way across but soon did not come just where we expected to find a crossing an overwhelming sight presented itself to our gaze the pool stretched away in a southwesterly direction to the very horizon and we could see no end to it in the mirage on the horizon a couple of detached blocks of ice rose above the level of the pool they appeared to be floating in open water changed constantly in shape and disappeared and reappeared everything seemed to indicate that the pool debauched right into the sea in the west from the top of a high hummock i could however with the glass see ice on the other side heightened by the looming but it was anything but certain that it really was situated at the western end of the pool more probably it indicated a curve in the direction of the latter what was to be done here to get over seemed for the moment an impossibility the ice was too thin to bear and too thick to set the kayaks through even if we should mend them how long it might take at this time of year for the ice to become strong enough to bear i did not know but one day would scarcely do it to settle down and wait therefore seemed too much how far the pool extended and how long we might have to travel along it before we found a crossing and could again keep to our course no one could tell but the probability was a long time perhaps days on the other hand to retreat in the direction whence we came seemed an unattractive alternative it would lead us away from our goal and also perhaps necessitate a long journey in an opposite direction before we could find a crossing the pool extended true south fifty degrees west to follow it would undoubtedly take us out of our course which ought now properly to be east of south but on the whole this direction was nearest the line of our advance and consequently we decided to try it after a short time we came to a new lane running in a transverse direction to the pool here the ice was strong enough to bear and on examining the ice on the pool itself beyond the confluence of this lane i found a belt where the young ice had through pressure been jammed up in several layers this happily was strong enough to bear and we got safely over the pool the trend of which we had been prepared to follow for days then on we went again though in toil and tribulation until at half past eight in the evening we again found ourselves confronted by a pool or lane of exactly the same description as the former one with the exception only that this time the view to the sea opened towards the northeast while in the southwest the skyline was closed in by ice the lane also was covered with young ice which in the middle was obviously of the same age as that on the last pool near the edge there was some thicker and older ice which would bear and over which i went on snowshoes to look for a crossing but found none as far as i went the strip of ice along the middle sometimes broad and sometimes narrow was everywhere too thin to risk taking the sledges over we consequently decided to camp and wait till to-day when it is to be hoped the ice will be strong enough to bear and here we are still with the same lane in front of us heaven only knows what surprises the day will bring sunday may nineteenth the surprise which the seventeenth brought us was nothing less than that we found the lanes about here full of gnarls 
when we had just got under way and were about to cross over the lane we had been stopped by the previous day i became aware of a breathing noise just like the blowing of whales i thought at first it must be from the dogs but then i heard for certain that the sound came from the lane i listened johansen had heard the noise the whole morning he said but thought it was only ice jamming in the distance no that sound i knew well enough i thought and looked over towards an opening in the ice whence i thought it proceeded suddenly i saw a movement which could hardly be falling ice and quite right up came the head of a whale then came the body it executed the well-known curve and disappeared then up came another accompanied by the same sound there was a whole school of them i shouted that they were whales and running to the sledge had my gun out in a second then came the adjusting of a harpoon and after a little work this was accomplished and i was ready to start in pursuit meanwhile the animals had disappeared from the opening in the ice where i had first seen them though i heard their breathing from some openings farther east i followed the lane in that direction but did not come within range although i got rather near them once or twice they came up in comparatively small openings in the ice which were to be found along the whole length of the lane there was every prospect of being able to get a shot at them if we stopped for a day to watch the holes but we had no time to spare and could not have taken much with us had we got one as the sledges were heavy enough already we soon found a passage over and continued our journey with the flags hoisted on the sledges in honor of the day as we were going so slowly now that it was hardly possible for things to be worse i determined at our dinner hour that i really would take off the underrunners from my sledge the change was unmistakable it was not like the same sledge henceforth we got on well and after a while the underrunners from johansen's sledge were also removed as we furthermore came on some good ice later in the day our progress was quite unexpectedly good and when we stopped at half past eleven yesterday morning i should think we had gone ten miles during our day's march this brings us down to latitude eighty three degrees twenty minutes or so at last then we have come down to latitudes which have been reached by human beings before us and it cannot possibly be far to land a little while before we halted yesterday we crossed a lane or pool exactly like the two previous ones only broader still here too i heard the blowing of whales but although i was not far from the hole whence the noise presumably came and although the opening there was quite small i could perceive nothing johansen who came afterwards with the dogs said that as soon as they reached the frozen lane they got scent of something and wanted to go against the wind curious that there should be so many gnarls in the lanes here the ice we are now traveling over is surprisingly bad there are few or no new ridges only small older irregularities with now and then deep snow in between and then these curious broad endless lanes which resemble each other and run exactly parallel and are all unlike those we have met before they are remarkable from the fact that while formerly i always observed the ice on the north side of the lane to drift westward in comparison with that which lay on the south side the reverse was here the case it was the ice on the south side which drifted westward as i am afraid that we are continually drifting rapidly westward i have kept a somewhat easterly course south southeast or east of that according as the drift necessitates we kept the seventeenth of may on the eighteenth it is true by a feast of unsurpassed magnificence consisting of lobscow stewed red whortleberries mixed with real food and stamina lime juice mead that is a concoction of lime juice tablets and frame food stamina tablets dissolved in water and then having eaten our fill crawled into our bag as we gradually made our way southward the ice became more impracticable and difficult to travel over we still came across occasional good flat plains but they were often broken up by broad belts of jammed up ice and in a measure by channels which hindered our advance on may nineteenth i write i climbed to the top of the highest hummock i have yet been up i measured it roughly and made it out to be about twenty-four feet above the ice whence i had climbed up 
but as this ladder was considerably above the surface of the water the height was probably thirty feet or so it formed the crest of quite a short and crooked pressure ridge consisting of only small pieces of ice that day we came across the first tracks of bears which we had seen on our journey over the ice the certainty that we had got down to regions where these animals are to be found and the prospect of a ham made us very joyous on may twentieth there was a tremendous snowstorm through which it was impossible to see our way on the uneven ice consequently there is nothing for it but to creep under the cover again and sleep as long as one can hunger at last though is too much for us and i turn out to make a stew of delicious liver pate then a cup of whey drink and into the bag again to write or slumber as we list here we are with nothing to do but to wait till the weather changes and we can go on we can hardly be far from eighty three degrees ten minutes north and should have gained petterman's land if it be where payer supposed either we must be unconscionably out of our bearings or the country very small meanwhile i suppose this east wind is driving us westward out to sea in the direction of spitzbergen heaven alone knows what the velocity of the drift may be here oh well i am not in the least downhearted we still have ten dogs and should we drift past cape fligley there is land enough west of us and that we can hardly mistake starve we scarcely can and if the worst should come to the worst and we have to make up our minds to winter up here we can face that too if only there was nobody waiting at home but we shall get back before the winter the barometer is falling steadily so that it will be a case of patience long drawn out but we shall manage all right on the afternoon of the following day may twenty first we were at last able to get off though the weather was still thick and snowy and we often staggered along like blind men as the wind was strong and right at our back and as the ice was fairly even i at last put a sail to my sledge it almost went by itself but did not in the least change the dog's pace they kept the same slow time as before poor beasts they become more and more tired and the going is heavy and loose we passed over many newly frozen pools that day and some time previously there must have been a remarkable quantity of open water i do not think i exceed when i put down our day's march at fourteen miles and we ought to have latitude eighty three degrees behind us but as yet no sign of land this is becoming rather exciting friday may twenty fourth plus eighteen point eight degrees fahrenheit minus seven point four degrees centigrade minimum minus eleven point four degrees centigrade yesterday was the worst day we have yet had the lane we had before us when we stopped the previous day proved to be worse than any of the others had been after breakfast at one a m and while johansen was engaged in patching the tent i trudged off to look for a passage across but was away for three hours without finding any there was nothing for it but to follow the bend of the lane eastward and trust to getting over eventually but it turned out to be a longer job than we had anticipated when we came to the place where it appeared to end the surrounding ice mass was broken up in all directions and the floes were grinding against each other as they tore along there was no safe passage to be found anywhere where at one moment perhaps i might have crossed over at the next when i brought the sledges up there was only open water meanwhile we executed some intricate maneuvering from flow to flow always farther east in order to get round the ice jammed under and around us and it was often a difficult matter to get through often did we think we were well across when still worse lanes and cracks in front of us met our disappointed gaze it was enough sometimes to make one despair there seemed to be no end to it wherever one turned were yawning channels on the overcast sky the dark threatening reflection of water was to be seen in all directions it really seemed as if the ice was entirely broken up hungry and almost tired to death we were but determined if possible to have our troubles behind us before we stopped for dinner but at last matters came to a hopeless pitch and at one o'clock after nine hours work we decided to have a meal it is a remarkable fact that let things be as bad as they may once in the bag and with food in prospect all one's troubles sink into oblivion 
the human being becomes a happy animal which eats as long as it can keep its eyes open and goes to sleep with the food in its mouth oh blissful state of heedlessness but at four o'clock we had to turn to again at the apparently hopeless task of threading the maze of lanes as the last drop in our cup of misery the weather became so thick and shadowless that one literally could not see if one were walking up against a wall of ice or plunging into a pit alas we have only too much of this mist how many lanes and cracks we went across how many huge ridges we clambered over dragging the heavy sledges after us i cannot say but very many they twisted and turned in all directions and water and slush met us everywhere but everything comes to an end and so did this after another two and a half hours severe exertion we had put the last lane behind us and before us lay a lovely plain altogether we had now been at this sort of work for nearly twelve hours and i had in addition followed the lane for three hours in the morning which made fifteen altogether we were thoroughly done and wet too how many times we had gone through the deceptive crust of snow which hides the water between the pieces of ice it is impossible to say once during the morning i had had a narrow escape i was going confidently along on snowshoes over what i supposed to be solid ice when suddenly the ground began to sink beneath me happily there were some pieces of ice not far off on which i succeeded in throwing myself while the water washed over the snow i had just been standing on i might have had a long swim for it through the slush which would have been anything but pleasant particularly seeing that i was alone at last we had level ice before us but alas our happiness was destined to be short-lived from the dark belt of clouds on the sky we saw that a new channel was in prospect and at eight in the evening we had reached it i was too tired to follow the trend of the lane it was not short in order to find a crossing particularly as another channel was visible behind it it was also impossible to see the ice around one in the heavily falling snow it was only a question therefore of finding a camping place but this was easier said than done a strong north wind was blowing and no shelter was to be found from it on the level ice we had just got on to every mound and irregularity was examined as we passed by it in the snowstorm but all were too small we had to content ourselves at last with a little pressed-up hummock which we could just get under the lee of then again there was too little snow and only after considerable work did we succeed in pitching the tent at last however the primus was singing cheerily inside it the fiskegratin diffusing its savory odor and two happy beings were ensconced comfortably inside the bag enjoying existence and satisfied if not indeed at having done a good day's march yet in the knowledge of having overcome a difficulty while we were having breakfast to-day i went out and took a meridian altitude which to our delight made us eighty two degrees fifty two minutes north sunday may twenty sixth when the ice is as uneven as it is now the difficulty of making headway is incredible the snow is loose and if one takes one's snowshoes off for a moment one sinks in above one's knees it is impossible to fasten them on securely as every minute one must help the dogs with the sledges added to this if the weather be thick as yesterday one is apt to run into the largest ridges or snowdrifts without seeing them everything is equally white under its covering of new snow and the light comes from all directions so that it throws no shadows then one plunges in headlong and with difficulty can get up and on to one's snowshoes again this takes place continually and the longer it lasts the worse it gets at last one literally staggers on one's snowshoes from fatigue just as if one were drunk but we are gaining ground and that is the chief thing be one's shins ever so bruised and tender this manner of progress is particularly injurious to the ankles on account of the constant unsteadiness and swerving of the snowshoes and many a day have mine been much swollen the dogs too are becoming exhausted which is worse i have to-day reckoned out the observations made yesterday 
and find to our joy that the longitude is sixty one degrees twenty seven minutes east so that we have not drifted westward but have come about south according to our course my constant fear of drifting past land is thus unfounded and we should be able to reckon on reaching it before very long we may possibly be farther east than we suppose but hardly farther west so that if we now go due south for a while and then southwest we must meet with land and this within not many days i reckon that we did twenty miles southward yesterday and should thus be now in latitude eighty two degrees forty minutes north a couple more days and our latitude will be very satisfactory the ice we have before us looks practicable but to judge by the sky we have a number of waterways a little farther on we must manage somehow to fight our way across them i should be very reluctant to mend the kayaks just now before we have reached land and firm land ice they require a thorough overhauling both as to frames and covers my one thought now is to get on while we still have some dogs and thus use them up a comfortable sunday morning in the tent to-day these observations put me in good spirits life seems to look bright before us soon we must be able to start homeward at good speed and across open water oh what a pleasure it will be to handle paddle and gun again instead of this continual toil with the sledges then too the shouting to the dogs to go on it seems to wear and tear one's ears and every nerve in one's body monday may twenty seventh ever since yesterday morning we have seen the looming of water on the sky it is the same looming that we saw on the previous day and i set our course direct for the place where to judge by it there should be the greatest accumulation of ice and where consequently a crossing should be easiest during the course of the afternoon we came on one lane after the other just as the water sky had denoted and towards evening the dark heavens before us augured open water of a worse kind the reflection was particularly dark and threatening both in the west and in the east by seven o'clock i could see a broad lane before us stretching away west and east as far as the eye could reach from the highest hummock it was broad and appeared to be more impracticable than any of the previous ones as the dogs were tired our day's march had been a good one and we had a splendid camping place ready to hand we decided to pitch the tent well satisfied and certain that we were now in latitude eighty two and a half degrees and that land must inevitably be near we disappeared into the bag during breakfast this morning i went out and took a meridian altitude it proves that we have not deceived ourselves we are in latitude eighty two degrees thirty minutes north perhaps even a minute or two farther south but it is growing more and more remarkable that we see no sign of land i cannot explain it in any other way than that we are some degrees farther east than we suppose that we should be so much farther west as to enable us to pass entirely clear of petterman's land and oscar's land and not so much as get a glimpse of them i consider an impossibility i have again looked at our former observations have gone again through our dead reckoning the velocity and directions of the wind and all the possibilities of drift during the days which passed between our last certain observation for longitude april eighth and the day when according to the dead reckoning we assumed ourselves to be in longitude eighty six degrees east april thirteenth that there should be any great mistake is inconceivable the ice can hardly have had such a considerable drift during those particular days seeing that our dead reckoning in other respects tallied so well with the observations yesterday evening kvik was slaughtered poor thing she was quite worn out and did little or nothing in the hauling line i was sorry to part with her but what was to be done even if we should get fresh meat it would have taken some time to feed her up again and then perhaps we should have had no use for her and should only have had to kill her after all but a fine big animal she was and provided food for three days for our remaining eight dogs i am in a continual state of wonderment at the ice we are now traveling over it is flat and good with only smallish pieces of broken up ice lying about and a large mound or small ridge here and there 
but all of it is ice which can hardly be winter old or at any rate has been formed since last summer it is quite a rarity to come across a small tract of older ice or even a single old floe which has lain the summer through so rare in fact that at our last camping place it was impossible to find any ice which had been exposed to the summer sun and consequently freed from salt we were obliged to be content with snow for our drinking water certain it is that where these great expanses of flat ice come from there was open water last summer or autumn and that of no little extent as we have passed over many miles of this compact ice the whole day yesterday and a good part of the previous day besides which there were formerly a considerable number of such tracts in between older summer old ice there is little probability that this should have been formed in the vicinity hereabouts more probably it has come from farther east or southeast and was formed in open water on the east side of vilcek's land i believe consequently that this must indicate that there can be not a little open water along the east or northeast coast of vilcek's land in the summer or autumn months now followed a time when the lanes grew worse than ever and we began to toil in grim earnest lanes and cracks went crosswise in every direction the ice was sometimes uneven and the surface loose and heavy between the irregularities if one could get a bird's-eye view of this ice the lanes would form a veritable network of irregular meshes woe to him who lets himself get entangled in it wednesday may twenty ninth yesterday i inaugurated a great change and began with komager it was an agreeable transition one's feet keep nice and dry now and one is furthermore saved the trouble of attending to the fin shoes night and morning they were beginning in this mild temperature to assume a texture like our native lefser a kind of tough rye cake then too one need no longer sleep with wet rags on one's chest and legs to dry them that day we saw our first bird a fulmer prosellaria glacialis thursday may thirtieth at five o'clock yesterday morning we set forth with a buoyancy born of the belief that now at last the whole network of lanes was behind us but we had not gone far before the reflection of new channels appeared in front i climbed up on to a hummock as quickly as possible but the sight which met my eyes was anything but enlivening lane after lane crossing and recrossing in front of us and on each side as far as the eye could reach it looked as if it mattered little what direction we chose it would be of no avail in getting out of the maze i made a long excursion on ahead to see if there might not be a way of slipping through and over on the consecutive flat sheets as we had done before but the ice appeared to be broken up and so it probably is all the way to land it was no longer with a compact mass of polar ice that we had to deal but with thin broken-up pack ice at the mercy of every wind of heaven and we had to reconcile ourselves to the idea of scrambling from floe to floe as best we might what would i not have given at this moment for it to be march with all its cold and sufferings instead of the end of may and the thermometer almost above thirty two degrees fahrenheit it was just this end of may i had feared all along the time at which i considered it of the greatest importance to have gained land unhappily my fears proved to be well founded i almost began to wish that it was a month or more later the ice would then perhaps be slacker here with more open pools and lanes so that in a measure one could make one's way in a kayak well who could tell this miserable thin young ice appeared to be utterly treacherous and there was a water sky in every direction but mostly far far ahead if only we were there if only we were under land perhaps if the worst should come to the worst we may be reduced to waiting till over the time when the mild weather and break-up of the ice come in earnest but have we provisions enough to wait till that time this was indeed more than doubtful as i stood sunk in these gloomy reflections on the high hummock and looking southward over the ice seeing ridge after ridge and lane after lane before me i suddenly heard the well-known sound of a whale blowing from a lead close behind 
it was the solution of my troubles starve we should not there are animals here and we have guns thank heaven and harpoons as well and we know how to use them there was a whole school of gnarls in the lane breathing and blowing ceaselessly as some high ice hid them from view for a great part i could only see their gray backs now and then as they arched themselves over the black surface of the water i stood a long while looking at them and had i had my gun and harpoon it would have been an easy matter to get one after all the prospect was not so bad at present and meanwhile what we had to do was not to mind lanes but to keep on our course southwest or southwest to south over them and push on the best we could and with that resolution i returned to the sledges neither of us however had a very firm belief that we should get much farther and therefore all the more elated did we become as our advance proved by degrees to be tolerably easy in spite of our exhausted dogs while we were making our way during the morning between some lanes i suddenly saw a black object come rushing through the air it was a black guillemo urea grill and it circled round us several times not long afterwards i heard a curious noise in a southwesterly direction something like the sound made by a goat's horn when blown on i heard it many times and johansen also remarked it but i could not make out what it was an animal at all events it must be as human beings are hardly likely to be near us here a little while later a fulmar came sailing towards us and flew round and round just over our heads i got out my gun but before i had a cartridge in the bird had gone again it is beginning to grow lively here it is cheering to see so much life and gives one the feeling that one is approaching land and kindlier regions later on i saw a seal on the ice it was a little ringed seal which it would have been a satisfaction to capture but before i had quite made out what it was it had disappeared into the water at ten o'clock we had dinner which we shall no longer eat in the bag in order to save time we have also decided to shorten our marches to eight hours or so in the day on account of the dogs at eleven o'clock after dinner we started off again and at three stopped and camped i should imagine we went seven miles yesterday or let me say between twelve and fifteen during the last two days the direction being about southwest every little counts in front of us on the horizon we have a water sky or at any rate a reflection which is so sharply defined and remains so immovable that it must either be over open water or dark land our course just bears on it it is a good way off and the water it is over can hardly be of small extent i cannot help thinking that it must be under land may it be so but between us to judge by the sky there seem to be plenty of lanes the ice is still the same nowadays barely of the previous winter's formation where it is impossible to find any suitable for cooking it seems to me that it is here if possible thinner than ever with a thickness of from two to three feet the reason of this i am still at a loss to explain friday may thirty first it is wonderful the last day of may this month gone too without our reaching land without even seeing it june cannot surely pass in the same manner it is impossible that we can have far to go now i think everything seems to indicate this the ice becomes thinner and thinner we see more and more life around us and in front is the same reflection of water or land whichever it may be yesterday i saw two ringed seals foca fotida in two small lanes a bird probably a fulmer flew over a lane here yesterday evening and at midday yesterday we came on the fresh tracks of a bear and two small cubs which had followed the side of a lane there seemed to be prospects of fresh food in such surroundings though curiously enough neither of us has any particular craving for it we are quite satisfied with the food we have but for the dogs it would be of great importance we had to kill again last night this time it was pan our best dog it could not be helped he was quite worn out and could not do much more the seven dogs we have left can now live three days on the food he provided this is quite unexpected 
the ice is very much broken up here mere pack ice were it not for some large floes or flat spaces in between if this ice had time to slacken it would be easy enough to row between the floes sometimes when we were stopped by lanes yesterday and i went up on to some high hummock to look ahead my heart sank within me and i thought we should be constrained to give up the hope of getting farther it was looking out over a very chaos of lumps of ice and brash mixed together in open water to jump from piece to piece in such waters with dogs and two heavy sledges following one is not exactly easy but by means of investigation and experiment we managed eventually to get over this lane too and after going through rubble for a while came on to flat ice again and thus it kept on with new lanes repeatedly the ice we are now traveling over is almost entirely new ice with occasional older flows in between it continues to grow thinner here it is for the greater part not more than three feet in thickness and the flows are as flat as when they were frozen yesterday evening however we got on to a stretch of old ice on which we are stationed now but how far it extends it is difficult to say we camped yesterday at half past six in the evening and found fresh ice again for the cooker which was distinctly a pleasant change for the cook we have not had it since may twenty fifth a disagreeable wind from the south it is true has sprung up this evening and it will be hard work going against it we have a great deal of bad weather here it is overcast nearly every day with wind south wind which above everything is least desirable just now but what are we to do to settle down we have hardly provender enough there is nothing for it i suppose but to grind on took a meridian altitude today and we should be in eighty two degrees twenty one minutes north and still no glimpse of land this is becoming more and more of an enigma what would i not give to set my foot on dry land now but patience always patience end of file eight file nine of farthest north volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Sharon Riskadal. Farthest North by Fritjof Nansen, Volume 2. Chapter 6 by Sledge and Kayak, Part 1. Saturday, June 1st. So this is June. What has it in store for us? Will not this month either bring us the land we are longing for? Must hope and believe so, though the time is drawing out. Luck for the matter of that is a wonderful thing i expected this morning as little of the day as was well possible the weather was thick and snowy and we had a strong contrary wind it was no better when we came on a lane directly after we started which appeared to be nearly impassable everything was dark and dull however the day turned out to be better than we expected by means of a detour to the northeast i found a passage across the lane and we got on to long flat plains which we went over until quite midday and from five this afternoon we had another hour and a half of good ice but that was the end of it a lane which ran in several directions cut off every means of advance and although i spent more than an hour and a half in looking for a crossing none was to be found there was nothing for it but to camp and hope that the morrow would bring an improvement now the morrow has come but whether the improvement has come likewise and the lane has closed more together i do not yet know we camped about nine yesterday evening as usual latterly after nearly a whole day of dismal snow it suddenly cleared up as soon as we began to pitch the tent the wind also went down and the weather became beautiful with blue sky and light white clouds so that one might almost dream oneself far away to summer at home the horizon in the west and southwest was clear enough but nothing to be seen except the same water sky which we have been steering for and happily it is obviously higher so we are getting under it if only we had reached it yonder there must be a change that i have no doubt of how i long for that change curious how different things are 
if we only reach land before our provisions give out we shall think ourselves well out of danger while to payer it stood for certain starvation if he should have to remain there and not find tegethoff again but then he had not been roaming about in the drift ice between eighty three degrees and eighty six degrees for two months and a half without seeing a living creature just as we were going to break up camp yesterday morning we suddenly heard the angry cry of an ivory gull there above us beautiful and white were two of them sailing right over our heads i thought of shooting them but it seemed on the whole hardly worth while to expend a cartridge apiece on such birds they disappeared again too directly a little while afterwards we heard them again as we were lying in the bag to-day and waiting for breakfast we suddenly heard a hoarse scream over the tent something like the croaking of a crow i should imagine it must have been a gull loris argentatus is it not curious the whole night long whenever i was awake did the sun smile into us through our silken walls and it was so warm and light that i lay and dreamed dreams of summer far from lanes and drudgery and endless toil how fair life seems at such moments and how bright the future but no sooner do i turn out to cook at half past nine than the sun veils his countenance and snow begins to fall this happens nearly every day now is it because he will have us settle down here and wait for the summer and the slackening of the ice and open water will spare us the toil of finding a way over this hopeless maze of lanes i am loath indeed that this should come to pass even if we could manage as far as provisions are concerned by killing and eating the dogs and with a chance of game in prospect our arrival in spitzbergen would be late and we might not improbably have to pass the winter there and then those at home would have another year to wait sunday june second so it is on whitsunday that this book finishes i could hardly have imagined that we should still be in the drift ice without seeing land but fate wills otherwise and she knows no mercy the lane which stopped us yesterday did not close but opened wider until there was a big sea to the west of us and we were living on a floe in the midst of it without a passage across anywhere so at last what we have so often been threatened with has come to pass we must set to work and make our kayaks seaworthy but first of all we moved the tent into a sheltered nook of the hummock where we are lying to so that the wind does not reach us and we can imagine it is quite still outside instead of a regular mill breeze blowing from the southwest to rip off the cover of my kayak and get it into the tent to patch it was the work of a very short time and then we spent a comfortable quiet whitsunday evening in the tent the cooker was soon going and we had some smoking hot lobscow for dinner and i hardly think either of us regretted he was not on the move it is undeniably good to make a halt sometimes the cover was soon patched and ready then i had to go out and brace up the frame of my kayak where most of the lashings are slack and must be lashed over again this will be no inconsiderable piece of work there are at least forty of them however only a couple of the ribs are split so the framework can easily be made just as good as before johansen also took the cover off his kayak and to-day it is going to be patched when both the frames are put in order and the covers on we shall be ready to start afresh and to meet every difficulty be it lanes pools or open sea it will indeed be with a feeling of security that we shall set forth and there will be an end to this continual anxiety lest we should meet with impassable lanes i cannot conceive that anything now can prevent us from soon reaching land it can hardly be long now before we meet with lanes and open water in which we can row there will be a difficulty with the remaining dogs however and it will be a case of parting with them the dogs rations were portioned out yesterday evening and we still have part of pan for supper but klopperslangen must go too we shall then have six dogs which i suppose we can keep for four days and still get on a good way with them whitsuntide there is something so lovely and summer-like in the word it is hard to think how beautiful everything is now at home and then to lie here still in mist and wind and ice how homesick one grows but what good does it do 
little leave will go to dinner with her grandmother to-day perhaps they are dressing her in a new frock at this very moment well well the time will come when i can go with her but when i must set to work on the lashings and it will be all right we worked with ardor during the following days to get our kayaks ready and even grudged the time for eating twelve hours sometimes went by between each meal and our working day often lasted for twenty-four hours but all the same it took time to make these kayaks fully seaworthy again the worst of it was that we had to be so careful with our materials as the opportunities of acquiring more were not immoderately abundant when for instance a rib had to be relashed we could not rip up the old lashing but had to unwind it carefully in order not to destroy the line and when there are many scores of such places to be relashed this takes time then too several of the bamboo ribs which run along the side of the framework particularly in johansen's kayak were split and these had wholly or partly to be taken out and new ones substituted or to be strengthened by lashings and side splints when the covers were properly patched and the frames after several days work again in order the covers were put on and carefully stretched all this of course had to be done with care and was not quick work but then we had the satisfaction of knowing that the kayaks were fully seaworthy and capable if need be of weathering a storm on the way over to spitzbergen meanwhile the time flew by our precious time but then we hoped that our kayaks would render us important assistance and that we should get on all the quicker in them thus on tuesday june fourth i wrote in my diary it seems to me that it cannot be long before we come to open water or slack ice the latter is hereabouts so thin and broken up and the weather so summer-like yesterday the thermometer was a little below freezing point and the snow which fell was more like sleet than anything else it melted on the tent and it was difficult to keep things from getting wet inside the walls dripped if we even went near them we had abominable weather the whole day yesterday with falling snow but for the matter of that we are used to it we have had nothing else lately to-day however it is brilliant clear blue sky and the sun has just come over the top of our hummock and down into the tent it will be a glorious day to sit out and work in not like yesterday when all one's tackle got wet it is worst of all when one is lashing for then one cannot keep the line taut this sun is a welcome friend i thought i was almost tired of it before when it was always there but how glad we are to see it now and how it cheers one i can hardly get it out of my head that it is a glorious fresh june morning home by the bay only let us soon have water so that we can use our kayaks and it will not be long before we are home Today, for the first time on the whole of this journey we have dealt out rations for breakfast both of butter one and two-thirds ounces and aluronid bread six and two-thirds ounces we must keep to weights in order to be certain the provisions will last out and i shall take stock properly of what we have left before we go farther happiness is indeed short-lived the sun has gone again the sky is overcast and snowflakes are beginning to fall wednesday june fifth still at the same spot but it is to be hoped it will not be long before we are able to get off the weather was fine yesterday after all and so summer-like to sit out and work and bask in the sun and then to look out over the water and the ice with the glittering waves and snow yesterday we shot our first game it was an ivory gull loris eburnius which went flying over the tent there were other gulls here yesterday too and we saw as many as four at once but they kept at a distance i went after them once and missed my mark one cartridge wasted this must not be repeated if we had taken the trouble we could easily have got more gulls but they are too small game and it is also too early to use up our ammunition in the pool here i saw a seal and johansen saw one too we have both seen and heard gnarls there is life enough here and if the kayaks were in order and we could row out on the water i have no doubt we could get something however it is not necessary yet 
we have provisions enough at present and it is better to employ the time in getting on on account of the dogs though it would be well if we could get some big game and not kill any more of them until our ice journey is over and we take to the kayaks for good yesterday we had to kill klopperslangen he gave twenty-five rations which will last the six remaining dogs four days the slaughtering was now entirely Johansen's business. He had achieved such celerity that with the single thrust of my long lap knife he made an end of the animal, so that it had no time to utter a sound, and after a few minutes, with the help of the knife and our little axe, he had divided the animal into suitable doles. As I mentioned before, we left the skin and hair on. The former was carefully eaten up, and the only thing left after the dog's meal was, as a rule, a tuft of hair here and there on the ice, some claws, and perhaps a well-gnawed cranium, the hard skull being too much for them. They are beginning to be pretty well starved now. Yesterday, Lilleraven ate up the toe strap, the reindeer skin which is placed under the foot to prevent the snow from balling, and a little of the wood of Johansen's snowshoes, which the dog had pulled down onto the ice. The late Quick ate up her sailcloth harness, and I am not so sure these others do not indulge in a fragment of canvas now and then. I have just reckoned out our longitude according to an observation taken with a theodolite yesterday, and make it to be 61 degrees, 16.5 minutes east. Our latitude was 82 degrees, 17.8 minutes north. I cannot understand why we do not see land. The only possible explanation must be that we are farther east than we think, and that the land stretches southward in that direction, but we cannot have much farther to go now. Just at this moment a bird flew over us, which Johansen, who is standing just outside the tent, took to be a kind of sandpiper. Thursday, June 6th, still on the same spot. I am longing to get off, see what things look like, and have a final solution of this riddle which is constantly before me. It will be a real pleasure to be under way again with whole tackle, and I cannot help thinking that we shall soon be able to use our kayaks in open water. Life would be another thing, then. Fancy, to get clear for good of this ice and these lanes, this toil with the sledges and endless trouble with the dogs, only one's self in a light craft dancing over the waves at play. It is almost too much to think of. Perhaps we have still many a hard turn before we reach it, many a dark hour, but some time it must come, and then, then life will be life again. Yesterday, at last, we finished mending the framework of both kayaks. We rigged up some plated bamboo at the bottom of each to place the provisions on, in order to prevent them from getting wet in case the kayaks should leak. Today we have only to go over them again, test the lashings, and brace, support those that may require it, and finally put the covers on. Tomorrow evening I hope we shall get off. This repairing has taken it out of the cord. Of our three balls we have rather less than one left. This I am very anxious to keep, as we may require it for fishing and so forth. Our various provisions are beginning to dwindle weighed the butter yesterday, and found that we only had five pounds one ounce. If we reckon our daily ration at one and a third ounces per man, it will last another twenty-three days, and by that time we shall have gone a little farther. Today, for the first time, I could note down a temperature above freezing point, that is, plus thirty-five point six degrees Fahrenheit this morning. The snow outside was soft all through, and the hummocks are dripping. It will not be long now before we find water on the floes. Last night, too, it absolutely rained. It was only a short shower. First of all it drizzled, then came large heavy drops, and we took shelter inside the tent in order not to get wet. But it was rain, rain. It was quite a summer feeling to sit in here and listen to the drops splashing on the tent wall. As regards the going, this thaw will probably be a good thing if we should have frost again but if the snow is to continue as it is now, it will be a fine mess to get through among all these ridges and hummocks. Instead of such a contingency, it would be better to have as much rain as possible to melt and wash the ice clear of snow. 
well well it must do as it likes it cannot be long now before it takes a turn for the better land or open water whichever it may be saturday june eighth finished and tried the kayaks yesterday at last but only by dint of sticking to our work from the evening of the day before yesterday to the evening of yesterday it is remarkable that we are able to continue working so long at a stretch if we were at home we should be very tired and hungry with so many working hours between meals but here it does not seem more than it should be although our appetites certainly are first rate and our sleeping powers good it does not seem as if we were growing weak or sickening for scurvy just yet as a matter of fact so far as i know we are unusually strong and healthy just now and in full elasticity when we tried the kayaks in a little lane just here we found them considerably leaky in the seams and also in the canvas from their rough usage on the way but it is to be hoped no more so than will be remedied when a little soaking makes the canvas swell out it will not be agreeable to ferry over lanes and have to put our kayaks dry and leaky on the water our provisions may not improbably be reduced to a pulp but we shall have to put up with that too like everything else and so we really mean to get off to-day after a week's stay on the same spot yesterday the southeast wind set in it has increased to-day and become rather strong to judge by the whistling round the hummocks outside i lay here this morning fancying i heard the sound of breakers a little way off all the lanes about here closed yesterday and there was little open water to be seen it is owing to this wind i suppose and if it is going to close lanes for us then let it blow on the snow is covered with a crust of ice the going is as good as possible and the ice it is to be hoped is more or less flat so we shall be all right johansen shot another ivory gull yesterday and we had it and another one for dinner it was our first taste of fresh food and was it cannot be denied very good but all the same not so delightful as one would expect seeing that we have not had fresh meat for so many months it is proof no doubt that the food we have is also good weighed the bread yesterday found we had twenty six pounds four ounces of wheaten bread and seventeen pounds one ounce of aluronid bread so for that matter we can manage for another thirty-five or forty days and how far we shall then have got the gods alone know but some part of the way it must be sunday june ninth we got away from our camping ground at last yesterday and we were more than pleased in spite of the weather which was as bad as it could be with a raging snowstorm from the east we were both glad to begin our wanderings again it took some time to fix grips under the kayaks consisting of sack sleeping bag and blankets and so load the sledges but eventually we made a start we got well off the floe we had lived on so long and did not even have to use the kayaks which we had spent a week in patching for that purpose the wind had carefully closed the lanes we found flat ice country and made good way in spite of the most villainous going with newly fallen snow which stuck to one's snowshoes mercilessly and in which the sledges stood as if fixed to the spot as soon as they stopped the weather was such that one could not see many hundred feet in front of one and the snow which accumulated on one's clothes on the weather side wetted one to the skin but still it was glorious to see ourselves making progress progress towards our stubborn goal we came across a number of lanes and they were difficult to cross with their complicated network of cracks and ridges in all directions some of them were broad and full of brash which rendered it impossible to use the kayaks in some places however the brash was pressed so tightly together that we could walk on it but many journeys to and fro are nearly always necessary before any reasonable opportunity of advance is to be found this time is often long to the one who remains behind with the dogs being blown through or wetted through meanwhile as the case may be often when it seemed as if i were never coming back did johansen think i had fallen through some lane and was gone for good as one sits there on the kayak waiting and waiting and gazing in front of one into solitude many strange thoughts pass through one's brain 
several times he climbed the highest hummock near at hand to scan the ice anxiously and then when at last he discovered a little black speck moving about on the white flat surface far far away his mind would be relieved as johansen was waiting in this way yesterday he remarked that the sides of the floe in front of him were slowly moving up and down as they might if rocked by a slight swell can open water be near can it be that the great breakers from the sea have penetrated in here how willingly would we believe it but perhaps it was only the wind which set the thin ice we are now travelling over in wave-like motion or have we really open water to the southeast it is remarkable that this wind welds the ice together while the southwest wind here a little while ago slackened it when all is said is it possible that we are not far from the sea i cannot help thinking of the water reflections we have seen on the sky before us johansen has just left the tent and says that he can now see the same reflection in the south it is higher now and the weather tolerably clear what can it be only let us go on and get there we came across the track of a bear again yesterday how old it was could not easily be determined in this snow which obliterates everything in a few minutes but it was probably from yesterday for harren directly afterwards got scent of something and started off against the wind so that johansen thought the bear must be somewhere near well well old or new a bear was there while we were a little farther north stitching at the kayaks and one day it will come our way too no doubt the gull which Johansen shot brought up a large piece of blubber when it fell, and this tends to confirm us in the belief that bears are at hand, as it hardly could have done so had it not been in such company. The weather was wet and wretched, and to make things worse there was a thick mist and the going was as heavy as could be. To go on did not seem very attractive, but on the other hand a halt for dinner in this slush was still less so we therefore continued a little while longer and stopped at ten o'clock for good what a welcome change it was to be under the tent again and the fiskegratin was delicious it gives one such a sense of satisfaction to feel that in spite of everything one is making a little way the temperature is beginning to be bad now the snow is quite wet and some water has entered my kayak which i suppose melted on the deck and ran down through the open side where the lacing is which we have not yet sewn fast we are waiting for good weather in order to get the covers thoroughly dry first and then stretch them well monday june tenth in spite of the most impenetrable mist and the most detestable going on soppy snow which has not yet been sufficiently exposed to frost to become granular and where the sledges rode their very heaviest we still managed to make good even progress the whole day yesterday there were innumerable lanes of course to deal with and many crossings on loose pieces of ice which we accomplished at a pinch but the ice is flat here everywhere and every little counts it is the same thin winter ice of about three feet in thickness i only saw a couple of old floes yesterday they were in the neighborhood of our camping ground which was also on an old floe otherwise the ice is new and in places very new we went over some large expanses yesterday of ice one foot or less in thickness the last of these tracts in particular was very remarkable and must at one time have been an immense pool the ice on it was so thin that it cannot be long before it melts altogether there was water on all this ice and it was like walking through gruel as a matter of fact the ice about here is nothing else but pure broken-up sea ice consisting of large and small floes not infrequently very small floes closely aggregated but when they have the chance of slackening they will spread over the whole sea hereabouts and we shall have water enough to row in any direction we please the weather seems to-day to be of the same kind as yesterday with a southwest wind which is tearing and rattling at the tent walls a thaw and wet snow i do not know if we shall get any more frost but it would make the snow in splendid condition for our snowshoes i am afraid however that the contrary will rather be the case and that we shall soon be in for the worst break-up of the winter 
the lanes otherwise are beginning to improve they are no longer so full of brash and slush it is melting away and bridges and such like have a better chance of forming in the clearer water we scan the horizon unremittingly for land every time there is a clear interval but nothing never anything to be seen meanwhile we constantly see signs of the proximity of land or open water the gulls increase conspicuously in number and yesterday we saw a little auk mergulus alle in a lane the atmosphere in the south and southwest is always apt to be dark but the weather has been such that we can really see nothing yet i feel that the solution is approaching but then how long have i not thought so there is nothing for it but the noble virtue of patience what beautiful ice this would have been to travel over in april before all these lanes were formed endless flat plains for the lanes as far as we know are all newly formed ones with some ridges here and there which are also new tuesday june eleventh a monotonous life this on the whole as monotonous as one can well imagine it to turn out day after day week after week month after month to the same toil over ice which is sometimes a little better sometimes a little worse it now seems to be steadily getting worse always hoping to see an end to it but always hoping in vain ever the same monotonous range of vision over ice and again ice no sign of land in any direction and no open water and now we should be in the same latitude as cape fligley or at most a couple of minutes farther north we do not know where we are and we do not know when this will end meanwhile our provisions are dwindling day by day and the number of our dogs is growing seriously less shall we reach land while we yet have food or shall we when all is said ever reach it it will soon be impossible to make any way against this ice and snow the latter is only slush the dogs sink through at every step and we ourselves splash through it up above our knees when we have to help the dogs or take a turn at the heavy sledges which happens frequently it is hard to go on hoping in such circumstances but still we do so though sometimes perhaps our hearts fail us when we see the ice lying before us like an impenetrable maze of ridges lanes brash and huge blocks thrown together pell-mell and one might imagine oneself looking at suddenly congealed breakers there are moments when it seems impossible that any creature not possessed of wings can get farther and one longingly follows the flight of a passing gull and thinks how far away one would soon be could one borrow its wings but then in spite of everything one finds a way and hope springs eternal let the sun peep out a moment from the bank of clouds and the ice plains glitter in all their whiteness let the sunbeams play on the water and life seems beautiful in spite of it all and worthy a struggle it is wonderful how little it takes to give one fresh courage yesterday i found dead in a lane a little polar cod gaddis polaris and my eyes i am sure must have shone with pleasure when i saw it it was real treasure trove where there is fish in the water one can hardly starve and before i crept into the tent this morning i set a line in the lane beside us but what a number of these little fish it would require to feed one many more in one day than one could catch in a week or perhaps in a month yet one is hopeful and lies counting the chances of there being larger fish in the water here and of being able to fish to one's heart's content advance yesterday was more difficult than on the previous days the ice more uneven and massive and in some places with occasional old flows in between we were stopped by many bad lanes too so did not make much way i'm afraid not more than three or four miles i think we may now reckon on being in latitude eighty two degrees eight minutes or nine minutes north if this continual southeast wind has not sent us northward again the going is getting worse and worse the snow is water soaked to the bottom and will not bear the dogs any longer though it has become a little more granular lately and the sledges run well on it when they do not cut through which happens continually and then they are almost immovable it is heavy for the dogs and would be so even if they were not so wretchedly worn out as they are 
they stop at the slightest thing and have to be helped or driven forward with the whip poor animals they have a bad time of it lillaraven the last of my original team will soon be unable to go farther and such a good animal to haul we have five dogs left lillaraven storaven and kaifas to my sledge suggen and haran to johansen's we still have enough food for them for three days from isbion who was killed yesterday morning and before that time johansen thinks the riddle will be solved vain hope i am afraid although the water sky in the southeast or south southeast magnetic seems always to keep in the same position and has risen much higher we began our march at half past six yesterday afternoon and stopped before a lane at a quarter past three this morning i saw freshwater pools on the ice under some hummocks yesterday for the first time where we stopped however there were none to be found so we had to melt water again this morning but it will not often be necessary hereafter i hope and we can save our oil which by the way is becoming alarmingly reduced outside the weather and snow are the same no pleasure in turning out to the toils of the day i lie here thinking of our june at home how the sun is shining over forest and fjord and wooded hills and there is but some time we shall get back to life and then it will be fairer than it has ever been before wednesday june twelfth this is getting worse and worse yesterday we did nothing hardly advanced more than a mile wretched snow uneven ice lanes and villainous weather stopped us there was certainly a crust on the snow on which the sledges ran well when they were on it but when they broke through and they did it constantly they stood immovable this crust too was bad for the dogs poor things they sank through it into the deep snow between the irregularities and it was like swimming through slush for them but all the same we made way lanes stopped us it is true but we cleared them somehow over one of them at last which looked nasty we got by making a bridge of small floes which we guided to the narrowest place but then a shameless storm of wet snow or more correctly sleet with immense flakes set in and the wind increased we could not see our way in this labyrinth of lanes and hummocks and were as soaked as ducked crows as we say the going was impossible and the sledges as good as immovable in the wet snow which was soon deep enough to cling to our ski underneath in great lumps and prevent them from running there was hardly any choice but to find a camping ground as soon as possible for to force one's way along in such weather and on such snow and make no progress was of little use we found a good camping ground and pitched our tent after only four hours march and went without our dinner to make up here we are then hardly knowing what to do next what the going is like outside i do not know yet but probably not much better than yesterday and whether we ought to push on the little we can or go out and try to capture a seal i cannot decide the worst of it is that there do not seem to be many seals in the ice where we now are we have seen none the last few days perhaps it is too thick and compact for them the ice here is strikingly different in character from that we have been traveling over of late it is considerably more uneven for one thing with mounds and somewhat old ridges among them some very large ones nor does it look so very old in general i should say of last winter's formation though there are occasional old flows in between they appear to have been near land as clay and earthy matter are frequently to be seen particularly in the newly formed ridges johansen who has gone out says the same water sky is to be seen in the south why is it we cannot reach it but there it is all the same an alluring goal for us to make for even if we do not reach it very soon we see it again and again looking so blue and beautiful for us it is the color of hope friday june fourteenth it is three months to-day since we left the fram a quarter of a year have we been wandering in this desert of ice and here we are still when we shall see the end of it i can no longer form any idea i only hope whatever may be in store for us is not very far off open water or land 
Vilcek land, Zichy land, Spitzbergen, or some other country. Yesterday was not quite so bad a day as I expected. We really did advance, though not very far, hardly more than a couple of miles, but we must be content with that at this time of year. The dogs could not manage to draw the sledges alone. If there was nobody beside them, they stopped at every other step. The only thing to be done was to make a journey to and fro, and thus go over the ground three times. While I went on ahead to explore, Johansen drove the sledges as far as he could, first mine, and then back again after his own. By that time I had returned and drove my own sledge as far as I had found a way, and then this performance was repeated all over again. It was not rapid progress, but progress it was of a kind, and that was something. The ice we are going over is anything but even. It is still rather massive and old, with hummocks and irregularities in every direction, and no real flat tracts. When, added to this, after going a short distance, we came to a place where the ice was broken up into small flows, with high ridges and broad lanes filled with slush and brash, so that the whole thing looked like a single mass of debris, where there was hardly standing room to say nothing of any prospect of advance, it was only human to lose courage and give up, for the time being, trying to get on. Wherever I turned, the way was closed, and it looked as if advance was denied us for good. To launch the kayaks would be of no avail, for we could hardly expect to propel them through this accumulation of fragments, and I was on the point of making up my mind to wait and try our luck with the net and line, and see if we could not manage to find a seal somewhere in these lanes. These are moments full of anxiety, when from some hummock one looks doubtingly over the ice, one's thoughts continually reverting to the same question. Have we provisions enough to wait for the time when the snow will have melted, and the ice have become slacker and more intersected with lanes, so that one can row between the flows? Or is there any probability of our being able to obtain sufficient food, if that which we have should fall short? These are great and important questions which I cannot yet answer for certain. That it will take a long time before all this snow melts away and advance becomes fairly practicable is certain. At what time the ice may become slacker and progress by means of the lanes possible we cannot say. And up to this we have taken nothing with the exception of two ivory gulls and a small fish. We did indeed see another fish swimming near the surface of the water, but it was no larger than the other. Where we are just now there seems to be little prospect of capturing anything. I have not seen a single seal the last few days, though yesterday I saw the snowed down track of a bear. Meanwhile we see ivory gulls continually, but they are still too small to be worth a cartridge. Yesterday, however, I saw a large gull probably Loris Argentatus. I determined to make one more attempt to get on by striking farther east, and this time I was successful in finding a passage across by way of a number of small flows. On the other side there was rather old compact ice, partially a formation a summer old, which seemed to have been near land as it was irregular and much intermixed with earthy matter. We have traveled over this ice field ever since without coming on lanes, but it was uneven and we came to grief several times. In other places again it was pretty good. We began our march at eight o'clock on Wednesday afternoon and halted here at five o'clock this morning. Later on in the forenoon the wind went over to the northeast and the temperature fell. The snow froze hard and eventually the going became pretty good. The crust on the snow bore the dogs up and also the sledges to a certain extent, and we looked forward to good going on the following day, but in this we were doomed to disappointment. No sooner had we got inside the tent than it began to snow, and kept briskly at it the whole day while we slept, and yesterday evening when we turned out to get breakfast ready and start off, it was still snowing and deep, loose snow covered everything, a state of things bad beyond description. There was no sense in going on, and we decided to wait and see how matters would turn out. Meanwhile, we were hungry, but a full breakfast we could not afford, so I prepared a small portion of fish soup, and we returned to the bag again, 
Johansen to sleep on, I to re-reckon all my observations from the time we left the Fram, and see if some error might not explain the mystery why no land was yet to be found. The sun had partially appeared, and I tried, though in vain, to take an observation. I stood waiting for more than an hour with the theodolight up, but the sun went in again and remained out of sight. I have calculated and calculated, and thought and thought, but can find no mistake of any importance, and the whole thing is a riddle to me. I am beginning seriously to doubt that we may be too far west after all. I simply cannot conceive that we are too far east, for in such a case we cannot at any rate be more than five degrees farther east than our observations make us. Supposing, for instance, that our watches have gone too fast, Johansen cannot at all events have gained more than double its previous escapement. I have assumed an escapement of five seconds, but supposing that the escapement has been ten seconds, this does not make more difference than six minutes, forty seconds in eighty days, the time from our departure from the Fram till the last observation, that is, one degree, forty minutes farther east than we ought to be. Assuming, too, that I have calculated our day's marches at too great length, in the days between April 8th and 13th, and that instead of 36 English geographical miles, or rather more than 40 statute miles, we have only gone 24 English geographical miles, or 28 statute miles, less we cannot possibly have gone, we should then have been in 89 degrees east instead of 86 degrees east on the 13th as we supposed. That is three degrees farther east, or with the figures above, let us say together, five degrees farther east, that is, we now instead of being in longitude 61 degrees east, should be in 66 degrees east, or about 70 miles from Cape Fligley. But it seems to me we ought to see land south of us just the same. Viltek land cannot be so low and trend suddenly so far to the south when Cape Budapest is said to lie in about 61 degrees east and 82 degrees north, and should thus be not so much as 50 miles from us. No, this is inconceivable. On the other hand, it is not any easier to suppose ourselves west of it. We must have drifted very materially between April 8th and 13th, or my watch must have stopped for a time before April 2nd. The observations from April 2nd, 4th, and 8th seem, indeed, to indicate that we drifted considerably westward. On the 2nd we appeared to be in 103 degrees 6 minutes east, on the 4th in 99 degrees 59 minutes east, and April 8th in 95 degrees 7 minutes east. Between these dates there were no marches of importance. Between the observations on the 2nd and the 4th there was only a short half-day's march, and between the 4th and the 7th a couple, which amounted to nothing, and could only have carried us a little westward. This is as much as to say that we must have drifted 8 degrees, or let us reckon at any rate 7 degrees, westward in the six days and nights. Assuming that the drift was the same during the five days and nights between the 8th and 13th, we then get seven degrees farther west than we suppose. We should consequently now be in 54 degrees east instead of in 61 degrees east, and not more than 36 to 40 miles from Cape Fligley and close by Oscar's land. We ought to see something of them, I think. Let us assume, meanwhile, that the drift westward was strong in the period before April 2nd also, and grant the possibility that my watch did stop at that time, which I fear is not excluded, and we may then be any distance west for all we can tell. It is this possibility which I begin to think of more and more. Meanwhile, apparently, there is nothing for it but to continue as we have done already, perhaps a little more south, and a solution must come. When after having concluded my calculations, I had taken a nap and again turned out at midday today, the condition of the snow proved to be no better, in fact, rather worse. The new snow was wet and sticky, and the going as heavy as it well could be. However, it was necessary to make an attempt to get on. There was nothing gained by waiting there, and progress is progress, be it ever so little. 
i took a single altitude about midday but it was not sharp saturday june fifteenth the middle of june and still no prospect of an end to this things only became worse instead so bad as yesterday though it had never been and worse happily it can hardly be the sledges ran terribly heavy in the loose wet newly fallen snow which was deep to boot and sometimes when they stopped and that was continually they stuck as if glued to the spot it was all we could do to move them when we pushed with all our might then to this was added the fact that one's snowshoes ran equally badly and masses of snow collected underneath them the minute one stopped one's feet kept twisting continually from this and ice formed under them so that one suddenly slid off the snowshoes and into the snow till far above one's knees when one tried to pull or help the sledges but there was nothing for it but to scramble up and on to them again to wade along in such snow without them is an impossibility and as i have said before though fastening them on securely would have been a better plan yet it would have been too troublesome seeing that we had to take them off continually to get the sledges over ridges and lanes in addition to all this wherever one turns the ice is uneven and full of mounds and old ridges and it is only by wriggling along like an eel so to speak that one can get on at all there are lanes too and they compel one to make long detours or go long distances over thin small floes ridges and other abominations we struggled along however a little way working on our old plan of two turns but a quick method it could not be called the dogs are becoming more and more worn out lillerovin the last survivor of my team can now hardly walk hauling there is no question of he staggers like a drunken man and when he falls can hardly rise to his feet again to-day he is going to be killed i am thankful to say and one will be spared seeing him storavin too is getting very slack in the traces the only one of mine which pulls at all is kaifas and that is only as long as one of us is helping behind to keep on longer in such circumstances is only wearing out men and dogs to no purpose and is also using up more provender than is necessary we therefore renounced dinner and halted at about ten yesterday evening after having begun the march at half past four in the afternoon i had however stopped to take an observation on the way it is not easy to get hold of the sun nowadays and one must make the most of him when he is to be seen through the driving clouds clear he will never be yesterday afternoon after an unconscionable wait and after having put up the instrument in vain a couple of times i finally got a wretched single altitude yesterday evening i reckoned out these observations and find that contrary to our expectations we have drifted strongly westward having come from sixty one degrees sixteen minutes east which was our longitude on june fourth right to about fifty seven degrees forty minutes east but then we have also drifted a good way north again up to eighty two degrees twenty six minutes north after being down in eighty two degrees seventeen point eight minutes on the same date and we have been pushing southward as hard as we could the whole time however we are glad to see that there is so much movement in the ice for then there is hope of our drifting out eventually towards open water for that we can get there by our own efforts alone over the shocking ice i am beginning to doubt this country and this going are too bad and my hope now is in lanes and slack ice happily a northeast wind has sprung up yesterday there was a fresh breeze from the north northwest magnetic and the same again to-day only let it blow on if it has set us northwest it can also set us southwest and eventually out towards our goal towards franz joseph land or spitzbergen i doubt more than ever our being east of cape fligley after this observation and i begin to believe more and more in the possibility that the first land we shall see if we see any and i hope we may will be spitzbergen in that case we should not even get a glimpse of franz joseph land the land of which i have dreamed golden dreams day and night but still if it is not to be then well and good spitzbergen is good enough 
and if we are as far west as we seem to be i have greater hope than before of finding slacker ice and open water and then for spitzbergen but there is still a serious question to be faced and that is to procure ourselves enough food for the journey I have slept here some time on purpose after having spent a good while on my calculations and speculations as to our drift and our future. We have nothing to hurry for in this state of the snow. It is hardly better today than it was yesterday, and then, on account of the mild temperature, it is better to travel by night than by day. The best thing to do is to spin out the time as long as possible without consuming more than absolutely necessary of the provisions. The summer cannot but improve matters, and we have still three months of it before us. The question is, can we procure ourselves food during that time? It would be strange, I think, if we could not. There are birds about continually. I saw another large gull yesterday, probably the herring or silver gull, Loris argentatus, but to support life for any length of time on such small fry we have not cartridges enough on seal or bear all my hopes are fixed just one before our provisions give out and the evil hour is warded off for a long time to come end of file nine